The Nature of Predators 38 Memory Transcription Subject, Dolvena Tava, of the Venlo Republic, date, EU Standardized, Human Time. October 6, 2136. There was a heaviness in my heart, as the four diplomats were ushered into the 30 briefing room. The Mazik had been creating quite the scene outside, accusing his human hosts of kidnapping Lolo. Apparently, no amount of tact could prevent that. The uplift's disappearance was noted within minutes. President Kupo's dramatic theories that the predators intended to poke and prod every diplomat were generating panic among the others. That meant we had to brief everyone about the sabotage and the missing craft. The information needed to be turned over to the media as soon as possible too, since Kupo's outburst occurred in front of live cameras. How could we persuade such a paranoid individual? His mind longed to believe that humanity was up to something. I wasn't sure how much of this briefing the Civ Kit would remember, given that she was drugged with a light sedative. The Mazik, who had been quite gentle with Axley, had to carry her into the room. The humans couldn't breathe without spooking the fluffy representative. Noah had accused the Civkit Grand Herd of having a poor choice of personnel, and I'd begun to agree. I should order her to return home, and request that the Herd send someone else. With behavior like this, it's impossible to establish any relations with her species. Kaawasa was oddly quiet, and her gaze darted across the waiting predators. Despite her disdain for uplifts, her snooty attitude slipped when Lolo disappeared from their ranks. The Nevok had been trying to hawk her planet's refined metals and microchips to any Terran that would listen, but now that interest had subsided. Even Shosun looked curious at why the Yochul had vanished from their ranks, though he had more of an inkling what was going on. We had told him in no uncertain terms that someone on the ship could be involved. A scientist of the Zerulian's intellect might put the pieces together. I already knew from the beginning that we couldn't trust you predators. Kupo spat as he took a seat on the floor. You were just waiting to get us here to turn on us. Chosun's whiskers twitched. You should wait to hear what they're going to tell you before you start with that nonsense. It's not what you think. Wait, you know. So Tava and Noah have been selecting who to spin their yarns with. Who to hide things from, Tossa growled. The Mazic president flared his trunk. Half the shit that comes out of a human's mouth is a lie. Who knows why they want to manipulate us, but I bet it's about control. All their species has shown they care about is power. The UN diplomats fidgeted with their visors, clearly uncomfortable with the accusatory rhetoric. This couldn't have been their expectation when they greeted the landing party. I winced as I saw the anger on the Terran general's faces. They lacked the poise and the patience of their diplomatic counterparts. It was tough for them to shrug off insults. You know what? Fuck the Federation. You can fuck right back off to your ship, General Zhao stood from his chair and leaned across the table toward the Mazic president. All you care about is where a person's eyes are on their head. General Jones reclined in her seat. And these are the friendly species. Zhao. Who needs enemies with friends like these? Axley's chest was racked with sobs as the primate's tone escalated. The military humans shifted their annoyance to the sniveling animal. Their binocular eyes smoldered with indignation. The general's tolerance for predator bigotry had been tested for the last time. And you, with the white pelt, you can't even look at us. Why are you here? The Chinese general spat. Jones bared her teeth intentionally pointing them at the Civkit. Get a career, 
so you'll get a grip. You're embarrassing your race. To be honest, if the brunt of a human's anger was directed at me, it would make me clam up too. When their jaw muscles were clenched, it showcased their flesh-tearing bite force. The lack of fur made the protruding bones and bulging veins more obvious. Translucent skin confined the rage bubbling beneath the surface. Kai can tell they're in control, but I don't think any other alien can. Hey, that is enough. All of you are acting like children. I screeched. Let's agree that we've all messed up, in one way or another. We shared our information with Shosen, because he's the only one not looking for an excuse to spout predator nonsense. You lot just proved my point. Noah squeezed my paw under the table. Also, you guys tend to freak out at the slightest sign of danger. It was hard enough to keep everyone calm on the ship. The Nevok diplomat sighed. You get one chance to explain yourselves. The truth. Anti-human plotters in the Federation tried to kill us all with a cooling shaft malfunction. Marcel's ship is missing. Probably for the same reason, I reply. We're trying to figure out who's responsible and hold them accountable, Noah added. Tossa snorted. And you think it's little, primitive Lolo? The Terran ambassador tensed beside me. Clearly, recent events hadn't stopped his defensive reaction to any primitive jabs. I gave Noah a look that warned him not to interfere. He swallowed hard and inhaled a series of deep breaths. This was not the time for him to give the Nevok an earful. Especially when she was the most level-headed person here, not named Shosun. I offered a non-committal tale swish. We're suspicious enough to ask questions. It was plain to see from the representatives' faces that they were worried about how those questions were being asked. I swiped a few buttons on my holopad and cast the security feed of the cell to the projector. The marsupial was seated alone on a bench with his head in his paws. It was the predator's suggestion to let him wait for a while, to give him time to marinate, was their phrase. I didn't like that wording. But as long as the humans didn't suggest physical harm, I was happy to let them try out their techniques. The feisty uplift raised his head and stared at the camera. I know you're listening, Ambassador Noah. I can see that red light blinking. I want to talk. Too bad. I don't, the astronaut muttered to himself. The Mazik president settled down once he saw the Yotel in pristine condition. I was surprised that he hadn't suggested that humanity could have staged the sabotage. Koopa was a strange case and it was tough to pinpoint what he hoped to gain from diplomacy. Telling the Terran military, to their faces, that he thought all humans avaricious liars that could only stem from remarkable disdain. The fact that the leader came himself could be chalked up to an attempt at honorability Kupo didn't want anyone else to die for what he believed was a foolish gamble. Was it simply a desperation play? Like he told Noah. I didn't know if he'd ever see humanity as anything more than predators. General Jones tapped her earpiece. Governor. Dottai. A United Nations scout ship recovered a data buoy within the search perimeter. Almost missed it on sensors. My ears perked up. Standard Federation vessels were equipped with two data buoys which could be ejected if a ship was in distress. They contained information about a ship's function and could be encoded with a message from the captain. The buoy emitted a distress signal for a week or as long as any nearby starlight replenished its power. Common scenarios for their usage included emergency landings, mechanical failures, 
or after sustaining damage in battle. It could offer insight to a vessel's fate, or point rescuers in the right direction. I was uncertain whether to view a buoy's deployment as a positive or a negative sign. It meant that the ship had incurred trouble, but it also meant Riesel had been aware of the problem before a drive meltdown. Maybe they were in the process of mending considerable damage. All that mattered was whether they were alive. All right. Was your team able to extract the data? I asked. Yes. There appears to be a short video log included. Jones scrolled through the file archives and tapped a mentioned item. Shall I clear these interlopers out so we can review what it says in private? My ears flattened against my head. They're not interlopers. At some point, we have to start acting like friends. I'm counting on humanity to take the first step. I muted the feed from Lalo's cell and moved that window into background processing. The American general frowned as I gestured to the projector. Her gaze drifted to the skeptical Mazik. That first impression didn't make her eager to share intelligence. There was no telling what was on the video file, and it might not take much for such individuals to jump to conclusions. A smog-filled cabin was depicted on the projector, with a delirious Colchian at the helm. Riesel dabbed a damp rag against his forehead. The internal temperature must be sweltering. The smoke was so thick that grey tendrils seemed to curl around the Federation officer's form. His orange eyes were listing and unfocused. I glimpsed a few Federation diplomats behind him, all were wearing vac suits to avoid the toxins. That would only be good while the half-day's oxygen supply lasted. Upon closer inspection, Risa had set a helmet down, out of the camera's focus. He must have taken it off so that he could be seen and heard on the recording. This is Risa of the Colchian Commonwealth. A few hours ago, we noticed signs of a fire in the warp drive compartment. With the core ablaze, repairs are impossible. The officer burst into a coughing fit and paused to catch his breath. Emergency shutdown has been unsuccessful. Once it reaches a certain temperature, it's going to go off like a bomb. As panicked as Russell had been around humans, his tranquility in the face of impending death was remarkable. I don't know how he kept the diplomats calm, or why they hardly reacted to those words. It helped that their ship didn't have a predator around to add fuel to instinctual fear. Still, perhaps we just couldn't hear their cries from beneath the suits. The Colchian pilot grimaced. I know we have mere hours, at the most, but I'm at peace with my death. I spent my final days seeking the first real chance the Federations had at ending the war in my lifetime. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Water swelled in my eyes as the finality of their predicament sank in. Rizal's contributions to galactic peace were monumental, and rarely received full acknowledgement. When push came to shove, he found the courage to support humanity. It was his belief in diplomacy, encouraging us to attend the summit, that led Noah to speak to the Federation. If it weren't for that heroic veteran, it would still be the two of us against the galaxy. Sovlin's actions could have been the catalyst for war. Humanity would have never seized the opportunity to voice their side of the story, or open themselves up to new partners. Kriel might be the person who saved Earth. Who deserves as much credit as my dear Noah, I mused. There are some people who want to silence my version of events regarding the torture of a human prisoner. I want it known that all I regret is that I didn't act sooner, he sputtered. That I never had the courage to check in on Marcel and apologize for my part in it. I hope he's doing well, though Sheen could hardly speak between coughing outbursts. 
his eyelids fluttered with exhaustion. He huddled over the console and rested a grasp over the send button. The lack of clean oxygen had pushed him to the brink of unconsciousness. Riso gritted his teeth. Humans, if you see this, I remember what your leader said about desiring coexistence. I hope people give you a chance and that you won't lose faith. The things you endure would be too much for any other species, but you're not them. You're strong. You're predators. Maybe that is a good thing. The Terran ambassador's mouth was agape with horror as we observed Riesel paw at his throat. This was someone we had traveled with for days, who offered his unique perspective on Federation history. It wasn't all that long ago, the Colshian greeted us in the hangar bay, and thanked Noah for reminding him what courage felt like. Ah, uh, time's up, Risa whined in a pained voice. Kick some arcs your ass for me, humans. Leave a little less ugly in the galaxy. I have faith in you. The transmission cut out with a final beep and was replaced by a grim static. The Federation diplomats looked aghast at what we just witnessed. Even Axley was showing signs of lucidity. The Terran generals dropped their scowls and bowed their heads in a solemn display of grief. There was something sobering about a person's last words. We have to help them. Kupo spat. Send the ship. Ambassador Noah nodded. I will fly it myself if I have to. Those are our allies, and they're in trouble. General Jones List curved down. This video is timestamped three days ago. There's no vessels on sensors. Only a few stray energy readings, which suggests the only trace we'd find of the occupants was their atoms scattered across local space. Humanity's first interactions with those six species would be the unenviable task of explaining how their diplomats died. I didn't know how we would convince their leadership not to fault the predators. Condolences and words might not cut it. We need concrete proof. Our mind, the words the Krakatl uttered, that anyone who stood with humanity was dead to them, lingered in my ears. It was difficult for me to process that parties in the Federation would murder civilians for the crime of speaking to predators. I wouldn't blame our new allies for not wanting to believe it was their long-standing friends. My claws flung the prison surveillance back onto the projector. I was trembling with outrage. A taped confession would be a start, even if others accused us of coercion. For... Forget waiting. I switched on the intercom function and leaned into my holopad. Why did you betray us, Lolo? Why? The Yochul glanced up with a hopeful expression. I'm so sorry. Saving our shuttle seemed like enough to spark gratitude. I just wanted to impress Noah so humanity wouldn't discard us like everyone else. A chorus of gasps echoed from our Federation contingent. The Predator Generals looked mystified by his rationale, and their eyes narrowed to intimidating slits. None of us expected such a straightforward confession, especially when I was hoping we'd peg the marsupial wrong. Impress me. You killed Risa and almost killed us. Noah snarled over my shoulder. You're a homicidal psychopath. Lalo blinked. What? Were you not listening to what I said before? I... I didn't do it. I just saw who did, and used the opportunity to, um, prove myself. The human squinted. Why should we believe that? Why wouldn't you come forward straight away? Murmurs of agreement came from the alien diploma. It was bizarre to see the Mazik nodding along to a Terran argument, 
but it was natural to suspect the Yochul's claim. On one paw, it seemed like a lousy attempt to dodge responsibility. On the other, it made more sense than an uplift plotting a complex technological scheme. The Takan representative saw them too, and tried to intervene. Didn't you wonder why one friendly species never made it to the shuttle? Laolo hissed. Besides, we were on their territory. If I spoke up sooner, we would have never left Alpha. Confusion stirred in my chest. You're saying it was... The uplift swished his tail. The Kolshians wanted the human ambassador, and his friends, dead. Not me. Who would have unfettered access to the shuttles? Who planned the whole trip? and saw Risa as a loose end. I fell back on my haunches, stunned to silence. Those words sensed with the facts a little too perfectly. If Lolo was telling the truth, a touch DNA sweep by the core should corroborate it. However, it didn't add up. Why an influential species would grant humanity a public audience and seek a military alliance only to kill us. Was it even possible for our predators to track down a Kolshian official and demand answers? Chief Nikonus was secure, at the heart of Federation territory. As much as I wanted to avenge the fallen vessel, nothing good could come from blazing a trail of destruction. My expertise would focus on the diplomatic side, salvaging our relations with the victimized species. The choice of how to respond to a personal and cowardly attack belonged to the humans. The Nature of Predator's 39 Memory Transcription Subject Oi, Captain Sovlin. Federation Fleet Command. State ill standardized human time. October 7, 2000. 136. The battle for the cradle was force of human aggression. With a mix of bold tactics and innovation, the UN fleet was able to widen their numerical advantage. The enemy found themselves ganged up on by a myriad of ship classes. Every slight weakness was pinpointed and exploited. Hundreds of Arkshire fell by their railguns and missiles, and the entire formation was pushed back within a few hours. Defensive walls were dismantled by brazen, yet calculated charges. Hostiles were encircled and pinned down from every heading, unable to deal with all the Terran pests at once. There were significant casualties on our side, but enough humans remained at the end of the dogfight. The greys were reduced to isolated, scattered pockets. This was a feat, if achieved by any other species that would cement itself in folklore. It was the greatest victory in centuries of Federation warfare. The Aksha vessels attempted to flee the system and regroup, but lighter Terran craft pursued them with relentless abandon. There was no mercy in a predator's hunt. There was only the kill. Even in victory, the humans wanted little more than to finish them off. Kaya Wyatt differently. They stare into the darkness, yet they do not flinch. Aye, the remnants of the cradle were now beneath the human's watchful eye. The omnivores had no intention of letting the Arxer back within orbital proximity. Thus, the Yuan fleet lingered as a protective barrier against any secondary attack. They began transmitting messages to the battered surface and organizing landing parties. As for the captured cattle ship, that could offer plentiful intel, technological access could allow humans to reverse engineer the enemy's weapons and armor, or develop countermeasures. The Gojid victims and Arxer prisoners were brought aboard Yuan ships, wherever there was room. A large chunk were deposited back on the Yuan's Rasinante the warship that started it all. Captain Monaghan was seated at her desk, 
when Carlos brought me to her office. The human officer was impassive and confident. It was no wonder her subordinates believed in her orders. She had no shortage of conviction or mental fortitude. Her capability under battle circumstances was undeniable. Ma'am, I bowed my head in a respectful gesture and the predator waved to a chair. Thank you for allowing me to spectate your interrogation. I can't wait to see the bastard squirm. She folded her fingers together and studied me with piercing blue eyes. My motives are entirely selfish, Sovlin. You could supplement any intel regarding the Federation and brainstorm pertinent questions. It doesn't matter. I've wanted to get my paws on a grey for a long time. And that's why we're watching from afar. It's personal for you. The human crossed her arms and eyed my lengthy claws with concern. Private Romero vouched that you can keep a level head. That you won't interfere or question our methods. Don't prove him wrong. I stared at my guard, who seemed to take note of my confusion. We had conversed about my desire for their suffering mere hours ago. Whatever a human did to an Arxer, my lips were sealed. Did they really think I, of all people, would take pity on those creatures? There would be no moral argument from this Gojid. If the Terran military violated Earth's conventions on torture, I thought it was justified. Those parameters weren't designed for child-eating abominations. Listen, I know what your inclinations toward humans are, Carlos grunted. Our interrogators are trained to say whatever it takes to extract information from a subject. They might try to build rapport with that thing by talking like fellow hunters. How can you even pretend to be like them? Monaghan rolled her eyes. We want to keep one talking. Torture isn't an effective methodology. Something about that matter-of-fact statement sent a chill down my spines. I think it was the implication that inefficacy was the main argument against torture, rather than the ethical rationale other humans offered. It sounded like her kind had dabbled in the art, after all, enough times to reach a scientific consensus. We're doing whatever it takes to stop them, Carlos added with a throaty growl. I just want to know that you won't misinterpret things. That he'll understand if a human agrees with a vile statement on camera. Care. Concerned I might fall for any acting that's geared toward the Akshaw. These predators don't want me to accuse them of hiding their true intentions again. I disagree with your methods, but I understand. I met his brown eyes and suppressed the ripple of fear that ensued. It's your ship, your prisoners. You don't answer to a conscripted criminal. Captain Monaghan nodded. Very well. Then I'll send the signal to begin. The human swiped at her holopad with nimble digits. The viewport on the far wall morphed to a different image, an overhead angle of the Arxer's cell. A sturdy chain clung to the reptilian's leg and allowed it to wander just far enough to sit at a metal table. It reminded me of the furnishings of my prison cell when Anton explained my legal rights. These savage predators shouldn't have legal right. If I overheard a lawyer introduce themselves and talk about defense arguments, I was going to blow a gasket. The door swung open, and a dark-haired human in military belts ambled up to the table. His strides were too casual for my liking, as he plopped himself in a chair with a bored expression. A clawless hand drifted to his chin and his eyes leveled with those of the monster. Second-hand fear tugged at my heart, seeing the primate within lunging distance of the grey. 
The oxer's imposing form was superior in every manner. Its dagger-like teeth flashed with menace as it studied the visitor. I don't know how the Terran could keep such a nonchalant demeanor. Could he really bank his life on a chain's integrity? The reptilian prisoner unleashed a vicious snarl without warning. The roar reverberated into the microphones. It was a bloodthirsty chord that set my instincts into overdrive. The decibel level directed into the primate's face must be enough to set his ears ringing and his skin tingling. The human interrogator yawned. Is that all? Are you done? I thought you wanted to talk, Captain. A rattling noise came from the prisoner's chest, like two stones scraping against each other. The translator proclaimed it to be laughter. I didn't know how the human stayed fixed to his seat, let alone displaying a cue of boredom. His cadence was also unwavering. You are truly predators. I had to be certain, it barked. That would be enough to make the feckless prey folk piss themselves. They're a little more than animals, you know. The Terran flashed his, much flatter, teeth. We know. The Gojits, they trampled each other the second our boots touched ground. Conquest is inefficient, but for your first prize, I presume, you wanted to be paws on. We interrupted your hunt, and you did not appreciate us spoiling the fun. You saved us a lot of work, the way I see it. There is much to learn from your people, if you would honor us. I'm Ross. Captain Koth. What is it you wish to know? Thinking of the Arkshire as self-aware individuals with names and ranks was too much. Ross' callous words stirred disgust in my chest as well. This predacious behavior was everything I imagined from his kind. In my prior adventures, the human tilted his head to one side, and I glimpsed an object in his earlobe. Despite his sinister words, he was still waiting for a cue from Monahan. Ask about first contact, and the events leading up to it, the Terran captain ordered. Ross narrowed his eyes. Tell me about the first time you met the Federation. What did they say? Why did you decide to hunt them? We want the full picture of how this all started. I blinked with puzzlement. This was a waste of a question. The humans knew how the war started. The reason they hunted us was because the greys were cruel and they relished suffering. There was nothing new to glean from the tale of betrayal, and certainly nothing that would serve Terran military interests. Before the Federation arrived, well, to understand why those dimwits contacted us, you must know of the Fourth World War, Koth hissed. You see, our regional powers always had competing interests. Does that concept register with you? Or have I already lost you? The human scowled. Our nations still bicker to this day. Goa. I see. The Northwest Bloc was a loose union of related cultures, which formed as a counterbalance to the Morvan Charter. The Bloc sought the reclamation of ancestral greatness and built an army designed to subjugate middling states. You're saying the block invaded its neighbors? Neutral ones. Yes, precisely. The war was a drawn out, bloody affair, as wars tend to be. The block brought scientists in for genetic research. They wanted to find a way to select the best soldiers, so their army could be the strongest. That leads us to Lasnel, or as he is known today, the Prophet. Captain Monaghan narrowed her eyes, as though trying to decide where the reptile was going with this history lesson. I didn't see how any details about a bloody war or politics were relevant. The Federation's succinct summation of a brutal culture that was bound to wipe itself out 
was enough. The humans didn't cut the creature off for some reason, and it was all I could do to listen to its grating tongue. A brilliant scientist indeed. He theorized that certain bloodlines had a higher probability of strength and intelligence. Koth tossed its truncated snout. Lasnell's report to the Block Council was published under the name Betterment, and it is mandatory reading today. The Prophet rose through party ranks, eliminating persons of lesser races, health, dispositions, and creeds from the citizenry. It looked like recognition, which flickered in the interrogator's eyes, but it was gone a second later. Carlos's breath hitched for a moment, and Monaghan's jaw tightened as well. I had no idea why such an unthinkable story would resonate with the humans. The Aksha just admitted their people's hara was forged from the genocide of their own populace. Ross leaned forward. What did the Morven Charter think of this betterment philosophy? They thought it was too radical. That was when the war truly became about destruction, making sure the other side was crippled or erased. In the wake of several cities' decimation, the Federation arrived. Their initial message was they were here to save us, and then they dumped their technology to our databanks. I think I understand. The Block used that technology to end the Charter, then turned their guns on the stars. Not at all. The Block and the Charter signed a peace treaty and began delving through the aliens' gifts. We didn't want a war with hundreds of species, who at the time were centuries more advanced. The Federation promised their own betterment plan, but would never contact us directly. We didn't know why then. My eyes widened as I observed how the humans were listening with rapt attention. This was an obvious distortion of the truth. The Oxa signing peace treaties? As if that were even possible. A growl rumbled in my throat, which earned me a warning look from Carlos. The guard had warned me not to interfere but it stung to watch them record deception. This grotesque predator was lying through its fangs. I didn't know how the Terrans could be impervious to the decadent hunger in its eyes. Anyhow, their medicine and the unprecedented peace meant people were living longer. Our food supply couldn't keep up with the growing populace. We asked the Federation for help. They offered two concoctions one for our livestock, and one for ourselves. We mass-produced them and rushed distribution. Without any trials, we trusted the aliens. They said it would cure hunger, and people were starving. Hundreds of thousands of volunteers took those oxyr doses, and the livestock one was sent to every major farm. Take a guess what happened next? I don't know. Tell me, how? The livestock began dying from a highly transmissible, lethal disease. As for the Archer test subjects, they were infected with a microbe that made them allergic to meat. Here's a simple question, Russ. What happens to obligate carnivores when they can't consume meat? They starve. Correct. Every volunteer was dead within a month. The Federation simply responded how pleased they were that we were cured of our desires. Their intent was to force us not to be predators, like it were a choice. My mouth opened to protest, and Carlos slapped a hand over my lips. I struggled against his grip, coughing out muffled words behind his oily palm. There wasn't a sliver of truth in this far-fetched tale. The Federation wasn't an organization that went around bioengineering killer diseases. We reached out to the Arxer out of kindness. Why is Koth lying to them? Is it trying to use humanity in its conquests? Perhaps the Arxer noted that these primates feel empathy, so they're using standard manipulation tactics. 
I... The Eam interrogator hesitated. Oh, Aoi. What does your prophet Lesnel have to do with any of this? We had to make choices about who lived or who died. All nations, including the Charter, finally embraced and expanded upon Lesnel's thinking. The individuals with the highest markers for aggression and violence were chosen as survivors, and the rest of our population was culled. What about the Federation? We studied them, and learned how they eradicated predators on their worlds. Someone got the idea to make them our cattle, and used that to scrape by. It's fittingly ironic. It is revenge. You think of grabbing their non-sentient animals? The prey folk are the most populous species on their worlds. They breed incessantly. Besides, they destroyed their wildlife populations. The idiots wiped out most large animals on their planet, including any herbivores that got caught munching on roadkill. Captain Monaghan signaled for Carlos to release me, and his slimy palm uncorked from my mouth. The human officer met my eyes, but there was a new emotion brewing in her pupils. She was scrutinizing me. Like she thought I was hiding something. Irritation coursed through my veins, and I bared my teeth in contempt. This was ridiculous. The predators couldn't turn on us because of a flimsy tale from a subject who laughed at sharing and slavery hours ago. Pause the interview. The captain spoke into her holopad. So, the Federation gave Nazis space tech, then pushed everyone to follow them through starvation? Pure lunacy. The Arksha are sadistic monsters. This interview was a mistake, I snarled. You have seen them throw children in cages, chow down on people while they are alive, yet you are considering their lies? I thought humans were better than this. Monaghan returned a challenging stare. Your viewpoint is duly noted. Romero, your thoughts? It's something we should investigate. If it is true, the Federation erased it from their history books, Carlos replied. But I am certain Sovlin believes the public narrative, and so do the common people. Any deception on his part is unintentional. I gaped in disbelief. Deception? You speak like you believe that fithing. Look, it doesn't change the atrocities they committed, buddy. Humanity just wants the truth, whatever that may be. We can't work with half the facts, he growled. Why is there no documentation of first contact? Unless you're hiding something, why shouldn't we look? Captain Monaghan nodded. Agreed. From the Federation's perspective, they could think they were blindsided. They see predation as some form of wicked corruption. I cast a sullen glance at the video screen. The pleasure of the fleet's victory was short-lived, as was any notion that these primates offered a reliable source of protection. My desire for friendship with the Terran Guard was gone, in its place, was a blistering pain. After everything the Arkshire had taken from me and my people, it felt like a personal betrayal for these humans to place blame on us. The Nature of Predator's 40 Memory Transcription Subject Ang Wall understand why the Terran observers would trust them. It was at the human's clutches that the traumatized refugees were nursed back to health. They risked life and limb, and lost hundreds of ships in pursuit of our survival. How could they reconcile what they'd seen with the prisoner's narrative? The primates had loathed every aspect of the cattle ship, and acted distraught at the condition of the victims. I had wondered how one could tell when a predator was truly hungry until I saw the darkness in their eyes that day. There was a bottomless abyss of rage inside their pupils, 
it was a much needed reminder of human volatility. Me service on this vessel was for nothing, I bemoaned. What if humans decide to give the cow back? Have I just helped the Arkshire land? A game-changing ally? I a door to my quarters clicked open, and a weary Carlos strode in with a vegetable platter. He placed the tray on the bedside table, without any sort of apology. The food was soaked in some clear fluid. It felt viscous against my claws as I poked it. Had the omnivores coated the plants in an animal secretion? Maybe it was saliva, or worse. Why the fuck are these vegetables wet? I snarled, with as much hostility as I could muster. Disgusting. Carlos crossed his arms. It's Olive, Sovlin. Relax. You might even like it. Lots of healthy plant fats. I don't want anything from you, Predator. I grabbed an orange-colored slice and flung it at his cheek. The human barely reacted, only wiping the oil off with his chest belt. If you still feel empathy, shoot me now. Before I watch your kind turn on every species with a semblance of decency. You're overreacting, and you are not going to refer to me as Predator again. Why not? You defended the fucking Oxera, then accused me of deception. I don't want to see your face. Just listen to me, alright? Sixty seconds. Renewed disgust flared in my chest as the guard's binocular eyes pleaded with mine. I knew humanity didn't want sapient livestock of their own, but defending the act made them equally culpable. No moral race would rewrite the tragedy of first contact and the unspeakable losses that befell every species. The image from my nightmare of Carlos roasting me over a fire seemed much more realistic. He just proved that he could see gojits as food. This man, Beast, was a traitor to sapient kind, and yet I had grown attached to him. What happened to throwing the Arkshire in the cattle pens, where they belonged? I slashed my claws across a pillow several times, and struggled not to turn them on the human. I will never agree with you. Don't waste your breath. I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm asking you to understand. Carlos eyeballed the decimated pillows as fluff was flung across my form. Look, I listened to your spiel on torturing an innocent human and tried to empathize with you. Don't you think you can at least try to see where I'm coming from? The greys are your fellow predators. They're more like people to you than us. This isn't about the Oxyur Sovlin. It's about the Federation and how they've treated us. The prejudice and the hatred. That is because of the Greys. They won't stop until we're destroyed. Arrest. But can't you see how it looks from our side? Why we would think you're capable of killing and terrorizing predators when you've been hell-bent on our extinction since you discovered us. I chewed at my claws, considering the welcome that humanity had received to the galaxy. Governor Tava had made them aware of the Federation's extermination plans. The only reason their species still lived was due to misinterpreted sensor data. The second their survival was discovered, the entire organization convened to discuss a raid on Earth. There were entire religions formed around the eradication of predators, including the one on my world. Most individuals the UN tried to contact rejected the idea that humans could be civilized. This was typically due to the belief that their ilk were incapable of empathy, cooperation, or basic bonding. 
My experiences prove the error of that prior research. Kim Carlos pause, I would definitely resent the Federation. Maybe it would seem within the realm of possibility that we had done a similar thing to other predators. I guess. But I know better than to believe in Arxer's lies, I growled. However bad you think they are, they're worse. The human lowered his eyes. I'm not saying Koth is telling the truth. I'm saying he could be, because I know how much you hate our existence. I'll believe whatever the evidence says. Then I'll help you prove it wrong. Only because I am sorry for what the Federation has done to humans. I regret how much it has soured your opinion of us, and I know my part in that. That's all I ask. Are we cool? Yes. Good. Because the captain wants to see you. And I don't want to explain that you're pouting. I am not pouting. The predator's lips adopted a slight curvature, which seemed indicative of amusement. I was beginning to understand how Slanik could read emotions in their snarls. It was just a way of compensating for their missing tails. Did humans ever envy that additional appendage that the rest of us took for granted? It was a miracle they were so graceful and balanced without it. I shoveled a pawful of vegetables down my gullet, then dismounted from my bed. Carlos steered us back toward Monaghan's office, and we traversed the ship corridors in a comfortable silence. Amazement rippled through me as I realized my spines were lying flat. The second I noted my proximity to the predator, they returned to full bristle. Yikes, that is starting to hurt. Why did I have to think about it? Yeah, the doors to our destination slid open and distracted me from the latest dose of fear chemicals. The UN captain was reviewing one clip when we entered, a curt exchange between Koth and Ross. Her eyes were bloodshot, like she had been poring over footage all night. Humans could be obsessive, that was for certain. One piece. What do you see as acceptable end conditions for the war? The Terran interrogator asked. You don't get it. There is us and them. Saliva oozed from the reptilian captain's fangs as it spoke. There can only be peace when every Federation planet is dead. That is acceptable. Ross narrowed his eyes. What if that is not acceptable to us? Then you're stupider than I took you for, and you'll die with the Federation. You can watch the prey folk new to your race before your extinction. Captain Monaghan punched some notation into her holopad. Her sigh sounded flustered, but she didn't seem concerned by the extermination threat. If I didn't know better, I would think that question had been aimed at finding out if diplomatic avenues between us and the Greys were possible. So, there would be no room for negotiation? The UN interrogator pressed. Humanity cares for one alien species above all others. They are a part of our pack, and we will not abandon them. Koth thought for a moment. Its pupils darted from side to side, as if it were scanning its memory banks. The cold intelligence on display was appalling, and the Terran's reckless divulgence alarmed me. Humans were painting a target on Venlil Prime, if they publicized that alliance to the enemy. Ipar Tarva, the species she saved from certain death, is trying to get her killed in return, careless, idiot monkeys. Ali, the Venlil, Koth decided. You've got to be kidding. That explains their thwarting what should have been a simple border raid. Ross was quiet. The human maintained eye contact and waited for the prisoner to continue. He did not confirm or deny the reptilian's guess, which was affirmation of itself. 
the Oxure slammed its snout against the table. One of the weakest, most frightful species of them all. The Venlil are beneath you. That is for us to decide. Surely you see that they're a liability to you? What use could they be? You referred to them as packmates, not food or slaves. That means equals. I meant what I said, Koth. An attack on them is an attack on us. We would die for them happily. But why? Because they defended us from the Federation, despite the fact that we're predators. They were the only ones who helped us. Humanity would never repay such a debt with anything less. The Arkshire shook its head, huffing with disgust. The abomination was repulsed by the interrogator's soft rhetoric. This was Ross' worst miscalculation yet. Still, it was a relief to hear that the humans would stand by the Venlo, if nothing else. I thought they were ashamed of their prey friends for a moment. A growl rumbled in Koth's throat. What is it you're asking? We could discuss sparing one species, if that's what you require to join us. That, and the release of every Venlo held as livestock, unharmed, the human barked. You expect us to give up millions of cattle we already have? We're starving as is. Surrendering any of our existing food supply is a non-starter. Captain Monaghan tapped a button on her console, and the video feed paused. I knew she was the one who directed the interrogator to barter over lives, like any mundane commodity. She hadn't even reacted to the premise of Venla's food. These familiar faces were leaning into their predator roots a bit too much, ever since they started interacting with the greys. Fortunately, this foray had gone nowhere. That last statement sealed the finality of a diplomatic impasse. The Aksha would never part ways with their precious quarry, by Koth's own admission. Regardless, the offer to spare the Venlo further harm was empty talk. The Predator would say whatever it thought afforded the best chance of escape. Would the humans abandon this folly now? It was insulting that they would even pose such questions. Monaghan sighed. Well, it's a start. The Federation said the Greys were incapable of negotiation. You're negotiating on whether your G best friends thing deserve to have their pups tortured and hunted for kicks. I spacked incredulously. Sovlin, you are out of line. Carlos tugged at my scruff, which snapped my attention to his flabbergasted expression. She doesn't answer to you. You said it yourself. It's all right, Monaghan growled. If we rescue every enslaved Venlo, I don't imagine Tarva will care how we achieve it. Especially if that option would negate years of suffering for those people, and save Earth significant loss of life. The UN guard narrowed his eyes. There is a reason we get along with Tarva. Ah, government is actually reasonable. Kimpling that mine is not. Irritation swelled in my chest. So you're really moving forward with this plan? Nothing has been decided, Sovlin, because it's not my decision. My job is to weigh options for the UN and to see if talking is even a possibility. Turns out, it just might be, the Terran captain replied. You didn't even mention Gojits or any other species to cough. Let's say you save the Venlil. Then, you're just gonna let everyone else rot. Humanity does not believe any sapient deserves such treatment. We would never be involved with or agree with those practices. Monaghan raised her eyebrows, emphasizing her predatory gaze. However, if we can only save one race, 
you should understand why the Venlo are our top priority. It's still wrong. I refuse to help you trade lives and bargain with those demons. Good thing that's not why I summoned you then. Now that we control the Cradle, we'd like your help with the Gojid refugee crisis. They belong with their colonies or the Federation, but it's not so simple. There was no need for further explanation from the Captain. I grasped the dilemma that humanity was facing. It wasn't as easy as flying this ship to the nearest Gojid colony and dropping them off. An inbound Terran transport would draw a shoot-to-kill missile fire, no matter how slow their approach or polite their hail. The same problem would occur at any Federation outpost. Using the Venlo as a courier may not work either. They're considered predators by association at this point, however, with the humans potentially in cahoots with the Oxer, we had to get the Gojid refugees out of their custody at once. Judging by the reaction to Koth's interview, the primates were susceptible to corrupting influences. It didn't take much to warp their good intentions, and rope them into a dastardly scheme. The more I pondered it, the enemy's motives could stretch beyond escape. The offer of an alliance might be genuine, since the UN impressed so thoroughly in their early engagements. Humans had the power to decide the conflict for either side, and would only grow more dangerous with time. The Federation needed to straighten up our act, and make sure the Terrans stayed in our corner. I had to do whatever was in my power to convince our galactic allies not to follow Gojit mistakes. Antagonizing Earth made the Child Eaters look more palatable, even to noble soldiers like Monahan and Carlos. Adding a second predator to the Oxer side would turn this war into a demolition. Then we contact both my people and the Federation, I decided. I still have some sway. Monaghan grimaced. How do we speak to your people? Your settlers might need to relocate. We don't have the resources to protect this region long term. I'll tell you how to reach Gojit government channels. If they still exist, that is, be warned, they probably don't. The last I heard, the designated bunker was looking shaky. Carlos rubbed his neck anxiously. Doesn't your Prime Minister hate us? Piri had a change of heart. She would be a useful witness with the Federation regarding this whole debacle. Short of that, I'm probably your best mouthpiece. You know, being one of the few surviving and well-known Gojits. You're the best. We're doomed, the UN guard groaned. Monahan chuckled. Let's see if the PM's alive before we pronounce our political death, Romero. Look what you've got your captain thinking. Political death? I glowered at Carlos, knowing intimidation would have no effect. Thanks for the vote of confidence. He flashed his teeth. No problem. Whatever the Terrans might think of my reliability, the remnants of the Gojidi Union needed to do our part. Right now, the Venlo were the only incentive for Earth and her citizens to risk their hides. That needed to change before it was too late. I was going to impress upon anyone that would listen that humans were a species worth saving, even if we were saving them from their predator selves. The Nature of Predators 41 Memory Transcription Subject East Lanek Venel Space Corps State Ustandardized Human Time October 8, 2136 when the science officer from Humanity's first contact team reached out about a fear study, was a bit intimidated. Sarah Rosario had done extensive biological and environmental analysis, and collaborated with Venlil scientists throughout their early behavioral research. Her talks comparing our psychology racked up millions of views, 
as did her controversial analysis on Venlo ecosystems. In a nutshell, Terran conservationists were less than thrilled with our biomanipulation. Sarah had lambasted our efforts to wipe out predator species and discuss something she referred to as trophic cascades. The aspects she attributed to the absence of hunters were far-fetched, though she spoke at length about supposed examples from Earth. How could removing a terrestrial predator alter the ocean, destroy vegetation, or spread diseases? Humans can prove their own worth without grasping at straws. These arguments are just moronic. Besides her fringe theories, Sara was a remarkable scientist with credentials in several fields. If anyone could find a way to break Venlo fear responses, it would be her. I knew the process could be traumatic, but I would do anything to leave my internalized feelings behind once and for all. I was tired of failing to protect my human friends. Are you sure about this, Slainik? Marcel growled as we approached the scientist. If, if you're trying to be more human to appease me, please don't. I accept you for you. I squeezed my tail around his wrist. Thanks, but I'm doing this for myself. I'm tired of being scared and at the whims of my instincts. Tyler patted me on the back, a little harder than I would have liked. The blonde human accompanied our group to assist with any physical activities, since Marcel was still in recovery from his gunshot wounds. The UN military was involved with these experiments, so I knew part of it was seeing if I could be shaped into a proper soldier, dread festered already, knowing simulated combat was in my future. Why do you keep helping me, Tyler? We haven't known each other long, and you must have other things to do, I said. Dude, I wanted to be in the buddy program just like you two. The UN turned me down. The soldier towered over me, and his blue eyes glittered like ice crystals. They didn't think I would mesh with the Venlo, I guess. Too tall and too scary. Marcel frowned. You were turned down, cause you're not vegetarian. Though your stature probably doesn't help your case. Aliens are the most exciting thing to ever happen to mankind. I want to be a part of this all, but maybe they were right. I always stick my foot in my mouth with the Venlo. I studied the flesh-eating soldier, imagining I had never seen a human before. Marcel was a daunting hunk of muscle when I first glimpsed him. His shadow smothered me, and his forward-facing eyes were like spotlights peering down from above. It was only seeing him at his most vulnerable, cold and afraid, that squashed that threatening aura. That said, my friend barely came up to Tyler's shoulders. The sandy-haired soldier was tall, even by human standards. His dietary choices would have given everyone at the outpost the creeps. It was likely something would be blurted out about dogs and persistence hunting, at a stage when his partner wasn't ready to accept that. Still, there were a lot of good memories to be formed with Tyler, if you could see past the bulky predator. He was friendly to a fault, considering my emotions at times when I was harsher than he deserved. There was selflessness in the way he didn't hesitate to carry me off the cradle. I hoped other Venlil would give him a chance someday. I nuzzled against his arm, which startled the big guy. I appreciate you, Tyler. Your heart is in the right place. Don't give up. Appearances aren't everything. That was actually sensitive and thoughtful. Marcel feigned a gasp and I giggled as the whites of his eyes expanded to cartoonish dimensions. Who are you and what have you done with Slainik? Oh, shut up. You humans are a lot to take in, and you know it. Tyler placed a hand on his hip, striking a goofy pose. Well, take it, Wally and Buddy. 
appearances are worth something. 210 pounds of glorious, rugged. Yeah, yeah. You're the pinnacle of male perfection, Marcel snorted, shoving the other soldier with his good arm. Keep walking. The Secretary General doesn't want to see that. Okay, Secretary General? Why would Meyer be here? I followed my human's gaze and surveyed the Terran scientists camped by the machines. Sarah was taking an inventory of her equipment while other predators were staring at us. My nerves flared as I realized most humans present were in military uniforms. I knew these experiments would have combat applications but I didn't think martial leaders were calling the shots. Secretary General Meyer looked less amused with my pack's antics than I was. Tom Foolery was not his favorite pastime. He was in a heated discussion with several people in green and brown uniforms. The color scheme looked like a tree threw up on it, but they didn't seem the type that would appreciate such comments. Sarah waved us over to her. Long time no see, Slanik. Glad you're back in one piece. Uh, I'm hoping to stay that way. Why are all these important pred humans here? I squeaked. She lowered her eyes. There's no easy way to say this, but I'm afraid our work will have to move much faster than I anticipated. We don't have much time. You heard the news from Venil Prime? Secretary General Meyer interjected. Marcel nodded. We did. Ambassador Williams is alive, and he returned with some new friends. I was glad my human piped up, because this ambush had thrown me off my prepared responses. Maybe trying to create an easier bonding process? The picture of the Zorlin, Tyler began. Surulian. Sarah and I corrected at the same time. Cerulean on the human's shoe is everywhere. My man was just like, oh, a predator? Looks like a warm, comfy pillow to me. Secretary Maya breathed an irritated sigh. The other news. The Krakal are leading a crusade against us, and we have less friends than foes. Not that even our friends are likely to help. Simple math dictates that we're at a numerical disadvantage. The thousands of ships the birds have been massing represent a multi-species coalition. One of the uniformed personnel chimed in. Projections indicate that they'll set sail today and arrive on October 16th or 17th. Horror coursed through my veins as the gravity of the Terran's revelations set in. How could these humans be so calm at the prospect of an attack on Earth, Marcel? And Tyler both were subdued, but their reaction wasn't on the level it should be. This was a raid with the intention of turning their verdant home into a barren rock, the same as the Arxer's vile tactics. The Krakotl were one of the few species that could head a functional offensive. They boasted a high aggression since they evolved to scare off predators. During the initial phases of the Arkshar War, the avians conjured up the technology that allowed us to regroup. While nobody was on the human's level, they possessed some tactical acumen. Why not launch a preemptive strike? Like you did with the Gojits? I demanded. Maya frowned. It's too late now, but it wouldn't have worked. Most of their ships were already spaceborne, so we couldn't catch them sleeping like the Gojits. They concentrated forces around their stations heavily. But you're... Excellent fighters. You have advanced ships now. Nobody can rival a predator's military prowess. They outnumbered us ten to one if we sent the entirety of our Ulri Fuldgling armada. They also had home turf advantage and orbital lasers around every base. 
you might as well launch the UN fleet into a supernova. You'd get the same results. Sarah sighed. Our best hope was for Noah to convince them to stand down. That didn't work out. I turned my gaze toward Marcel, noticing how his gaze drifted to his holopad. My human's thoughts were transparent at times. He was worried about the welfare of Nulia and Lucy, who remained back at his residence. The Gojid child would never feel safe again if she watched another world endure destruction. Cats if anyone survives the attack on Earth. The entire human race is in jeopardy, I realized. We need to get everyone off world before it's too late. I... I pin my ears against my head. You know the Krakotla are coming. There's still time. Evacuate Earth. And go where anyone who wishes to leave will have the opportunity, including you, the Secretary General growled. This is our home, we've built everything here. It's the only planet we've got. Marcel ruffled the stray tuft on my head, gentle and reassuring as ever. Us soldiers, we're going to stay and fight. No. I shrieked. Come with me to Venlo territory. We'll take care of you, all of you. Please don't die, humans. It's okay, buddy. Go back to your world. I want you to be safe. Tears rolled down my face at the thought of Marcel perishing by a crocodile horde. It brought back unwanted memories, like the scorching pain in my chest when I thought he was about to be shot in front of me. We had been to hell and back together, and it had finally seemed like our lives could settle down. Now. Without warning, the light at the end of the tunnel was extinguished. If Sarah's team were cancelling my experiment, I understood. Humans had bigger things to worry about than my fragile instincts. Scrap the study, it's not a priority. I rubbed a paw against my cheek, catching the water rolling down my fur. You don't have to worry about diplomatic fallout from me. I want to fight with you. Maya shook his head. We can discuss integration to a UN vessel, if the results of your training are positive. However, I recommend that you lend that option some serious thought, as high casualties are expected. I appreciate that humans honor your word, but you do not have time to fix me. Don't waste. This study is very important, Slanik, for the survival of our species. The Secretary General crossed his arms, a calculating scowl on his face. Look, if Earth falls, the Venlo will be custodians of the few remaining humans. It will be up to you to rebuild our population and to protect our survivors from threats. Don't talk like that. Please. I have to. Our research could point you in the right direction and make your soldiers stronger. If things don't work out for us, this is humanity's parting gift, Sarah finished. I speak for all of us in saying that I hope the Venlo prosper. My tail drooped between my legs, and it was all I could do not to collapse in defeat. The Terran's odds of defending such an onslaught were slim. Every human I knew could be dead in little over a week. Hearing the UN leader speak as if that probability was likely crushed my hopes that the soul system had some predatory tricks tucked away. Their species didn't deserve this fate. The humans faced their impending doom with fearlessness, so I needed to accept reality too. If my participation strengthened the Venlal military in the UN's absence, I would do whatever was asked of me. No matter the mental duress this exacted on me, it was worth it. I swallowed hard. Thanks for telling me yourself, sir. 
Where do we begin? Sarah rummaged through a box of her belongings and retrieved a red fabric sleeve. It took all of my willpower not to shy away as she tugged it over my face. Her curved nails waded through my fur like daggers. I couldn't see it all for a split second, which added to the panic. How could placing coverings on my head impart anything? They have to have a good reason. These predators will not hurt you. Humans will never hurt you, I repeated internally. The human scientist was gentle as she tucked a pair of straps behind my ears. My vision returned as two cutouts fell over the eye's positioning. It felt like I was suffocating in the mask, but the fit was correct enough. Was it custom made to my dimensions? Its purpose must lie beyond adding color to my silver fur. I realized that something was wrong with my sight as soon as I processed my surroundings. Where I had seen Tyler standing beside me, there was only a dark shadow. Marcel's comforting snarl was obscured as well. This headgear had barriers to take away my periphery. Was this what it was like to have predator sight? Sarah clapped her hands. Perfect. You good, Slyne? Marcel's voice echoed from my left, and I had to turn my head to look at him. The motion felt alien. You look miserable, like a fish out of water. It was tough to describe how it felt to be unaware of the objects in my vicinity. Simply carrying out a conversation was unnatural. No wonder humans got jumpy if I came up beside them without thinking. Something could sneak up behind me now, and I wouldn't realize it was there until it pounced. I'll survive, I grumbled. You're going to make me calmer, Sarah, by limiting my vision? No offense. But I thought limited optical range was a downside to being human. Your instincts are triggered by things approaching from the side or behind you. You're easily distracted by your surroundings because you see too much at once. I think this'll help your spook reflex to focus on a single target at a time. I get it. Like horse blinders, Tyler stated in a glummer tone than usual. Like what? Maybe I'm making the wrong inference again, but it sounds like they've tried to force their tunnel vision on other prey animals. Yeah, and the scientist nodded. Precisely. Slane, why don't we try a combat simulator with the blinders? If it doesn't help, or you really don't like it, we'll drop it. Fine, that ice. Sarah steered me into a separate room with a light touch. The enclosed space appeared to be an imitation of a patrol ship cabin, complete with controls and sensor readouts. Where the viewport should sit, there were blank screens. I imagined they would reflect Oxer ships in a few minutes. Tyler squeezed into the co-pilot's seat, a downcast expression on his face. The tall human knew we could be in a dogfight that was very real a short time from now. The stakes of our next mission would be his entire planet. This flight presented no tangible threat, and I needed to keep that fact at the forefront of my mind. Somewhere deep inside my soul, there had to be some bravery lurking. All that mattered was gaining admission to the UN's last stand and proving that prey genetics didn't define us. These virtual enemies were going to have hell to pay. The Nature of Predators, 42 Memory, Transcription, Subject, on Slanic, Venlil Space Course, Dodd Date You Standardized Human Time, October 8, 2136. The humans instructed me to place a wraparound headset over my ears. I was impressed with how they had modified their technology with Venlil in mind, though I hoped I wasn't the only one who would get to use it. 
The earpiece fed simulated audio of alarms and hits. It also allowed Sarah to speak to me directly. Slanik, I'm going to talk to you throughout this exercise. In time, I hope you will learn to do these things yourself, she explained in a melodic voice. Thoughts guide our actions. By changing your thoughts, you can unlearn negative behaviors. I tilted my head. But that's the problem. You can't control your thought. Well, not with attitude. You didn't develop your thinking patterns overnight, Sarah responded. It takes time, effort, and understanding to make a self-adjustment. Mind if I ask you a few questions before we begin the simulation? Go for it. When was the first time you encountered a predator? I failed to see the relevance of the question, but I decided to humor the human. If she thought delving into the origins of predator phobia would further her understanding, it wouldn't hurt to play along. The more background info she had on me, the better subject I would be. <sighs> Show the Arkshire sure, on TV. But that doesn't really count. Mother tried to shield us from those atrocities, I recalled. Encounters with predators were uncommon on Venlo Prime, though occasionally one slipped through the cracks. Teams of investigators in armored vehicles would travel out to the site, scorching any area with evidence of a hunter's presence. There was no way we would leave them alive to reproduce and terrorize our settlements. Extermination officer was an occupation that paid well, but all the money in the world wouldn't be enticing enough for me. My parents took me for a walk in the local pasture, and there was a dead rodent on the sidewalk. Lots of blood. There were larvae all over it. News cameras turned up within minutes. A shudder rippled down my spine at the memory. The anchors said a predator might be on the loose. The entire neighborhood was placed on a curfew by local police. Schools were closed indefinitely. Tyler couldn't hear the other end of the conversation, but he shot me a baffled look. The human's eyebrow arched up his forehead, as though he couldn't believe what he was hearing. I think the words he mouthed were, What the fuck? Tell me more about that. Did they find out what happened to the dead animal? Sarah inquired. I gritted my teeth. It died of natural causes, according to the autopsy. Everyone was relieved that there was no imminent threat. But that was the week I learned about food chains and our place on it. How did that make you feel? Scared. Powerless. I just couldn't believe there were animals that based their existence on K-killing. I can tell this is difficult for you, Slenik. If I may, what conclusions did your childhood self reach about predators? Predators had to be cruel and unfeeling to be able to stomach such violence. To eat in that rotting corpse I saw. The Aksha must have cemented those beliefs. I take it that was your initial feeling toward humans. A horrified gasp came from my chest as I realized what I just said about predators. It had slipped my mind that I was talking to one while I was focusing on the emotional residue of that experience. There was the thoughtlessness Marcel teased me over. I'm sorry, that was too honest. I didn't mean to say you're, I squeaked. Relax. I'm not offended. Sarah's voice was reserved and soothing, like the rustle of leaves in the wind. I want you to be transparent with me, especially about how humans make you feel. I don't like to think about humans being predators. It's jarring to equate you with, uh... The animal in the field, with eating, rotting corpses. Yes. The scientist was silent on the other end of the headset, and I caught some light scraping sounds. 
She must be taking notes from what I was telling her. I hoped I hadn't said too much. The humans wouldn't admit they were offended, even if they were. You did great, Selene. Thank you for sharing that with me. What I am going to ask of you now is to try to put yourself in the predator's shoes, she said. Come up with as many reasons why an animal might choose to hunt as you can, beyond being cruel, violent, and unfeeling. We'll talk about it at tomorrow's session. I focused my eyes on the floor, ignoring Tyler's inquisitive stare. Did flesh taste so good that it was addictive? It was tough to think of a single other allure to predation other than biological impulse. Even with humans, I assumed they had those aspects within them due to their brutal hunting methods. The difference was that I believed they had another side and that there were enough positive attributes to outweigh the repugnant ones. Besides, they found a way to sate their cravings without harming other creatures. Maybe that's something I should ask Marcel. He might know the answer Sarah is looking for. I breathed a weary sigh. I don't know if I can do that, but I'll try. Good, Mime. Now we're going to start your mission. The goal of this exercise is to stop any hostile ships from reaching orbital range of Earth. I'll be here for guidance as needed. The screens glowed to life, and Tyler clenched his fist around the firing trigger. The image of Earth in the background was hyper-realistic, down to the orange glow dotting the continents. Swirling clouds idled across the oceans, and the inky backdrop framed the planet in serene radiance. It was a breathtaking sight, even in a simulation. I searched for enemy contacts on sensor data. Craning my neck, I tried to get a visual on a fast-approaching vessel from our left. The blinders were inhibiting my sightline, so it was difficult to ground myself. At least it rendered me impervious to the virtual explosions and conflict taking place in the distance. My breath hitched in my throat as a plasma beam sailed meters from our hull. This felt too real and dangerous. The stress of decision making was enough to make panic seep in. I was frozen as usual. What was I supposed to do? I couldn't even remember how to engage the targeting systems. Nonetheless, inaction was unacceptable. My trembling paw slammed a steering column and veered the ship toward the hostile. My diminished vision blurred. My heart was pounding so hard that it felt like an earthquake in my chest. Every instinct declared that facing an aggressive foe was too perilous. I feel like I'm going to die. Like I'm flying into my doom, and it's not even real. Meanwhile, Tyler was impossibly collected as he aligned kinetic munitions with the target. How could humans push through the chemical fog with such ease? It was as though their instincts compelled them to run headlong toward danger rather than gallop to safety. Slanek, deep breaths. Count to five as you inhale, then count to five as you exhale, Sarah's voice growled. I took a few wheezing breaths, attempting to comply with her orders. Through the lightheadedness, I could see the opposing craft enlarging in the viewport. A horrified gasp escaped before I could contain it. This was all happening so quickly. There was no time to think. Everything on screen froze, including the hostel that was just magnified. I slumped my shoulders in shame. The humans were going to can the experiment on day one. I was a hopeless cause. Helping them was never going to be within my capability, no matter how much I wanted it to be. Talk to me, the scientist's voice sounded urgent over the headset, which jolted me out of my daze. Rate your fear on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the worst you've ever felt. 
I blinked in confusion. Um, seven? We can work with that. Everything is going to be fine. This feeling will pass, Sarah said. What thoughts went through your mind as you started to feel afraid? I just... I know I can't do this. I'm not a fighter, and I never will be. My instincts can't handle stress or danger. What I'm hearing is that you don't feel that you can control your emotions. You've decided it's not possible already. Humans are special. I have to face what I am. What you are is a good pilot. Remember, the enemy is just as vulnerable as you. It doesn't feel that way. Never does. Focus on your target and get the shot off. Everything else doesn't matter. You can complete that one thing. One step at a time. Squeezing my eyes shut, I allowed my breathing to fall back into a calm rhythm. It was within my power to press a few buttons, wasn't it? There had to be a way to override my instincts. The way the humans kept their aggression in check. Marcel had squared off against nine Arxer vessels in an inferior ship, and we survived. This was nothing. Hey, we can do this, Slenic. You're not alone here. Remember that. Tyler growled. I flicked my ears in appreciation. The sandy-haired human didn't have much heart after learning Earth's insurmountable odds, but he was still trying to be supportive. Bravery felt a little less difficult, knowing that fearless predators had my back. Humans were survivors, and that meant I was in good company. You're not doing this by yourself. You're on the predator side, not the Krakotl. They're the ones who should be afraid. I believed in humanity's strength, even if I was uncertain of my own. Newfound determination swelled in my veins as the simulation resumed. The blinders were there for the purpose of directing my attention to a single task. It was a matter of just acting and not thinking at all. The opposing ship barreled toward us, racing closer to Earth. My aviation knowledge kicked in, and I verified the target on sensors. All I contemplated was the intake of my breathing, while my claw jammed down on the missile switch. Projectiles honed in on the sleek bomber, tracking its evasion attempts. My human partner sent a flurry of kinetics close behind. It was prudent to take advantage of any disruption to shields. The missiles rocked the imaginary opponent, and Tyler's well-timed rounds tore through its armor. The seamless teamwork was invigorating, for a moment. The predator bared his teeth at the thrill, and I almost mimicked him. Instead of allowing the follow-up options to overwhelm me, I asked myself what humans would do. They would go for the kill and not give the enemy any recovery time. Persistence hunting taught them how to be relentless. Maybe I could learn from that cruelty as well. Leave my friends alone. I hissed to the screen. It was easy to channel my outrage at the unprovoked assault on Earth. Nobody hurts my herd, ever again. I navigated the ship nearer to our nemesis. My anger at injustice was warring with the voice that told me to turn back. The resolute snarl on Tyler's face was enough to keep my paw on the accelerator. Just this once, I wanted to be the predator, to pounce on a weakened enemy. My heart was racing while I unloaded a devastating salvo into their flanks. Orange tendrils burst from its metallic shell and damn the fictitious crew to the vacuum. The simulation faded back to white with a mission successes declaration. You did it. Tyler cheered, forcing a grin. That was all you, Slaine. I leapt up from the pilot's seat, 
wagging my tail. As the Federation often reminded us, Venlo weren't supposed to have a fighting bone in our bodies. How had I managed to kill an enemy? And emulate Terran in intensity? Had the humans changed me? An answer to Sarah's earlier question popped into my mind. An animal might choose to be a predator, because it refined their species into something stronger. Hunting mandated discipline, and lessened the brunt of fearful instincts. Maybe it was empowering to be the one dealing the damage. Sarah cleared her throat. I told you that you were a good pilot. That exercise should give you hope for what we can accomplish. But it was only one ship, guys, I pointed out. That's nothing compared to the Krakotl invasion. We're going to increase the duration and number of enemies every day. You'll be taking on an army in no time. The exhilaration of success fizzled out as I processed that daunting prospect. The scientist sounded hell-bent on pushing me well past my instinct's limit when all was said and done. Every day was going to be more of a struggle than the next. If nothing else, though, her questioning had forced me to consider my fears in a new light. Oh, buddy, I'm so proud of you. Marcel must have snagged the microphone. His rumbling voice fluttered into my ears. You're going to turn those birds to space feathers. They'll never see it coming. Thanks, uh, but I don't know about that. He chuckled. You're stronger than you think you are. The attacking skills are there, as we all saw. You nailed that fucker, even with Tyler button mashing and getting in your way. This time, the tall co-pilot leaned close enough to hear the headset chatter. He threw up his hands in exasperation, then turned his glare at me for giggling. There was hilarity in the expression that once would have had me on the floor, begging not to be eaten. I knew humans well enough to recognize the difference between jest and malice. Tyler waved a fist at the camera. Slanik and I are gonna win this war while you're still on your ass eating Doritos. Nah, are you kidding, bro? I'll be up there, stopping you from snacking on too many crayons mid-battle. What can I say? That's a true predator's diet. I appreciated that my friends were able to make light of a dark situation that was their method of coping with the unpleasant. There wasn't a more resilient species in the galaxy. With their example to model, maybe it was possible to mold me into something a little more vicious. The survival of these alien predators was what was important, I reminded myself. My progression was a secondary objective that would complement Terran aims. If Earth was to be lost, the spiteful defenders would take as many enemies with them as possible. No battle waged against humans was ever as easy as it looked on paper. Regardless, I had faith the Venlo Republic wouldn't hang our allies out to dry. The Nature of Predators 43 Memory Transcription Subject L. Call Alliance Command date to you standardized human time, October 8, 2136. The Federation fleet entered warp in harmonious accord, and our voyage to Earth um, commenced on schedule. I was less than thrilled with the extraneous additions to my crew. Krakotl officers were preferred to the reserved exports of another species. Our diplomats stressed that this was an interplanetary effort and forced my talons. While I understood the necessity of building group cohesion, the farcel they implanted as operational first officer was already asking questions. His name was Theon, to my understanding. He was a personal favorite of their high elder. That didn't buy him any favor on my vessel. 
The Kirkatla Alliance was the entity that planned this mission, down to the gritty details. Me crew was chosen because of their special attributes, and I trust them. You never know who can keep their head in battle until you've been there. Kion scrunched his droopy ears. Why are Terran colonies not on the bombing agenda? The data dump suggested humans had settlements on the Red World and their moon. There's research outposts in the gas giant moons, asteroid mining operations, orbital telescopes, and I get it. But Earth is the priority, I replied. Yep. Other than military installations, the rest can be cleaned up afterwards. The fossil wiped the mucus from his nose. The plans for a follow-up operation should be drawn up now. We have to stay prepared. What is there to prepare for? The predators can't muster a semblance of our numbers. I puffed my feathers out, in a display of intimidation. You know, Theon, I much prefer Jala as my XO. She doesn't nitpick everything. You keep strange company, Kalsim. There's something wrong with Jala. She seems off. There was a comment that had some basis to it, though I wasn't ready to take an outsider into my confidence. Jala was diagnosed with a rare cognitive disorder that entailed not producing the neurotransmitters for fear or affection. This caused a deficiency in empathy. Her responses to situations were often tasteless. Most Alliance officers wouldn't have allowed such individuals in their crew. However, the benefit of a person that didn't panic or lose focus couldn't be understated. As long as she didn't have to deal with the interpersonal side of things, Jala was the finest officer in my crew. I credited her as the reason we were the most effective ship in the Alliance Armada. That is, I... Captain Kalsim, to you, I spat. Jala follows orders and makes the right calls. She's still my second even now, as far as I'm concerned. Captain, I see we've gotten off on the wrong pole. Dion's slender tail curled across the floor, twitching with restlessness. I'd rather be on a farcel vessel too, but this is where we are. Can we try to make the most of it? I tossed my beak. Fine, thought Koi. But, did you have to start tearing everything apart the second you came aboard? I like to know who and what I'm working with. Every captain has a different background and a different way of running things. The more I know about you, the more useful I can be. Then I'll keep it short and sweet. I started off as an extermination officer. I'm still one really, just with a starship and a title. Theon's whiskers twitched as my former profession registered in his mind. There wasn't a better vocation to prepare a person for eliminating predators. It taught how to destroy a monster's habitat and prevent any chances of survival. Sapient extermination wasn't that different, except that there was more land to torch with the breadth of a planet. There was a buzzing sound at the door, and I peeked at the security feed. The other Federation implant on my crew was the new medical officer, though the peculiar aspect was the species. The doctor was a Takan veteran. The Takan coalition had been outed as one of the parties amenable to a full alliance with humanity. For some reason, this Takan individual had thrown himself onto a transport and begged to join our raid. The newly demoted Jala escorted him to my quarters, per my request. It was a mystery why a medical practitioner would want to fly toward a predator's homeworld. My own doctor deserted when she learned the fleet's destination. Kit could be a simple case of this Takan despising his government's rhetoric. Still, I want to look him in the eye and demand his reasons. Come in, I growled to the intercom. Theon, you can stay if you want. 
The Farsal thumped his tail. Yes, sir. I can't believe he's stolen my post, Jala snapped. We'll settle this later, soft ears. I glowered at the female Krakal. Don't mind her, please. Come in, doctor. The Takan male strode through the door and plopped himself in a chair without waiting for permission. His tough hide was silver, about the same hue as my ship's metallic walls. Those tritoed paws wiggled enough to grasp objects, though I found his kind much clumsier than Krakotl surgeons. Few species compared to how well our talons could sink into or wrap around things. I jabbed a talon at the doctor. What is your name? Than, sir. All right. Tell me, what is Atakan doing, volunteering for a mission like this? I squawked. When I landed on Alpha to share that the Gojid Cradle was annihilated, I discovered that my species betrayed the Federation in my absence. It was horrifying, shameful. Captain, I want to put an end to this alliance permanently. I nodded my beak and contemplated his words. If we returned from deployment to find the Alliance cozying up to predators, it might push me to renounce my citizenship as well. Then again, a doctor shouldn't have devoted his entire life to extermination. Why would Zarn feel compelled to take such drastic measures? Wait, if I may, you were stationed in Gojit space? Tion interjected. Zahn swished his tail. Yes. I was working under Captain Sovlin. We were the first vessel to encounter a human. My eyes snapped toward him. I heard. Everyone heard. What you lot did was cruel and disgraceful. I don't know that I want you on this ship. I... Beg your pardon, Captain? It was a human, not an actual sapient. That abominable freak deserved to rot for eternity. All predators do. The captive Terran pilot in their custody could no longer pose any threat, yet Sovlin and his lackeys granted it the slowest death possible. Extermination teams were swift and surgical when our services were needed. Suffering was never our goal. Listening to a helpless creature scream and knowing it was in unimaginable pain, that didn't make anyone safer. The line that separated us from the Arkshire was one that could not be crossed. Humans are true sapiens, Doctor. Make no mistake. My feathers were ruffled as I offered the reproachful assessment. I even believe they feel selective empathy. They're pack predators, after all. I'm surprised to hear you say that, Yon muttered. Why? Because I used to be an extermination officer? Zahn blinked in surprise. The doctor gave the appearance that he was about to contest my statements, but my field expertise was enough to make him reconsider. I understood predators better than most citizens of the Federation. Humans weren't as simple as they would like to believe. Captain Kalsim has a certain respect for humans. He thinks they're interesting, as do I, Jala chuckled. The physician's amber eyes bulged. Interesting? Respect? They kill for sustenance. I puffed out my feathers for emphasis. If you don't respect a predator, you're already dead. They're not to be trifled with, remarkably cunning. The Farsal officer tilted his head. Your tone is almost reverent. Wouldn't someone with your skill set hate predators? Dion, you shouldn't hate humans. They can't help that they're a disease, that they infect everything they touch. Bacteria don't choose to be bacteria, and predators don't choose to be predators. 
they just are. So what are you saying? It sounds like you don't believe in this mission, Zahn snarled. Sure I do, but it shouldn't be about hatred. I don't derive any pleasure from killing billions, only a predator should. You should feel sorry for the humans, and be grateful that we were not born in such an accursed form. The doctor recoiled, and I could see indignation brewing in his eyes. The company, this Captain Sovlin kept, seemed like an extension of his own undisciplined behavior. It must have been difficult for Zarn to witness the Cradle's destruction, but his current behavior was unhinged. I wouldn't want this Takan cutting me open if my life was in the balance. You pity a creature that is incapable of pity. It's ironic, Jala remarked, a sharp glint in her eyes. Dion's nostrils flared. Hey, I'm not following either, Captain. Why do you support wiping humanity out if you feel sorry for predators? Few understood how terrible it was to pour gasoline on a youngling as it cried for its mother's milk. The first time I found a nest of predator pups, the guilt of killing them nearly caused me to quit. They were tiny, innocent, and untainted by their parents' atrocities. I broke down on the ride home and asked my mentor how we could kill a baby for the way it was born. There was cold logic in her explanation. Little predators become big predators and reproduce exponentially. Within a few cycles, there would be a full-blown infestation. It wouldn't be one set of pups we were killing. What happens if we don't wipe them out? Humans will spread everywhere, and they'll be in our systems in no time. This is our only chance to destroy them. We kill because we must. It was an unfortunate reality that Earth had to be eradicated. Unlike our incensed ambassador Jeolim, I understood why most in the Federation couldn't bring themselves to push the button. They were relieved not to have to wrestle with the moral conundrum of killing a species that had yet to lash out. They didn't want to spend the rest of their lives wondering if some predators could have been saved. It was the same reason the Federation readily accepted that humanity destroyed itself with nuclear bombs. 200 years ago, Dot. That, that, this while this problem got so out of wing in the first place. The predators attained spacefaring capabilities without anyone realizing. Only a few months into their expeditions, humans had already caused the destruction of the Gojit Cradle. The longer we let Earth survive, the more Federation worlds will perish. We agree on this being our moral imperative, but that's all we agree on. Zahn leapt up from his seat and swished his tail with impatience. I'm here because I want to witness humanity's death with my own eyes. I'm qualified, overqualified even, and I know the enemy. Now, do you want my services or not? Gala snickered at the Tarkin's temperament. I like this one, Captain. Well, I do not, but it's not like I have a suitable replacement, I muttered. You'll follow my orders on this ship, Zahn. It's not becoming of a doctor to have such little value for life. I don't need a lecture over how I feel toward predators. I value lives, our lives. Yeah, show me to the med bay now, Zahn hissed. The female Krakatl glanced at me for confirmation, and I curled my wingtip in a go-on gesture. Something told me I needed to keep a close eye on the doctor, the kind of person that delighted in death and suffering would never have intentions that I could trust. Besides, it was a bad omen when the crewmate who took a shine to Zarn was a sociopath. That was an unpleasant discussion. What do you think, Theon? I asked. The fossil hesitated. I... 
I think I have your back, sir. That's not what I'm asking. If you're going to be my exo, then I expect you to speak freely behind closed doors. Frankly, I've seen what happens after predators hit a world as well. There's nothing to feel remorse over. I'll sleep better when this mission is done. Understood. Let's head to the bridge and keep watch for any Terran ambushes. My heart felt heavy as we set off together, and I wondered where my crew fell along the moral spectrum. Theon missed the distinction between his feelings and Zarn's, though perhaps he would realize in time. Unlike the Doctor, the First Officer was motivated by reasons that had nothing to do with the humans. His concern was the suffering he witnessed, and any future threats, rather than pure vitriol. That was the correct rationale for the destruction of Earth. This fleet would succeed in its duties, because there was no other option for our survival. The Nature of Predators, 44 Memory, Transcription Captain Talzim, Krakotl Alliance Command Date with Standardized Human Time, October 9th, 2136. As soon as we departed Krakotl space, it became evident that the humans had been, had the humans had been, tracking our movements. The predators were lurking in the shadows along our starry route. Two ambushes were sprung on the fleet during the first day of travel. The primates knew that we were coming, and that was enough to unsettle the crew. But the humans were afraid, from what I could tell. Their attacks seemed devoted to stalling, and shipping away at our resources. Larger Terran ships had FTL disruptors on their hulls, which could be deployed as soon as we came within range. They would dart in for a missile run while we were dazed, then vanish just as quickly. Why do they flee after a single strike? These techniques seem too cowardly to be born of predators. Hey. Nonetheless, I adjusted personnel rotations so that our vessel was combat ready at all times. I allowed myself only a short nap after the second ambush just to refresh my wits. There was no time for a full night's rest until the enemy resurfaced. Eon was working overtime as well, compiling data to predict the Terran's next appearance. Our vessel was going to nail the humans next time they tried anything. If their attempts at disrupting our operations were this lousy, they must lack confidence in their combat abilities. This locale seems like the likeliest spot for an ambush. The EM radiation from the system's pulsar makes our sensors and targeting wonky, the first officer said. Though, perhaps I'm mistaken. It would affect their targeting too. My feathers ruffled with disquiet. I suspect humans' reliance on targeting is less than ours. They have a backup system in their brains. Should we advise the fleet to reroute? If I'm correct on Terran whereabouts, there's less than a minute before they activate the disruptors. Let's not do anything hasty, Theon. Their ships can outpace us, so we'll just be pushing this off to a later date. We face these predator pests here, on our terms. The Farsal officer swallowed nervously and studied his readout. I couldn't blame the big-eared guy for feeling discomfort about engaging the humans blind. Our instinctual fear wasn't conducive to off-the-cuff maneuvers and precise calculations under stress. Krakotl could muster aggression, sure, but that desperation wasn't controlled. But Jala wasn't bogged down by chemicals. If I placed her behind the weapon station, she could recalibrate our artillery on a dime. We didn't have to worry about fear, addling her senses. There was a reason I twisted the brass's wing, not to lock her up in an asylum like they wanted to. It was in our best interest to use people like her against the predators. I cleared my throat, Yala. Assume control of weapons, this switch to manual override. 
and hit the first ship you see with whatever you like. The female Krakatl shoved a younger officer out of her way and pecked the buttons with giddiness. She didn't need to be told twice. It was rare to see anyone else so thrilled to carry out orders, especially when those involved being flung into combat. My second in command wouldn't miss the clues if they were shoved in his face. Captain, answer me honestly, Theon whispered. Does Jala have predator disease? I lowered my voice. That terminology is ignorant. Predators do feel fear. Jala is an asset that I have under control. She knows I'm the only thing stopping her from being thrown in a deep, dark hole. I don't believe for a second that predators feel anything, but she has more in common with them either way. How can you trust her not to side with always a name? Even people with her condition don't side with people who want to eat them. I've heard that as a way of shortening your lifespan. You don't say. The Farsal transferred the projected enemy coordinates onto the sensor grid. By his estimates, the humans were camped within a gas giant's ring. It seemed a suitable position to lie in wait. The planet's gravitational field added further disturbance to sensor readings, and the icy ring particles were indistinguishable from a quiet vessel. Cat's actually some solid analytics from Theon. I suppose I'm fortunate the guy the Federation saddled me with is halfway intelligent. Yang, the first officer, also noted the maximum range of an FDL disruptor. It stood to reason that the humans would wait until the bulk of the fleet was within the Pulse's umbrella. I highlighted the blast zone circumference on my screen, using their approximate location. Now, it was a matter of forging ahead and waiting. Navigations, as soon as we hit the edge of that red circle, disengage warp, I squawked. If we time this right, the humans will think we're stunned. Just as they show themselves, we'll be ready to fire. Theon blinked in surprise. Bold plan. If we're off by a few seconds, we'll get dazed alongside everyone else. And if we drop in too early, the humans will know we're on to them. Of course, we don't know they're here for sure. We could be chasing ghosts, but I'm um, trusting your work. Thank you, sir. Shouldn't we tip off the fleet, though? Negative. The predators may have breached our comms. Other friendly vessels may have come to similar conclusions, but our role as the Krakoto flagship was to seize the initiative. Defeating a predator necessitated brashness. I don't think even the meticulous humans accounted for us turning the tables. They were under the impression that everyone in the Federation was weak, and that might serve us well. The fear plastered across the bridge crew's faces was apparent. The inexperienced enlistees weren't keen on hurling a multi-billion credit ship into a predator's trap. To be fair, this was the kind of action that earned reprimands from Alliance Command if it backfired. We had one chance to validate our decisions. My, thus say I take unnecessary risks and attributes my success to luck. I imagine Theon read that dossier before boarding. I, for better or for worse, I always asked myself what a predator would do. Trying to predict their moves or understand their thinking was easy. Once it was a habit, this raid was one final job before passing the baton to someone younger. What better way to cap off my career than by vanquishing the greatest threat of our time? I fluttered over to the navigation station, ready to intervene if the technician froze. Our dot was almost overlapping the perilous area. Dion was itching to issue the disengage order but I didn't want to jump the gun. We couldn't allow the riskiness to inhibit our patience. My breathing hitched as we entered the pulse threshold. A little further, real space now. 
a head-on view of a gas giant materialized on the viewport. The dull orange mass, surrounded by a glistening ring, was a sight to behold. My talons stiffened as the feeling of being watched sank in. I couldn't see any enemy ships, but I could sense their unholy presence. No sign of human activity, Theon began. Thousands of friendly vessels appeared around us without warning. The Federation fleet was evidently reeling from the effects of the disruptor signal. Lithe Terran ships swarmed out of the ring and descended on the nearest Krakotl vessels with fury. Jala's wings extended to their full span as she began firing missiles at will. Several projectiles slammed into an enemy bomber and it was terminated mid-swoop. More explosives followed close behind, sensed with whirring kinetics that pelted their shields. The humans were pushed back by my crazed Krakotl, long enough for some friendlies to catch their bearings. Our allies' aim was clearly rattled without sensors, and most plasma beams missed their mark by a long shot. Nonetheless, the predators determined the mission was a wash. They weren't going to take the chance of a stray hit connecting. There's only a few dozen ships in this ambush, anyways. The Terran military didn't lend sufficient support. They're retreating. Don't let them get away, the Farsal First Officer exclaimed. All Federation ships fire at will. I barked over the comms channel. I don't care if you miss. Hurl everything you've got ready at their position. Jala was happy to oblige those orders, and dispensed another round of missiles toward the gas giant's cover. That was where the Terrans were trying to vanish for emergency war. None of our explosives connected with an opponent, but they did pack a punch to the ring itself. Ice fragments were flung out from the epicenter and some shrapnel found its way into human armor. The navigations officer maneuvered us to the edge of the ring. The proximity was close enough to get a visual. I mean, a few predator craft were rendered inoperable or ripped apart by debris. Cheers erupted across the bridge as they saw the devastation we unleashed. I tried to mimic pleasure but gunning humans down just made me feel numb. My eyes lingered on the wreckage in the viewport. Nice work, Jella. We must have taken out a number in the double digits, in no small part, due to your fortitude. Don't mention it. That was fun. She trilled. Just a shame our skirmish was so short. I was expecting more of a scrap. Theon narrowed his eyes. It's not a shame that our victory was decisive. It makes it more likely that our flight to Earth will continue unimpeded. I tuned out their bickering. My focus was on scanning a motionless Terran vessel via manual input. Ship sensors had been fully automated since before I was born. At close range, though, it should be possible to work through the interference with operator assistance. The human craft I scrutinized had its hull caved in, which suggested debris impact at high velocity. It was mostly intact, but life support and propulsions were knocked offline. Some part of me itched to know if its pilot was still alive. Future generations would ask about these earthlings and nobody could provide an adequate explanation. This was a pristine opportunity to document the sapient predator's mannerisms. Silence on the bridge. Calms, make sure all transmissions are being recorded, I screeched. I want everyone here to know the enemy, so I'm hailing that venting wreck. Consider it a crash course on predators. Theon gasped. What? What makes you think that demon will answer? 
I tilted my head. There was no guarantee a human would accept our communication attempt, but it was worth a try. While seeing its face would make the crew shudder, there was no feasible risk. Its weapons and escape options were severed, and it was smart enough to know that. The outbound hail was sent with a swipe of my talons, against the protests of the crew. A tense silence filled the air, as our signal was extended to the crippled foe. There was no response for several seconds, which only added to the crew's nerves. Did these people think a predator could teleport on deck through a call? I could almost sense the Terran's bewilderment, it was weighing whether to hear our message. Curiosity must have won out, because a pair of frosty blue eyes appeared on screen. The ferocity of its gaze sent several crewmates ducking for cover, their color looked cold and unnatural. The beast had a laceration across its forehead, and was dabbing it with a towel to keep the blood out of its vision. Kit's wounded. Maybe it's not thinking straight, so we can pry some intel from it. I couldn't say that looking at it didn't give me the creeps, even after decades of dealing with predators. This creature was more intelligent than anything I eliminated in the wild. There were only a few clumps of hair across its face, which made it look alien and bare. What do you want? I don't need your mockery, birds. It gurgled. I resisted the urge to avert my gaze, and instead tried to make neutral observations. Beneath that petrifying visage, there were signs that the creature was rattled. The slightest furrow of its brow suggested fear, and the way its jaw tightened indicated pain. It realized its death was imminent, that knowledge overshadowed its last moments. I raised a wing in a non-committal gesture. Nobody is mocking you. I just want to talk. You've got to be shitting me. It leaned closer to the camera, close enough to make out the veins in its eyes. What makes you think I want to talk to you? Enlighten me. A hunch. I figured a pet predator wouldn't want to die alone. If I'm wrong on that. You can end this transmission now. Dion was staring at me like I'd grown a third wing, while Jala was observing the exchange with amusement. I had my reasons for fielding this call in the public eye. The crew needed to see affirmation of my theories, after the skeptical reception I observed. It would be a critical lapse in understanding, to presume they shared the Arxer's solitary behavioral patterns. The human bared its teeth, and shook its head in disbelief. It placed its chin on its hands, then refocused those horrific eyes on the camera. Frost spiraled from its plump lips, which suggested the cabin temperature was frigid. With only a stringy flaxen mane, I didn't imagine it would last without environmental regulation for long. You never answered my question, the beast sighed. What is it you want? I want to rescue you from that icebox. Surrender yourself to our custody, peacefully, and I'll see that you survive. You can ensure that your culture is remembered. Thanks, but no thanks. How fucking stupid do you think I am? Death is better than what you lot do to human prisoners. You have my word that I'll hold you in fair conditions. You don't want to die. I can see your fear. The predator blinked slowly and hugged its arms together to conserve warmth. It wasn't ready to give up key information now, but if I managed its needs, it might start spilling intelligence. Self-preservation was a driving force in every sapient being. The human detached a small cutout from its dashboard and turned it toward the camera. The image was of three snarling young predators, with the pilot crouched beside them. Another adult primate had an arm around the offspring and was flashing pearly white fangs. They looked vicious, but 
Happy. That's my family. I am afraid, but not of my death, it growled. I am afraid that you are going to kill everyone I love. The only thing that will please you is my whole species purged from existence. And I don't know if even that will quench your hatred. Please, stop this. The transmission cut out abruptly, and I pushed down the lump of pity in my throat. There was the confirmation that humans cared for each other. I hoped that inspired a bit more sympathy from my comrades. The Krakatl government shouldn't hide humanity's redeeming attributes. It was enough to establish them as a major, valid threat. Gee, truth matters, I thought to myself. Am I not going to strip that away on my ship to make ourselves feel better? Kei, the Predator only has a few hours before its atmosphere is used up. Order, sir? Jala asked in an emotionless voice. I lowered my gaze. Terminate it. Ah, uh, I quick death, Jala. The human refused my offer and we can't leave it to be rescued by its brethren. The female Krakatl rolled her eyes, but deployed a missile into the drive column. I watched as the wreckage went up in flame. It was merciful to grant the beast a swift end, rather than condemning it to suffocate in that freezing tomb. Still, its death didn't bring out any positive emotions. Some of the crew seemed moved by its elimination as well, which meant my strategy was a success. Dion's nostrils flared with exasperation. What were you thinking, Captain? What would you have done if it accepted your offer? I would have stuck it in the brig, like I said, I answered. And no, Sarn wouldn't have gotten within a hundred paces of it. We could contain a single wounded predator, and it was useful. Useful. What did you gain from that little chat? Watch your tone, Exo. This is my ship. Now, you all know the enemy as I do. You can come to terms with the real reasons for this mission. The Farsal first officer gritted his teeth. Theon was disturbed by my generous view of predators, but he knew protesting on the bridge was out of line. Perhaps he needed to believe falsehoods to maintain his conviction. All doubts needed to be sorted out before we reached Earth. Assuming the Terran ambushes were resolved, the fleet's next engagement would pummel everything humanity had into oblivion. When we reached our destination, I hoped my crew would be ready to do what was necessary. The Nature of Predators 45 Memory Transcription Subject Gilvanor Tarva of the Venlo Republic Date We Standardized Human Time October 9th, 2136 This should have been a jubilant moment. The UN Liberation Fleet established contact with the Venlo military and requested permission to dock on our homeworld. A victory against the Arxer was something I never fathomed the humans had accomplished the impossible. But I didn't understand why the Secretary General had traveled all the way from Earth to meet with me. His stated purpose was to discuss something urgent with me before those ships landed. The way the human diplomats were tight-lipped and implored me to remain calm instilled some apprehension. My advisors were aware of the Krakotl invasion. We offered to take in as many Terran refugees as needed. About 50,000 predators had arrived on the first flights and were settled into temporary housing. We didn't have the resources to take care of them long term or to satisfy their dietary preferences, but leaving our friends to die wasn't an option, so we'd figure it out together. There was no need to persuade us to help and the minutiae could be handled by stand-ins. As for the diplomatic fiasco, the humans sent representatives to every allied species yesterday. They would point the finger at the Colchian Commonwealth and pray their innocence was believed. With such immediate casualties, all bets were off. 
I'd expect the Thafki to be most suspect of predators, given that they're almost extinct. The Fissans, with their expansive resources, are the ones we truly must convince at all costs. Hey, wasn't much to do besides await each race's reaction. I told the humans, in no uncertain terms, that I wouldn't expect any government's assistance. What else could the UN figurehead wish to discuss in person, at such a crucial time in his planet's survival? If Maya was leaving Earth, shouldn't his priority be appealing to Shosun or Tossa for aid? Noah, do you know what this is about? I asked. The Terran ambassador frowned. I think it's better to wait for Maya, Tarva. I don't imagine you're going to like this. Please, just promise you'll try to understand. The ominous reply didn't provide any reassurance. That was how humans spoke, when they were worried something predatory would frighten us or shake our trust. I didn't like seeing my beloved friend pleading with me, like I was bound to turn against him. Don't be like that, I grumbled. What? Are you finally going to tell me you hunt through your endurance? Noah gaped at me, eyes bulging. Who told you? I figured it out, watching you exercise back on Alpha. It occurred to me how that tirelessness might help chase down prey. You don't have much else going for you. Gee, thanks. You don't, don't seem very concerned, though. Why should I be? Your people would never hunt mine either way. I am humanity's friend and I'm not here to judge your ancestors. The ambassador patted my shoulder with affect. I didn't appreciate that there was still secrecy around their hunting methods, but trust was a slow process. Fortunately, my deduction skills were sufficient. You are the only real friend we've had out here. Thank you, Noah whispered. I flicked my ears in acknowledgement. Not to inflate my own ego, but I'm pretty alright. So Secretary General Maya doesn't need to waste time talking me off the ledge. Ah, the ally I'm talking you down about, a gravelly voice interrupted. Noah and I both startled. Neither of us noticed the Secretary General enter the cavernous reception hall. I had no idea how long Maya had been eavesdropping, but it was enough to catch the subject matter. I was glad I didn't make any suggestive quips about their endurance. The UN leader looked like he hadn't slept in days, as he tossed a hard copy photograph on my desk. The poor guy collapsed into the nearest chair and pawed at his bleary eyes. I wanted to order him to get some rest, but with Earth in danger, I doubted he would comply. My gaze landed on the image, which showed a uniformed human sitting across from an Arxer. Was this taken from one of their ships? The Grey had a shackle around its leg, so at least it was restrained from rampaging through the crew quarters. How the Terrans got it there in one piece was another question. We captured several Akshur from a cattle ship. Secretary General Meyer stifled a yawn and blinked in quick succession. Quite a few of our major players had, well, concerns about sharing the next part with you. Given that you're the only reason humanity is still alive, I felt you had the right to know. Titu know what? I asked, hesitantly. Maya raised his hands in a placating gesture. Please don't take offense. I'm just repeating the story multiple Grace told us. They claim the Federation infected thousands with a microbe that made them allergic to meat, then killed their livestock to force them into herbivory. I narrowed my eyes, processing what the human relayed. Our Terran friends proved that being a predator alone didn't explain the Arxer's cruelty. Either sadism was a trait unique to their species, 
or a reaction to a particular event. On that note, the Federation had no issue sacrificing lives or bending morals in the short time I knew the primates. I've watched them beat and starve a human. Blow up spaceships to eliminate any offer of friendship. Plan multiple raids to wipe out all life on Earth. Honestly, I wouldn't put that antagonism past the Federation. But if it's true, I know nothing about it, I replied. Regardless, why would the Arksha choose to farm sapient beings rather than eat plants? Noah pursed his lips, suppressing a sigh. There are obligate carnivores, Tarva. They cannot survive without meat. I tilted my head in confusion. I... I'm sorry, I don't understand. Why not? Obligate carnivores can't digest plants like you or me. They don't have the right gut bacteria, and they can't synthesize vitamins from plant forms. There are certain nutrients, like taurine, that exist almost exclusively in meat, Maya chimed in. Correct me if I'm wrong, Noah, but I think such carnivores have high protein requirements as well. The astronaut nodded. Exactly. The glucose in their blood, you know, energy, comes from proteins rather than carbohydrates. In the absence of protein, their bodies start eating their own muscle and organs. I shuddered at the notion. Having your innards digested by your own cells was the literal definition of starvation. Human scientists needed to spread these facts around. It would make predation more sympathetic. Flesh eating made sense if biology left no alternative. Noah couldn't eat any meat while he was at the Federation summit. No wonder he was irritable. I had no idea he was in such agony. My main concerns flooded my mind and I stared at the ambassador in horror. We were informed from the onset that humans had higher protein requirements. Had the vegetarian visitors been suffering or starving to pacify us? I hoped none of them would have long-term repercussions. That was never my intention. Noah's brown eyes softened. What's wrong, Governor? Was that too graphic? You have been starving from eating plants? I squeaked. Maya breathed a frustrated sigh. Humans are omnivores, Tarva, as we have told you many times. The nutrients in vegetables are quite accessible to us. That said, without animal products, we usually develop serious mineral deficiencies, Noah interjected, sensing my next question. Vegetarians need supplements or fortified foods, B12, iron, protein, and so on. This has been explained to your medical community, undoubtedly. It was easier to absorb those nutrients through dietary means. At least the Terrans could survive on vegetation, with a little help. The Akshur couldn't derive any nutritional value from plants, even if they wanted to. I didn't know why Zero scientists, here or in the Federation, had figured that out. So it's not about bloodlust at all. I get the point, I think. I sighed. What do you want to do about the Grey's story? Maya grimaced. Governor, I'll give it to you straight. The Arkshire offered us an alliance, and the Federation has forced us to hear them out. We need all the help we can get, especially from such a powerful player. I stared at the floor and avoided Ambassador Noah's pitying gaze. This was the scenario every Venlo dreaded from the moment humans declared their peaceful intent. Everyone feared they would buddy with the Oxer at the first opportunity. We hoped that these predators wouldn't be like the ones who saw us as tasty playthings, but the truth was, Terrans were nothing like the monsters we imagined. They sided with the Federation 
and mustered a genuine attempt at peace. General Jones told me a long time ago that humanity would do anything to protect Earth. I couldn't blame them for making that decision, forsaking our predicament for theirs. I blinked away tears. Do what you have to. I understand why you're leaving us. Their friendship is more impactful. Leaving? Maya echoed. Wait, do you think we're just going to let them eat you? Noah stepped toward me, shaking his head for emphasis. We'd never abandon you. Never, understand? The Terran ambassador enveloped me in a warm hug without waiting for a response. I sank into his suffocating grasp. Losing the humans would be a devastating emotional blow, especially this particular human. I didn't think I could bear it. The selfish part of me wanted them to stand against the Arxer, whatever the cost. The Secretary General cleared his throat pointedly. We consider you the same as our own people. Any deal with us mandates the release of all captive Venlo and an armistice between your governments. That is non-negotiable. Double what? You want us to ally with or bargain with the Greys? I hissed. Something like that. Elias, i.e. killed in my only child because of their bombing excursions. I remember how it felt. T2 hold her in my arms as I told the doctors to disconnect life support. Forgive me if I'm not thrilled about the idea. The humans were considering a deal out of necessity, but the circumstances were different for our predator friends. Terrans hadn't been slaughtered en masse for centuries. That wasn't something you just forgot. Whatever the Federation had done, it didn't change the unspeakable atrocities committed against Venlokind. You can't reason with creatures who bomb schools and laugh at brutalized pups. I don't want to talk to the Greys. I recognize that personal experience was clouding my judgment, but I didn't want to brush it aside. Even my mate and I separated because he reminded me too much of our daughter. The pain was still a constant ache in my heart. Suffice to say, I despised the Arxa with the utmost venom. I am sorry for your loss, Tava. I know how hollow those words must sound. The wrinkles on Maya's face were taut with sympathy. But please let me correct that statement. You did not kill her. You chose not to prolong her suffering because you're a selfless, kind person. My tail drooped with grief. T, thank you. Is that what you really think? I do. That's why I think you'll help us broker this deal. So nobody else on your world will have to endure that feeling ever again. And so that we might not have to bury our loved ones seven days from now. The UN leader was a gifted speaker. I'd give him that. Was any price too high to bring peace to my planet? Even a brief reprieve would merciful. If it halted the torment of millions. All the Venlo really wanted was for this senseless war to stop. Noah, how can we? No. How can you trust them? I asked, after a long silence. I don't, but there's no good alternatives. The ambassador crossed his sinewy arms. I'm disgusted by those fascist child eaters, but the Federation is the immediate threat to Earth. Maya frowned. We're ideologically incompatible with the Arxur, long term. An alliance would be temporary to buy time. Perhaps we can steer them down less reprehensible paths. I suppose the reptilians would be less of a menace under Terran control, pointed at our enemies. T2 
Still, how could we justify this to the non-hostile Federation majority? The largest voting bloc were the 107 that sought an anti arcture alliance with humanity. Those species would see a predatory partnership as violating the crux of their position. Are you guys trying to ensure I lose next year's election? I grumbled. I'll stand with you, but this won't look good. You might as well go on galactic television and pledge to eat a Zerulean infant a day. Noah flashed his teeth. Well, the birds already think that's our morning breakfast. We're a past worrying about appearances. Very well. Though, I hope you have a better plan than flying to a cattle world and offering me as a sacrifice. Maya smirked. Actually, an Arxer captain gave us the location of one of their spy outposts. I'm going to fly within comms range and strike up a nice conversation. Care to join me, Tava? The thought of seeking a carnivore's safe haven made my heart stop in my chest. There was nothing I would care for less than to be surrounded by abominations. The mental image of hungry eyes darting over my vital areas made me want to curl into a ball. What Venmil would ever want to talk those foul beasts? A low whine rattled off my vocal cords. I can't think of a worse idea, but I'm right behind you. Let's get going. The Nature of Predators, 46 Memory Transcription, Subject Oh, Governor Tava of the Venlo Republic Gate, ye standardized human time. October 10, 2001. 136. Alarms blared from the cockpit. And my fur stood on end. Maya's head snapped up from its snoozing position. The human needed only a fraction of a second to process the stimuli. The Secretary General jumped into full alert mode, scrambling toward the ship's helm. It was incredible how quickly the Predator brain kicked into fighting mode. Our transport was accompanied by a ten-ship UN escort, which was armed to the teeth. We planned on skirting the edge of FTL comms range and blasting a long-range transmission toward the Arkshire Station's coordinates. There shouldn't be a high chance of conflict, since we were keeping a substantial distance. Still, the humans came prepared to protect their leader. Status? Maya asked, his voice icy calm. What's all this about? The Terran pilot grimaced, massive formation on an intercept course, about two milliparsecs out dots like patrollers of an Arxamake. Hail them on all frequencies. Already done. No reply, sir, but our sensors picked up an attempted target block. Abort. Mission. Adjust our course at once. Too late. We can't shift our heading quick enough in hyperspace. Shit, I don't belong anywhere near a conflict, I panicked. Why didn't the humans assume the station location was a trap? I guess desperation overrode their paranoia. It seemed the reptilians weren't as keen on talking as the captive ones posited. The fake promise of an alliance was exactly the sort of deception the Federation claimed was inherent. If the Arksha managed to subdue us, I might have to take drastic measures. I hoped I didn't pass out at the first sign of boarding. My head felt woozy, like I had been twirling around for hours. Maya's eyes widened, and he caught me as I lurched forward. It was all I could do to coax the slightest motions out of my muscles, as the terror of becoming Arkshire livestock intensified. The UN leader pushed me back into my seat and strapped me into the harness with steady hands. Peace, Elias. I see, see, can't. Please kill me if they get on board, I pleaded. 
The Secretary General combed a hand through his gray hair. Nobody is going to die. We'll figure a way out. No, P promised to kill me if that time comes. My words tumbled out in hyperventilating gasps, and I caressed my searing heart. You have no idea what they'll do to me, especially when they figure out who I am. Please. I understand what you're saying. Everything is going to be fine, but I need you here with a colossal jolt radiated through the ship's frame. Maya doubled over, clutching his temples, profanity spewed from the human's mouth. That was quite the deviation from his typical composure. It felt wrong to see such a stalwart man roll onto his side and curl up into a fetal position. His cheeks had turned bright red and his binocular eyes watered. Geese, Maya, okay? He looks like he is asphyxiating. I've never seen in a human skin that color. Key. The effects of the FTL disruptor pulse hit me a millisecond later. I felt my ears pop like I was in a plummeting elevator, and the discomfort only escalated. I whimpered in pain, as I sensed the fluid sloshing in the auditory canals. The positive was it snapped me out of my fear, but the existing dizziness was compounded. My surroundings were an undulating haze. Ah, fucking hell, the Secretary General grunted. Shields. Shield. The Terran leader shifted onto his stomach and began to crawl toward the cockpit. He tapped his earlobe, still bothered by the ringing sensation. He then shook his head, as vigorously as a rain-drenched Benlil. I didn't think any human had been on the receiving end of a disruptor pulse before. This crew was the first to experience it. The disorienting effects inhibited his coordination, and he couldn't jab his finger on the right button. There was no concerned chatter from our escorts. Their bearings must be rattled too. The greys had rendered us defenseless. Silver streaks closed in on us from a diagonal heading. Orange light encompassed an escort vessel's hull as the Arxer swooped in. The reptiles seemed to be taunting us by drawing so close. More blinding beams accelerated around us and drilled into the UN craft from flawless angles. This was a beatdown, not a fight. I struggled through my own panting. Elias, get a firearm and shoot me. Please, I beg you. A disgruntled Meyer struggled to his hind legs. His hair and attire were more disheveled than I ever recalled. The dignitary was painstaking with his grooming and persona. His reddened skin glistened with water, and dark stains spread under his arms. Human sweat had a way of making them look slimy and feral. Hail the Arkshire again, but with a video preview. Do it! The Secretary General barked. The helmsman stiffened. Are you mad, sir? That's going to be a little difficult now. Our pilot slammed a fist on the control column, swerving away from a flock of mini-missiles. I guess those were designed to squeeze between chinks of armor or dodge interceptors. Our ship listed to one side as several hits battered our underbelly. The navigator howled some curses. Maya shook the other man's shoulder. Open that channel. Do we exactly what the fuck I said? Yes, sir. The Secretary General placed his hands on the console, steadying himself as kinetics pelted our armor. Our allies were trying to intervene, but several were otherwise occupied. Maya gritted his teeth and turned his eyes right toward the camera lens. An Arkshire ship banked around us and pivoted to a head-on view of the cockpit. Its railguns glowed as it prepared to finish us off. My bloodstream was flooded with nauseating chemicals. 
these were the last moments of consciousness I would ever have. To my bewilderment, the enemy craft hesitated. Its weapons powered down, and it lost interest in our staring contest. The other greys also backed off, leaving their Terran targets time to recuperate. They circled back to their jump point, and watched us from the increased distance. Greetings on behalf of the Arkshire Dominion. The throaty voice on the speakers was accompanied by a visual of a menacing creature. The sight of its yellowed fangs was revolting. Our sincere apologies, brothers. We do not mean you any harm. Maya heaved a flustered sigh. Why did you attack us? We hailed you as soon as we saw you. Your subspace trail originated from Venlo Prime, so we didn't realize it was you. The predator croaked. You were heading straight for a key foothold of ours. Listening to the prey beg is a waste of time. I'm sure you understand. It didn't escape my notice how the Secretary General's shoulders tense. He inhaled a few purposeful breaths, as though trying to restrain his temper. I was aghast at the civility the Arxo was displaying to the humans. Nothing directed at us ever suggested this demeanor was within their capacity. Even as they are polite to the Terrans, they are bashing Venlil. They would never agree to a truce with us. I am heading for your listening station, Maya growled. Humanity wishes to negotiate terms for our species' interactions, and we have some intelligence to offer. Its eyes narrowed to slits, inspecting the primate's form. Beak. I am listening. Identify yourself. I'm Secretary General Elias Meyer, leader of the United Nations. Do you have the authority to negotiate on behalf of your species? Authority over this sector. I'm Chief Hunter, Isif. This transmission is being recorded, so I will relay anything you say through the proper channels. My difficulty in collecting my thoughts was frustrating, but this was marked improvement from being fired upon. It was unsurprising to learn Arkshire labeled their highest ranking officers as chief hunters. Their society revolved around the systematic slaughter of other sapients. Did the humans really think they could change that? This was a foolish mistake on my part. The Venlo had no part in any of this even if we were loyal to the Terrans. That will suffice, the Secretary General decided. Humanity thought you would be interested to learn seven species that have relocated their military assets. In other words, their territory is practically unguarded. Isif's tongue flitted between its fangs, as it salivated at the prospect of a raid. The sinister gleam in those eyes was enough to make me question humanity's plan. How could my friends call such a malicious assault on the Krakotl's head? Meyer knew precisely what would happen to the civilians on World. It was a low move, even with the stakes. Also, there are 17 other species who have mobilized a couple ship units, the human leader continued, without any sign of guilt. Perhaps that will weaken a few key regions, or result in their forces being spread thin. The first seven names will be easiest, but it's your choice. The Arkshire offered a scratchy chuckle. Send the data over, Maya. I take it these assets have relocated to attack you. You wouldn't give information for free if it wasn't in your interest. It doesn't matter, but I do have a request in return. If you want to ally with us, you need only ask. The human leader paused. He turned around to face the cabin and waved for me to join him. I shook my head in the negative, not wanting the predator to see my presence. The entire dialogue was going to crumble the second my face appeared on screen. 
Maya crossed his arms, tapping his foot with impatience. The stubborn human was going to wait until I joined him, one way or another. Blood roared in my ears as my shaking claws unclipped the harness. My legs felt like they were made of jelly. I slunk up beside the primate with my tail between my legs. The secretary general's eyes glowed with defiance. He scooped me up by the chest and propped my paws around his neck. The reptile's maw hung agape for several seconds. The dilation of its eyes made my grip tighten. I imagined it was contemplating how I'd look on a carving station. Why is that feeble animal not cowering? Is if asked at last. You have your food loose in your ship. My ears pinned against my head. The oh, fuck you, Thaley wretch. I hope you rot in a furnace. The Aksha leaned back and placed a spindly arm beneath its snout. I was surprised it didn't return the insult or lobby vulgar threats at my race. The way it flashed its teeth reminded me of the Terran's amused expression. Then again, perhaps it was the display of appetite that we used to interpret that as. Maya sighed. Tava, meet Isif. Isif, me Tava. Excellent, now everyone is acquainted. Its name is irrelevant. It is lesser. Explain yourself quickly, human, the chief hunter snarled. Sure, that's easy. If you want positive relations with the UN, cease all hostilities with the Venal Republic. The human bared his teeth in a confident smile. Also, release every Venal in your custody. We will compensate you double the cattle's weight in fresh meat, so food is not an issue. I... you have some nerve. Why would we relinquish our right to such a delicacy? Why would this be the entire basis of your terms? The Venlo are our partners. You recognize the value of sowing division within the Federation and having sources with access to their information. You also know what a powerful ally we could be. Sparing one species isn't that important in the grand scheme of things. Isif cast a ferocious glare at me, but I managed to meet its gaze. The Arkshire could not harm me through the screen. This could be my only chance to confront the monster and I wanted it to know that Venlo were not just inferior creatures. My courage seemed to cement its decision. A growl rumbled in the soulless predator's throat. We heard you took Aksha captives during our unfortunate clash in Gojit space. Add them to your end, and we have an agreement, unless you killed them. In that case, there won't be any deals today. I accept those terms. For the record, we don't kill surrendering prisoners. It's not strategical, Maya replied. We are glad to hear that. How do you wish to complete this transaction? Bring the captives alive to the abandoned Venlo colony I just sent you. We'll give you the code to a storage satellite. Once you've left the prisoners unharmed, the exchange will be arranged a month from now. That is acceptable. I blinked in amazement, unable to believe my ears. Had the Aksha hunter agreed to release all of our livestock that easily? My instincts suggested that it had to be deception. For all of Meyer's poised words, I couldn't fathom the benefit to the enemy. The logistics of reintegrating millions of traumatized Venla and trying to explain that our greatest allies were warlike predators daunted me too. That was on top of the projected millions of Terran refugees we needed to find a place for. Perhaps the Greys agreed to release the cattle because they realized the burden it would place on our infrastructure. 
gay human's judgment will be sound. You can discuss this with their generals later, if they have the time. Kai, the secretary general, scowled at the camera. You try anything on the Venlo, we blow the satellite up. Also, we have a rough estimate of how many cattle you have, so don't try to cheat us. Is if snorted. Cheat you? I am extending my claw in friendship. But your request will take considerable effort, and it's inevitable that some mewling Venlo will slip through the cracks. I understand, Maya muttered. Thanks for your time, Chief Hunter. I hope our information serves you well. Yes, the misplaced assets have been passed along. Why do you not just ask for our help stopping their attack? Because I have no guarantee you wouldn't just destroy your competitor. Ha, huh, destroy you. If we wanted that, you would already be dead. Something about the Arxer's tone sent a chill down my spine. That didn't sound like an empty threat. The reptile was certain that it could fulfill that goal if it desired. A predator's bluster wasn't usually so nonchalant and dismissive. Maya raised his eyebrows. I beg your pardon. We squeezed Girth's location out of some cattle. The scholarly types learned a lot about your species. Your violence, Isif chuckled. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying this to threaten you. But that should prove we won't attack. I... I see. The human's complexion reverted to its ashen state, and concern flashed in his pupils. Why are you so interested in befriending us? You are the most exciting thing to happen to this galaxy in a long time. We searched for other true sapients for centuries. It's a shame the prey found you before us. The Secretary General stared at the screen, unable to formulate a response. The excitement at finding fellow predators clearly wasn't mutual. The last thing the humans needed was another genocidal enemy scoping out Earth. That made it much tougher for this partnership to be a temporary stopgap. Don't look so glum. I'm told the Federation tried to kill humanity. In its nest, we are the same. That clingy rodent is more likely to harm you than us. Easy if declared. My eyes narrowed. I have never lifted a claw against humans, Predator. You don't know me. The Arksha curled its lip. Oh, but I do, Widener. You Federation hypocrites are all the same. Have a safe ride home, humans. I'll see you around. The video call ended, and Meyer helped me climb down from his back. The Secretary General looked shaken to his core. That final revelation wormed into his skull and escalated his concerns for his home. I hoped I hadn't aggravated the situation, but the way the reptilian spoke to me was maddening. That conversation hadn't inspired any optimism for Earth's future, at least, not in my book. It was dubious whether the Grey would fulfill its stated bargain as well. Whatever the humans desired from that engagement, I hoped they got it. The Nature of Predator's 47 Memory Transcription Subject O.O. Kai Captain Kalzim Krakotl Alliance Command O.8 State We standardized human time October 16th 2136, when deprived of sleep for days, the crew began to get a little jumpy. The Terran ambushes became more sporadic along the journey, but persisted all the same. The Krakotl fleet was left with no choice but to stay on constant alert. 
I focused on keeping the other officers rested while I shouldered the brunt of the shifts. My personnel became run down despite the adjustment. It was severe enough that I ordered Zarn to give essential crew members stimulants. The drugs left me wired enough that my wing wouldn't stop twitching, which was a nuisance. But, with our arrival slated for today, the soldiers couldn't afford to be drowsy. Sharp wits were a necessity to clash with humans, perhaps that was the purpose of the ambushes all along. Yet another disruptor pulse had shaken us up on the outskirts of the soul system. The jarring effects were becoming routine, as we all tried to clear the fog from our minds. My eyes felt like a mazic was sitting on them, but I forced them to stay open. The predators wouldn't break us on my watch, not on the cusp of our destination. My gaze shifted to the viewport. Exo, status report, die. I'm detecting sensor anomalies. The humans may be somewhere nearby, but it's tough to tell. Dion proved a godsend with his analytical mind. His skill set complemented my tactical understanding. We're already in the system's outer orbit. This is their last chance to strike. The sensor readout revealed that we were less than a milliparsec from Earth. We anticipated the bulk of the Terran Armada was waiting within Sol's inner reaches. I had no doubt the humans set up FTL interference throughout their system, so there would be no further hyperspace hops. The rest of the journey could be handled sublight. Our instruments picked up millions of planetesimals, which were mainly composed of ice. The circumstellar disk was a sprawling collection, which Federation scientists had noted as one of two debris planes. Our fleet filtered out all water-dominant objects, so they wouldn't drown out enemy movement. Where are the humans? If this is the border of their territory, you think they'd send someone to greet us? I is there anything to be concerned about with this location? Any weapons hidden in the belt? I squawked. The first officer cleared his throat. The objects are spread too far apart to pose a threat, sir. As visual indicates. I detect no mining activity or research stations. There has to be something unusual, I pressed. Humans don't just pick their spots at random. All I notice is that they just powered down the FDL disruptors. Perhaps their primitive defenses are malfunctioning. We could shave a few hours from our travel time if we can get in one more jump. Suspicion filtered through my tired brain, and I urged myself to consider the circumstances. It seemed unlikely that all of humanity's defenses would collapse at the same time. The only reason they would halt the signal would be to allow their own ships through. But there were no unknown drive signatures on sensors. We should see any predators coming with ease. As if to mark my certainty, a massive chunk of ice blinked into existence amidst Krakot ranks. It plowed into the heart of our formation, dwarfing the ships its steam rolled over. Panicked chatter barked over the radio, and our Federation allies scrambled to expend an orbital bomb on the object. We managed to crack the first planetesimal, but dozens more surfaced on several headings. My talons undid the sensor's filter, and hundreds of warp blips emerged on my screen. The predators predicted that we would filter out anything icy, which rendered their strike invisible to our instruments. I could appreciate the deviousness of their ploy. Human creativity was leaps and bounds beyond the Arxer. I leaned over the comms panel. Oh, Federation vessels. Deploy your FTL disruptors now. The subspace indicators vanished, 
as enough of our allies complied with my order. Still, dozens of hijacked planetoids, twenty times the diameter of our craft, were enough to cause a headache. We needed to take evasive maneuvers if any were on trajectory for our position. Jala puffed out her chest with excitement. And so it begins. I want to be the one to push the button when we burn their cities. There was no time to worry about her derangement. It didn't matter if she was the one dropping the payload, or if I handled it myself. As the one giving the orders, the burden of responsibility fell on me. I knew what a terrible deed we were about to commit. The mental images gnawed at my conscience. At least the creatures from past exterminations had no foreknowledge of their demise. I wondered how many humans' last thoughts would be of their families. Those unsightly hunters had more in common with us than most Krakotl would like to admit. Their desperation to survive and their collectivism resonated with our own. Kit is truly a shame that predators are prone to destruction and violence. There is only room for one of us in the galaxy, I reminded myself. This crew is sacrificing something of ourselves, so that the Federation has a chance to survive. Nonetheless, I respected how the hominids utilized every asset at their disposal. Dozens of Krakatl warships lie crushed or totaled around us. The Terrans never had to rear their ugly heads. One icy object was barreling toward our location, despite the pitiful attempts to obliterate it. The asteroid's magnitude left no doubts that our hull would implode if it connected. The damn inbred strapped a warp drive to a space rock. Who the fuck does that? Or even living seem to do that. I am spat. I hummed in thought, someone who sees anything as a potential weapon, a predator much more dangerous than the Arksha. The fossil gritted his teeth. Glad you've seen the light, Captain. I've always seen the light. Now quit with your snide remarks and find us a way out of this mess. Theon jerked his floppy ears in disdain before issuing new orders to navigations. The asteroid was propelled forward by its existing momentum. It was near enough that I could glimpse the imperfections on its surface. Distant sunlight glinted off the watery composite and washed it in a serene, ultraviolet hue. That color would look a lot less beautiful smashed up against our plating. Our vessel executed a sharp turn and rerouted power to acceleration. The state-of-the-art warship didn't seem to cover the space fast enough. It felt like a predator was nipping at our talons. My stomach somersaulted as the projectile scraped by nearly atop us. We cleared the collision course with mere seconds to spare. The humans might have hoped to incite panic so that they could cow us through our instincts. We had to remember that the stakes were our entire civilization, our right to roam the galaxy in freedom and dignity. Quelling my nerves, I contemplated which weaponry could take the icy mass out. Careful placement of explosives should still conserve firepower for the main event. Movement flashed in the viewport's corner, a streaking blur of metal. My weary brain took a full second to process the new data. An allied vessel was gunning straight toward us. A head-on collision wasn't something either of us would survive. But the fools were preoccupied dodging their own asteroid and seemed oblivious to our presence. Move the blasted ship! I screeched. Can you not see we're going to crash? The navigations officer curled his neck with trepidation as he frantically brought our nose upward. There was a brief scraping sound from the friendly brushing our underbelly. The artificial gravity failed to compensate for another abrupt change. A forceful tug sucked us toward the rear of the bridge, and I lost my balance on my perch. My wings fluttered frantically. 
There wasn't enough time to gain proper lift, but I wanted to slow my fall. The air beneath my cyan feathers allowed me to drift, and I glided down the slanted gravity well. Other crocodile also used shared instincts to cushion their fall. Theon wasn't as fortunate, flight didn't exactly grace his tubby form. The farcel's stout paws offered little traction, and his curved hind legs made his bipedal stance precarious in the best circumstances. His jowls quivered with fear as he tumbled backward. There was a sickening crack from his head slamming against the support wall. Theon! XO, you will answer when I speak to you. Give me some sign that you're alright, I hollered. The first officer didn't respond. He was crumpled in a limp heap with a concerning amount of blood pooling around him. What if the poor guy was dead? Regardless of his attitude, the last thing I wanted was to send him home in a body bag. Gala clicked her beak together in delight, and I shot her a warning look. She was elated that my second was knocked out of commission, since it cleared the return of her old post. It was bothersome that a person could derive pleasure from another's misfortune but I suppose it was no different than Zarn relishing human suffering. Soldiers like them could perform their duties without remorse, at least. Focus on the battling, I chided myself. You cannot get distracted and let the humans surprise you again. Honor Theon's wishes. Kai? The gravity adjustment kicked in at last and my crew members scrambled back to their posts. The navigations officer rushed to level our heading. We were fortunate to escape with our frame intact, and only a few dozen allies taken out. The most imaginative strategist wouldn't have accounted for asteroids warping out of nowhere. I glided over to the downed first officer, containing any untoward displays of grief. His russet fur was matted with blood, and he was unresponsive to poking. My talons locked around his hind ankle, digging into the pulse point. Relief coursed through my veins as I felt a faint heartbeat. Dr. San. I sent a transmission to the medical bay, praying that the spiteful Takan had any healing aptitude. My security team is transporting the first officer to your lab. Serious head trauma internal bleeding. Understood. I'll attend to the necessary preparations, Captain, Sarn replied. The security personnel carted the unconscious Farsal away, and I suppressed my concern. With neural trauma, the officer might be looking at permanent damage, even if he was stabilized. There was no telling what time frame to expect for Yon's recovery but I doubted he'd be back within the mission's span. It hadn't been within my forecast to lose anyone this early in the mission. My attention reluctantly returned to the battlefield, where the Federation fleet was trying to regroup dormant Terran ships crept out from behind planetoids and descended on any stragglers who strayed too far from the group. The chaos of the asteroids had broken our tight formation. Numbers were our primary advantage, we would be fine as long as we stuck together. Ke cannot stop all of us, or even a majority. Yala ordered a sizable contingent of our fleet to charge at the Terran raiders to deter them from pressing their luck. I blinked in irritation as she claimed that the command was authorized by me. Lying was not a quality I appreciated, especially when it was done to get her way quickly. Then again, Perhaps it was better to let her make the time-sensitive decisions. Burn any humans that try to run. We have to kill every one of them. Jala shrieked. The atmosphere was solemn, as her phraseology was a bit too honest. She projected a certain vindictiveness that needed to be tempered down. This mission couldn't be about inflicting suffering or killing for killing's sake. That was not why I wanted my crew to think we were doing this. I tucked my wings behind my back. 
them let a single predator go, if you can stop it. The more humans that escape, the greater the chance they retain a viable population. Why is that such a bad thing, sir? An engineering assistant asked. There's two futures, son, the one where we survive, and the one where they do. When cancer metastasizes, it infects and consumes all healthy tissue nearby, I answered. Is that what you want for the galaxy? Consider this an early detection, before it spreads to our heart. A group of Terran fighters were blazing away, after punching at our weakest links. To my relief, my crew locked onto a pair of targets and chased them with plasma. Krakotl warships converged on the cluster like locusts. They sent those fearless hunters running off like Venlo. The humans were surprisingly slippery, finding an escape route with minimal casualties. Their ships evaded with vaulting maneuvers, and a plethora of defensive countermeasures were built into their hardware. For all my knowledge of predators, I hadn't expected these ones to be so adept at fleeing. This was a positive sign, if they had so little courage. My eyes landed on the faint blue dot on the horizon, which the predatory opportunists were retreating toward. Humanity was poised to make their last stand. The poor saps would perish without any reason to be missed. We were close enough to Earth to detect thousands of ship contacts, fanned out as a protective ward. A smarter species would have used those vessels to flee if they knew of our arrival. Cut territorial nature does have its downsides. They'd rather fight and die, just like we predicted. <sighs> the first wave of Terran defenses were beaten, and I suspected that was the toughest stage of transit. That asteroid trick would only work once. We had a clean shot to the Predator's home. Now, that small fleet was all that stood between us and orbital supremacy. We were so close to eliminating the menace that was humanity. The nature of Predator's 48 memory transcription subject, Pais Captain Kalzim Krakotl Alliance, Command State View Standardized Human Time, October 17, 2136, Renewed Energy, surged through my veins as the fleet coasted within striking distance of the human armada. This was the most important skirmish of our lives. The Terran forces were a ragtag bunch, consisting of a primary cluster of recycled Venlo vessels, a few of their own slow behemoths, and a handful that looked too small to host a proper crew. Our homogenous warships had the advantage of both conformity and technology. Scans of Earth offered some interesting insights as we registered several million life signatures in underground structures. I conferred on this data with the fleet, and we agreed to nail those havens first. Human bunkers were not designed to withstand direct antimatter blasts. Once their key headouts were demolished, Major population centers were the second priority. All right, advance. Ready your plasma guns on the Terran formation. I chirped into the comms. Follow. This five seconds later, with a generous donation of missiles. Everyone will fire on my mark. The radio crackled to life with a reply. How certain are we that we can defeat these predators? It's a simple math equation. We all act together, and we have more guns than they have ships. The Terrans held their position as we coordinated our target locks. Yala aimed our railgun at a gargantuan warship, which already registered five others pinpointing it. Overkill wasn't the worst idea, to ensure that the largest enemies didn't survive. My sensors warned that our fleet was being target-locked in return, and a spurt of munitions were seconds from impact. I 
scree. The lights show around me was a marvelous sight, with energy beams zipping between us and the humans. I watched as our target was sundered by various incisions, capping off the largest threat before it began. Other predator craft fell to the sheer onslaught. Their numbers couldn't hold a candle to ours. We sustained some damage to our front lines, though many vessels that were hit by the enemy were able to press on. The ships we selected to lead the way were fossil armor heavy vessels by design. They didn't pack as much in terms of weaponry, but they could absorb more force than the standard craft. In other words, those craft shielded the rest of us. The surviving human vessels were either nursing grave wounds, or had pulled off lucky evasive maneuvers. I estimated we'd taken out 40% of our opponents with the first strike, the other fronts must be enjoying similar success. The Krakotla fleet wasn't showing any mercy and showered missiles at the Predators. The hominids left a trail of interceptors behind them, desperately trying to muster some fight. This is almost unfair, ganging up on such a primitive species. No wonder they wouldn't engage directly. Maybe it was as much pragmatism as cowardice. Why the enemy pilots seemed to realize they were falling back toward Earth's atmosphere. They had no choice but to turn and fight, or surrender orbital supremacy. Our allies were encouraged by their concession, we charged forward with righteous determination. I could feel my own crew's qualms about battling predators dissipating. I tossed my beak for emphasis. Don't let your guard down. Predators will try anything if they're desperate enough. Sir. The smaller craft are shooting kinetics and plasma at us, while charging at max speed. Thing is, I'm not detecting any life signs, Jala chittered. Half the humans found a way to hide from our sensors. They might be concealing some bunkers. Confusion rippled through my plumage. I doubt even humans made advances against technology they barely understand. The pilots could have just ejected, and left the vacant ship on a collision course. You didn't listen to what I said. The craft are still firing on us, and making course corrections. There has to be a pilot. She protested. My talons tightened around my perch. Those Terran ships didn't seem to be steering on a preset course. Before my eyes, one of them whirled out of the way of a plasma beam. It performed a total thrust reversal on a dime. I didn't know how anyone could calculate that fast, or how the lapse in gravity wouldn't cause a pilot to pass out. Hell, the G-force should crush an organic skull. While predators in movies were nigh unkillable, that was not reality. Those maneuvers were impossible. The only conclusion was that those spacecraft were flying themselves, and killing based off some sort of algorithm. How could a computer ever learn strategy? And even if it could, who would risk implementing that function into its programming? I leaned over the comms. The smaller craft are fighting without human input. I believe they're ordered to crash into us at max velocity, dock us on them. Hundreds of railguns pivoted toward the threat, and a slew of missiles greeted the pilotless craft as well. If our readings were correct, these robots seemed reliant on nuclear power. The plasma jets they unleashed at close range were tied to those systems. The humans had skipped right to inflicting the most damage possible. A single hit burned through even the Farsal ship's hardened exterior. It's actually quite clever to not have to worry about losing pilots. They don't have to fuss over containing reactions from weapons, or expending power on life support. E. The Terran automatons were decimated when we managed to connect, but they reacted quickly to our threats. 
We had to focus multiple warships on a single one to make sure it couldn't calculate us to death. Several reached their targets and rammed nose first into the armored front line. Our hardiest ships took significant losses. The humans were determined to take them out of the equation. We advanced deeper into their territory, knowing human fervor would render them reckless. Their crater-pocked moon passed alongside us, a landmark of our goal. Defense satellites minced us with lasers and gunfire, but they were idle targets to be taken out. The predators were retreating in gradual increments, and their scattered formation was on the brink of collapse. These stalling attempts, inventive or not, were futile. In a few thousand kilometers, we could commence the orbital bombardment. Sir, the humans are broadcasting a message fleet-wide. Should I discard it? The comms officer asked. I sighed. Let their last words be heard. It's the right thing to do. Federation fleet, we advise you to turn back now. We took the liberty of informing the Arkshur of your departure. The audio transmission had no video, but the booming voice was jarring, even without a visual. If you return now, you might arrive in time to save your planet. You'll need the artillery you're going to expend on Earth. We will accept your surrender, and allow you to return, unimpeded. A stunned silence swept across the bridge. Every crew member was undoubtedly recalling their home, and the people we left behind. Nishtar was our birth planet, a marshy paradise with floating cities and breathtaking algae blooms. It didn't surprise me that the humans would guarantee it fell alongside Earth. That was predatory spite. But the thought of returning to Nashtal, to see every stilt tower and ceremonial nest obliterated, cracked a small piece of me. That wasn't even considering how the Arkshire would ravage our population. What egoistic predator didn't take eye prizes of its hunts, after all? Friendly radio chatter cropped up again. The Arkshire are coming for us. I'm sorry for listening to one of those fiends, but we have to save our homes. She's right, another captain agreed. Shouldn't we at least send a part of the fleet back? We never should have left Nishtal unguarded. Take heart, my friends. The humans are bluffing, we have them scared shitless. I didn't believe the primates were fibbing, but this mission had to be finished. Whatever the cost. Do you think it's possible to talk to the Arxer? The predators want to manipulate our empathy, and use it against us. The last part was true, though I found it improbable they'd stake that wager on a falsehood. The Terrans hoped they could wield our compassion for our brethren against us. They probably understood how we felt, seeing our homes vulnerable and under siege. This was a cost I could barely find the strength or the logic to commit to. Odds were, a few hours wouldn't make a difference on this scale. Our fleet would be disorganized and short of ammo, whether we accomplished the objective or not. The question was whether any other species could survive through our sacrifice. But what if they are telling the truth? Came the retort across Federation channels. I lowered my eyes. Then we'll be out of here in a few hours. If the Terrans survive, they will just join forces with the Arxer. Humans are untenably violent, and they'll want revenge. There is no choice but to eradicate Earth. The fleet rallied behind my words, finding their conviction restored. There was nothing to stop the humans from following our subspace trail and unleashing their retribution on our cities. It was far too late now to walk back any attack. Predators didn't forgive or relinquish grudges. The first bomber group barreled toward the line of Terran ships, who were behaving strangely. 
I watched as they backed away and left massive gaps in their formation. Why were they giving our vessels a path to break through? Either they were extraordinarily cocky in anticipating our surrender, or this was a trap. Thousands of missiles slammed into our spacecraft seconds later, hailing from the direction of their moon. The explosives demolished any ships they touched. I was stunned to see radiation amidst the readings. These items could only take out one ship without shockwaves, but the missile contacts numbered half of our vessels. The fact that the Predators stopped that many nukes on Luna? Why do the humans have such an oversized supply of city killers? What reason could they have to point them at their own world from above? Gekloi, all missile countermeasures. I shrieked into the comms. Destroy every structure on their moon. I'm sure that has to be the last of it, but just as the Federation fleet began compensating for the nuclear deluge, the humans deployed another staggering missile wave. This salvo was also in the thousands, begging the question of just how large their atomic cache was. No wonder our scientists thought the apes irradiated their world. It wasn't for lack of trying. Gala spotted a military complex near us and dropped an antimatter bomb onto the lunar coordinates. As much as I hated to waste extermination supplies, I didn't question the necessity of stopping the nuclear assault. Every bomber who forged ahead was getting buried in radioactive warheads. There were only so many explosives we could shrug off at once. The Terran defenders camped by the orbital threshold hurling plasma at anything that moved. Thousands of our ships had succumbed to the mind-boggling missile count. We were still trying to swat the remnants away. With our numbers whittled down, the humans smelled blood. Our attack force suddenly seemed a bit more manageable. I flapped my wings in irritation. We have to find a way through the wall, and quickly. Any suggestions, Jala? Well, sir, there is a small gap by the northern polar cap. The predators are overextended, my sociopathic second reply. I blinked. Good thinking. That is where we can break through and pick our mark. My mind wandered as I relayed assignments. The first item was delegating our quickest ships to rush through the enemy opening. Our entire lead bombing unit was atomized, so the swift cruisers were the obvious replacements. I figured the humans would try to stop any advance. The second our people started moving, we needed to block the predators from sealing the gap. Earth looked depressingly beautiful as I studied the viewport. White clouds formed a veil over tan landmasses, which were divided by rich oceans. I was relieved that this skirmish was almost over. Savages or not, it was impossible not to feel sorry for the humans. There was exquisiteness and wonder in what they had built. And I knew there were plenty of us left to get the job done. It's been an honor serving with each of you. Let's finish this so we can all go home, I croaked over comms. Federation cruisers bolted toward a vacant space in the Terran formation, and pushed their engines past recommended limits. Our warship joined the masses surging forward. The walls rattled as we careened into position. The non-essential ships formed a metal shield between the cruisers and the humans, gunning to intercept them. An angular Terran behemoth sauntered toward us, not even slowing down as we hovered in its path. My nav officer took evasive maneuvers and ducked their uncontrolled plasma and missiles. The humans weren't taking the time to aim. I could almost hear the predators begging us to stop, and guilt tugged at my heart. The massive ship launched dozens of smaller craft from its hangar bay, but they were spliced up by our kinetics on arrival. Those scrawny fighters were easy pickings for us. 
the spacecraft area found itself target locked by a murderous jailer. The female Krakal showed no emotion as she directed a missile through a hangar, circumventing its armor. She leapt up with enthusiasm as the predator ship erupted into pieces. It's funny, isn't it? We're blocking them from getting to the real target, and these humans are forced to watch. An appropriate somberness overtook the bridge as the rest of us processed her words. There was nothing amusing about what we were slated to witness. It was difficult to remember that it was just business. Fifteen Federation cruisers slipped past the humans with the timely help of the Allied fleet. They crossed the final kilometers to orbital range and scoped out the exposed planet below. I watched as the predators flung everything they had at the attackers, knowing full well they were out of reach. Time seemed to freeze around us. This was a moment that would reside in my nightmares. The payload struck home after a painstaking eternity. Bright flashes dotted Earth's continents, and the antimatter purification wiped away our first human targets. The Nature of Predator's 49 Memory, Transcription Subject, Norway, Slanik, Venlos Space Corsh, A8D Standardized Human Time, October 17, 2136. The Terran Drone Monitoring Station was set aboard a massive boat for some reason. I guessed it was because a moving target would be difficult for the Krakal to nail from orbital range. More than likely, they would need to dive through the atmosphere to take us out. My friends had terrestrial aircraft and defenses waiting for that moment. The humans judged that I was better equipped for an oversight role, scanning communication channels for anything helpful. Despite his protests, Marcel was still sidelined due to injuries as well. It was a safe assumption that his assignment was more economy. There were dozens of other predators in the control room, each itching to be in the stars. Instead, we all watched the battle unfold from behind a computer monitor. As the first Federation bombers broke through, everyone realized how quickly our defense was falling apart. Why couldn't they have fled Earth? like I told them to. Our satellites registered 42 impacts, some on major population centers. General Jones addressed the station's crew in a solemn tone. I've assigned each of you a local newsfeed to listen in on. We need to keep track of which cities have been lost. I watched as the American officer placed a handful of red pins on a map. Her drone program hadn't quite worked out every aspect of space warfare, but its hasty deployment was the only thing keeping us in the game now. Teaching the automated programs to differentiate between hundreds of alien ship classes, space debris, and subspace disruptions was no small feat, I was told. My red-haired friend opened a news stream on a side monitor and traced a clawless hand across his facial scars. The image I saw out of my periphery made me want to grab my blinders, but I forced myself to look. It was an aerial view of rubble in all directions, a sprawling metropolis turned into a wasteland by antimatter. E. of Mexico City and New York City rocked North America. The Raven Rock Bunker Complex has also been demolished killing essential U.S. personnel. However, no region has gone unscathed. Pazia has sustained an unequal share of the detonations. Initial reports confirm mass devastation in Karachi, Tokyo, Dhaka, Shanghai, and Mumbai, several highly populous cities. The seat of the Chinese government, Beijing, is yet untouched though it is expected to be a future target. High on the European front, Switzerland's extensive bunker network has made it the target of multiple bombing deposits. Their entire population, as well as a million refugees from EU neighbors, 
are packed in various shelters. Meanwhile, the Turkish government denies reports of a hit to Istanbul, despite satellite imagery suggesting its fall. In the southern hemisphere, contact has been lost with Sao Paulo, Lima, and Buenos Aires. Africa is reporting impacts to Kinshasa, Lagos, and Cairo, while Oceania mourns the fall of Sydney. Conservative casualty estimates are in the tens of millions, planet-wide. How can the Federation do this, Lenik? Why do we deserve to die? Marcel's eyes watered, and his voice was a scratchy whisper. We're just people, like you. All we wanted was peace. I pinned my ears against my head. I'm truly sorry. I wish we could do more to help. These are civilian hubs. There was no reason for any of this to happen. Not even their own worlds under fire could make them stop. Millions are dead because of our eyes, because we're so fucking different to you. Despite the anger in his words, I could see that my friend was on the brink of a breakdown. The UN fleet was being pummeled on all fronts, and every screen depicted ship explosions. My heart clenched as I realized Tyler might already be dead. The tall flesh eater was signed onto a spacecraft carrier crew. Human artillery was depleted too. Despite their unsanctimonious love of nuclear weapons. Me resilient predator can't give up now, can he? It's like Marcel is admitting defeat. I know, Mark, I said gently. Listen, no matter how much this hurts, we have to keep fighting until the last settlement falls. If we're gonna die today, we better take a lot of them with us. Pure hatred glimmered in his hazel eyes. Oh, you didn't have to tell me that. If humanity glues itself back together, I hope we kill every last one of them. You don't mean that, my friend. No, us Venlo are with you to the end. For whatever that's worth. The Venlo only had a few hundred ships left in reserve, after donating the bulk of our fleet to humanity. Nonetheless, Governor Tava ordered the majority of our remnants to Earth's defense. They were intermingled with human units now, playing supporting roles. There were less than 50 warships remaining behind at Venlo Prime. Both sides knew the Republic government sent more than we could spare. My gaze focused on one Venlo grouping, whose human front line had succumbed to a brazen Krakotl charge. The Predators committed themselves a bit too heavily to stopping the first bombers, and still failed in that regard. The Republic ships banded together on instinct, which made them a larger target on sensors. I was stunned by how little the enemy hesitated to dispatch them. This Federation onslaught seemed just as predatory as the humans, if not more. It was like they didn't consider Venlo people anymore. We couldn't just freeze and rely on herd mentality, as our comrades were being murdered. Venlo support, you need to stay mobile, Marcel growled into his headset clearly noticing the same issue. Do not let yourself become a sitting target. Call for you men back up. Your allies will find a way to help you, if we can. A few Terran ships overheard the chatter and ducked their engagements to help the Venlo grouping. The Republic's plasma aim was noticeably worse than the Federation's. The prey crews must be panicking. Even with my extra training, I would be terrified in their position. They were parked in the path of certain death. The Krakatoa ships clashed with the battered U-1 reinforcements, while the Venlil threw in supporting missiles. The humans were flying like crazed maniacs, at least on the manned ships. I think the Predators found the energy to protect us, because they realized our opponents would break through otherwise. They might be weakest species, 
in the galaxy. But at least it's extra ships to stand in the way. I should be with the other Venlo, fighting. The humans were churning out explosives and gunfire, and the Venlo kept aiding from a safe distance. The Federation must have realized that those campers were prey crude vessels, not predators. Several enemies rerouted their trajectories to cruise through our timid offerings instead of searching for an opening. The Terrans swerved to meet the hostiles and concentrated plasma fire on the largest warships. Heavy Federation classes had the most explosives, so they were the priority. Earth's innocuous shape loomed behind the Venal defenders. With armed vehicles barreling toward them, the urge to flee must be overwhelming. I donned my own headset, contemplating what Sarah had taught me. Venlo ships, you are much stronger than you think you are. The Federation is wrong about us. We are not just the galaxy's laughingstock. Push past your limits. Hold the line. Several Venlo were retreating before the Krakatl overtook them, but scrambled back into position. None of us wanted humanity's home to suffer further harm. Most had come to love the arboreal predators, and love was as good a motivation as hatred. My people clawed back more than the Krakatl expected, though the aggressors cut the Venlo ships down in droves. A few Federation craft slipped through on that front as friendly forces succumbed to the larger assault. My heart sank when I saw nobody was chasing the leader bomber. The other Terran groups were too far away and otherwise occupied. About twenty missiles were fast-tracked to Earth, which I knew meant millions more casualties. That was a statistic too staggering to comprehend. If the Venal didn't make a last stand, it would have been a hundred detonations. It's about mitigating the damage at this point and praying for a miracle. Krakotl were clever, enough to allocate a few warships to guard their rear flank. The UN's Gojid Liberation Fleet had attempted to hit them from behind, but found an armed unit waiting at the ready. Had the circumstances been less dire, I think the humans may have noted how the birds were a worthy foe. The Terran ship count was ticking down to 1,000 on our readout. The early stages of the battle were catastrophic. The Federation still had several thousand vessels at their disposal and pressed ahead with unchecked aggression. Our predators were running out of ships and tricks. They could only be so many places in the vastness of space at once. The enemy bombers trickled through in small groupings and that meant the death toll continued to rise. I couldn't imagine how Marcel felt. The red-haired human was holding his head in his hands. He slapped my tail away when I wrapped it around his wrist. Terran civilization, everything he ever knew was slipping away in the span of an hour. I jostled his arm again. Hey Marcel, please help me. There's 500 new contacts from the direction of your colony Mars. I don't know who to notify. I was aware that I was supposed to alert General Jones, but I thought feeling useful might do my friend some good. The vegetarian needed to snap out of his misery and turn his thoughts away from Nulia and Lucy. He must be feeling guilt for sending them to a bunker. Honorable predators should go down fighting, not wallowing in self-pity. Did you hear me? I demanded. There's more ships inbound, of a standard Federation make. A second wave of Federation monsters. Wasn't the first one enough? He spat. I couldn't blame him for that reaction. The Terrans had no spare manpower to allocate to a fresh armada. But there had to be some attempt to stop the newcomers even if it was woefully insufficient. Seeing that my human wasn't going to be helpful, I flagged down General Jones. She studied the data for a full minute, 
poring over the details. The American officer frowned. It's difficult to lock on the signal, but it appears they're trying to hail us. Shall I put it on the main screen? An attendant asked. Yes, patch us through the interference. If the feds are offering us a surrender, I think we have no choice but to accept it, unconditionally. The occupants of the monitoring station turned our attention to the central video feed. General Jones positioned herself in front of a camera, a bitter look in her eyes. It was unclear why the Federation would reverse their stance on total extinction. Wasn't their only demand every human dead? A quadrupedal animal appeared on screen, and Jones's expression morphed to surprise. Those rounded ears and soft brown fur were Zerulean features. The captain shied away from the camera, clearly having never seen a human before. Gods, don't eat us. Please. Uh, I mean, the Zerulean stammered. Don't shoot us? Jones's lips curved down. What are you doing here? This is an active white zone. Friendly. F friendly, we'll leave. The quadruped was struggling to string coherent thoughts together. I jumped out my seat and wagged my tail at Jones in a go-away gesture. The human general didn't take the hint, so I gave her leg an insistent shove. Understanding flashed in her eyes, and she ducked out of view of the camera. I flicked my ears reassuringly. Zerulian officer, please inform us of your intent. Nobody is going to hurt you. Shaw-san wanted, begged the Prime Minister to help humans. Unrelenting. He said they were nice, but tea they just look hungry to me. So hungry. Hope flickered back into Joan's pupils. Wait a second. You're here to help us. Why is it growling at me? Venlil, you've got to get out of there. I exhaled in frustration and glanced at Marcel for support. My human's eyes were a million light years away, red around the rims. His lips never moved, not even a forced snarl. That brokenness gave me the resolution I needed. That is just how humans talk, because they have deeper vocal ranges. There's nothing to be afraid of, I said. We need urgent assistance at several locations. Help would be very much appreciated. The Zerulean tilted his head. I know what my orders are, but won't these predators attack anything in sight? They're in aggression mode. And this is a quarter our entire fleet. We are no military species. Zerulean way. We've already lost millions of lives. Innocent lives. A rare hint of emotion crept in Joan's voice, though she quickly steadied herself. I promise we want nothing more than to protect Earth. I will relay word that you're friendlies. Please, if you believe in peace, help us. The Quadrup's gaze darted to the viewport, where his formation was closing in on the Federation attackers. His expression was conflicted. I was worried that he might go against his orders. This captain acted predator-verse, and even showed disgust at the sight of a human. The call was terminated without any clarification. Terran ship numbers continued to dwindle while the Zerulians sat and watched. General Jones sighed and highlighted the new vessels as alien friendlies. That was a necessary gamble. The Federation had yet to notice the newcomer's approach. I prayed that they would intercede on Earth's behalf. The Nature of Predator's 50 Memory Transcription Subject A.H. Captain calls Seam Percotola Alliance Comange Date We Standardize Human Time October 17, 
2,136 seeds. The predator's formation was disintegrating, and it looked likely we would, would secure victory within the hour. I considered broadcasting an apology to the surface once Earth's space fleet was exhausted. The unfortunate civilians knew they were witnessing the last day of their civilization. Did the humans not deserve the solace of an explanation? There was a part of me that wondered if we could have found another way. The issue was their growth and reproduction, which would be exponential if left unchecked. Maybe we could have isolated any humans who surrendered on an abandoned world, sterilizing them to prohibit breeding. That way, the existing primates could live out the rest of their lifespan without the option to prowl the stars. What if there was another path to achieve extinction without the deaths of billions? Hyosim, such thinking is counterproductive. I done any update on Tian? I asked, hoping for a brief distraction. The doctor took several seconds to respond. The first officer is in a medically induced coma but I've managed to freeze the brain swelling. He'll live, though I can't predict the long-term effects, sir. Some tension was lifted from my wings, with the assurance that the far soul would survive. This entire crew needed a piece of good news. We were set to join the next bombing rush. All remaining Federation ships were partaking in this charge. This was the chance to strike down every lost craft the humans had limping above world. By the way, I've quite enjoyed the show from my little window. I much preferred it when we thought all of these nasty creatures were dead, Zahn added. Whatever your predator delusions, you should be proud of yourself, Captain. I tossed my beak in disdain not dignifying that statement with a response. Relations between myself and the Taken practitioner would be much better if he kept his opinions quiet. My talons swiped through the screens, ensuring that our payloads were in working order. All systems were operational on board. There was just a small dip in our shield capacity. Our vessel fell into the rear of the advance, and navigations increased our acceleration. We would have control over the final targets, which might require flexibility. My expertise would come in handy, assigning relative importance to locations. Why did it feel so wrong to speak about Terran settlements in those terms? Thoughts of Neshtal's impending invasion weighed on my mind too. There might not be any home to go back to. Krakatoa civilization would be the last casualty to Terran brutality, but that didn't ease the horror of it. We might be forgotten by the Federation within decades, just another species that fell to the Arxur. I hoped historians would appreciate our sacrifice. Alarms flashed on sensors, snapping me out of my torturous musings. Several allied vessels had been picked apart by precision strikes, right beside us. The rear flank was blindsided by hundreds of blips, who were darting in between our flotilla. The newcomers were trying to shove their way to the Terran fortifications. Ready weapons, and fire at anything we don't recognize. I screeched. Where did these bastards come from? They're a little late if they're humans. My comms technician shuffled nervously. I just finished decoding communications between a Terran command post and these vessels. The Zerulians sent military assistance. You've got to be joking. The Zerulians have a fledgling, erroneous association with the humans. What have the Predators ever done for them? Jala snickered. Never mind that, Captain. I'm pretty sure the Galactic Institute of Medicine and their 20 ships aren't going to tip the scales either way. That's not the point, Combs. I need to know these developments ahead of time. He's right. Stars forbid the Yochul show up. 
with a trebuchet next. The sociopath feigned a swoon motion. Then we're really screwed. I huffed in irritation, watching as our ship turned to face a Zerulean hostile. The quadrupeds gave us a wide berth and dodged Jala's errant plasma beam. Several Federation captains were calling out conflicting orders on the comms, which led to disarray. Exhaustion was making it difficult to recall foreign military techniques, so I couldn't find solid advice to offer. The Terran fleet were advancing on our front lines, capitalizing on the breakdown of command. Cursing the Zerulean fools, I barked orders to pull back and regroup within the lunar orbit. This was a waste of precious time that could be vital to the defense of our home. We weren't going to leave an extermination half done. We'll get our bearings and charge at Earth again. Perhaps we can still accomplish this quickly, the Federation reassembled, adjusting for the fresh reinforcements. The numerical advantage was still slanted to our side, and Prey wouldn't fight half as well as a human. However, it might be difficult for the crew to fire on Zeruleans. We had accepted that the Venlo were reduced to predatory thralls, but this race was a new convert. The Zeruleans chose their side, and they chose wrong. I know it seems harsh to strike them down, but they put themselves here. I surveyed the expressions of my crew, noting how distraught they looked. If the Arkshur are truly attacking our homes, this might cost us our entire civilization. Everything is on the line, there is no time for bargaining. Jala hissed in frustration as she realized our missiles were depleted. Perhaps she shouldn't have been so liberal with their usage. The plasma railgun had recharged, but I wasn't sure how low our gas supply was running. We couldn't afford to have only kinetics at our disposal. Discretion was required going forward. The Zerulean fleet fell in beside the humans, though they seemed wary of drawing too close. There was no basis for those fears. The risk of Terrans attacking their allies right now was negligible. These predators were too smart to betray useful assets that Earth needed so desperately. They weren't just raving beasts. Sir, more unknown ships incoming. There is... My comms technician trailed off. I blinked. Where from? How many? Speak. T thousands. The subspace trails are from all over the place, my confusion intensified, and I attempted to stave off my sleep-deprived stupor. The humans didn't have many Federation allies, to my knowledge, only six could respond in time. Two of those partners were already here. The neutral powers had no intent of interfering either way since it would simplify their stance if we succeeded, but no singular Federation race had that many ships at their beck and call. This had to be some sort of group or alliance. Maybe these were weaker species that had been coerced. Others might give in to cheap tactics if their homeworlds were held hostage. That, or the humans had found a way to deceive our sensors. These contacts could be decoys meant to sow confusion. How would such a trick even work, though? The comms analyst scratched her crown. Sir, we're picking up a looping transmission from this mystery fleet. It's directed toward Earth. Putting it on screen now. My beak nearly split open as the video feed materialized. Those slit pupils were the unmistakable identifier of the Arkshire. I was uncertain whether their eye shape was solely for ambush hunting, or if they allowed the greys to stalk at dusk. It made human vision seem like love beacons by comparison. This is Chief Hunter Ezif, the reptile clicked. Forgive our tardiness, but we did request that you disable FDL disruptors multiple times, hen there humans. We are here to help. 
a few crewmates were sobbing from the beast's projection. Even an extermination officer like myself was paralyzed by those dagger-like teeth jutting from its truncated maw. The length of its gullet, visible as it spoke, was a ghastly sight. Why were Greys not laughing at the loss of life on Earth? Those demons delighted in death and suffering. They went out of their way to cause it. It didn't seem within their behavioral pattern to save a weaker sapient, even if that species were predators. I don't understand any of this. How are the Terrans responding? I stammered. The comms technician pecked away at her station. L lots of chatter from the human coalition. It doesn't appear their command was expecting the Arxa, though that could be staged for the benefit of their less bow friends. Shit, the Zerulians and the Venlo can't be happy about this, can they? No, sir. The Zerulians are demanding to know why the Archer are here, and the Venlo are asking why they were not informed. The Terran response. The humans claim they didn't invite the Greys, but aren't in a position to reject their help. They suggest that their allies go with it, unless they prefer to fight the Reptilians too. Their response to the Archer offered thanks, and insisted those two prey races are friendly. Of course, that's what the clever monkeys said. They excel in manipulation tactics, and they're using both parties. I lean back on my perch, wondering if this would kill the Zerulians' ties to humanity. This should unmask the truth about the Earthlings' long-term goals. Perhaps we could convince the other races to stand with us, but the time spent pleading with them would allow the Archer to pounce. If the Greys were genuine in their intention, the tide of this battle would turn decisively. The numerical edge was in the Terran's favor, with these new additions. Not to mention the psychological impact the Arxer's presence had, many Federation vessels were panicking at the prospect. We had to break through to orbital range with haste. There's no escape route, and we stand no chance against the Greys. But we can make our deaths mean something to the galaxy. I squawked on the fleet-wide frequency. We must get as many bombs off against Earth as possible. All Federation vessels charge at max velocity. The Krakal and our allies bolted forward, right toward the waiting human alliance. The Zerulians hesitated, not firing on either party. The quadruped's reluctance to abet Arxer allies made them the obvious point of entry. Their railguns were powered up, but few of them acted even as we closed in. The Zerulians came to a decision and dropped into defensive positions. Plasma arced straight toward us. I saw my life flash before my eyes. The beam sailed just off to our side and obliterated the neighboring ally that was keeping pace with us. If their aim was half a degree different, that would have been my vessel in tatters. There was no time to gawk at the wreckage left behind, with the Arxer swooping in on any stragglers. While I wasn't proud of the extermination itself, our sacrifice was valiant and honorable. The Krakow fleet knew that most of us were about to die but the captains had the commitment to finish the job. The Aksha are swallowing our rear flank, sir. Their ships are gaining on us faster than we can move, Jala called out. Should we turn and stall them? I puffed out my feathers. Absolutely not. Keep going. According to sensors, the reptilians' maximum speed was much higher than we ever documented. I realized that they had been concealing their technological limits. Two gray bombers selected us as their quarry and sent drive tracking missiles in our direction. Jala shoved the nav officer out of the way, deploying a stream of interceptors in the nick of time. A Terran robot ship had also spotted us and launched supercharged plasma at our position. 
We barreled through the Zerulian line with urgency. They were no longer of comparative importance. My sociopath rerouted all power from shields to the engine. The core was already overheating from exertion, before this stunt. The female Kirkoddle didn't quite manage to get ahead of the inbound plasma. It plowed into our aft compartment. Alarms began ringing overhead, while crewmates screeched in terror. My readout informed me that steering was a flying. The engine was listed as a critical failure. We're stuck on a one-way ticket toward Earth. The ship is going to crash, assuming it doesn't get blown to bits first. E. All crew to escape shuttles. I shrieked as loud as I could. The personnel didn't need to be told twice, as the flapping of wings drowned everything out. I took a deep breath. It was up to me to finish the job. We were about 30 seconds from orbital distance. And these two bombs could cross a few million humans off the list. Jala began to abandon her perch, which earned a withering glare from me. Get back here. I know you want to save yourself, but the rest of the crew will kill you for being a predator. I jabbed a talon at her, then pointed to the weapon station. You have no future, no place in society, without me. So you're going to stay right here until the job is done. She hesitated, but was persuaded by my argument. The overhead power flickered out as the engine began to melt nearby systems. The emergency lighting colored the floorboards a dim hue, and only essential functions were available. A plethora of enemies were still chasing our runaway ship. With our shield power rerouted away, there was no disincentive to use kinetics. Aksha bullets plowed through our armor, and the Terran automaton chipped in its own lead munitions. Requesting assistance in the med bay, Zarn panted over the comms. I am unable to carry Theon on my own, nor am I able to fly the emergency medical pod. Captain? Anyone? I sighed. I will be there in a minute. Hold on, Doctor. The Terran robot was recharging its weapons, but struggled to keep up with our unsafe speed. Fear burned through my veins. I offered a silent prayer that we would survive long enough to complete the mission. It was a few more seconds until we could deploy the antimatter bombs. The human contraption didn't target us from outside a reliable range. Arksha munitions were inflicting steady damage, but they hadn't caused any catastrophic explosions yet. We hobbled into orbital range and established target locks on two Terran cities. Jala slammed her beak on the firing mechanism. I gave her a nod, and we fled from the bridge with urgency. The journey was a blur as we swooped down the evacuation stairwell. Jala bowled through the door to the med bay, examining a pacing zone. The tuck conductor had thrown some supplies in his designated shuttle. I was surprised he hadn't just left the on for dead. The unconscious fossil had a clump of bandages around his head. It was painful to see him comatose on a cot. You took your time. Zahn spat. I glared at him. We came as fast as we could. I think you of all people would want us to make sure the explosives made it to Earth. The ship rocked around us, barely swallowing a hit from one of our enemies. There was no time for bickering if we were to survive. The three of us shouldered Dion's weight and deposited him into the pod's rear seat. The doctor strapped the injured patient in as Jala and I brought the shuttle online. The vibrations intensified around us, likely from our vessel entering Earth's atmosphere. Without heat shielding on the damaged areas, the main hull was going to be incinerated. Jala closed the exit hatch and we jettisoned the shuttle. 
the controls would have to be learned on the fly. Cerulean skies surrounded us out the window as we plummeted toward the ground below. The momentum from the ship's breakneck fall had carried over. I wrestled with the control column and tried to steady us. Jala flung all power to thrusters, but it could only slow us down so quickly. No, no, no. We can't be stranded on a predator's planet. We have to get back up to our fleet. Land was rushing up to meet us much too fast, even as our velocity lessened. Impact looked to be an inevitability. There was nothing I could do to prevent it. My body snapped back in the harness, and our shuttle's belly collided with foreign grass. The nature of Predator's 51 Memory Transcription Subject Wangji Captain, Kelzine Krakotl Alliance, Command State Western Ardized, Human Time, October 17, 2136. Dry air buffeted my face as we disembarked amidst tall grass. The shuttle crash was bound to attract attention from the humans. I imagined this place would be swarming with troops if it was anywhere near a military base. We had no idea where we were, or how many predators were in the area. My breaths were strained as the three of us hauled Theon's body across the savanna. Sparse trees dotted the vast plain, and a few beasts roamed the landscape. None of the orange predators zeroed in on us, but they were definitely something to avoid. I couldn't see any bipedal human shapes, but it was a matter of time before we ran into one. It's much easier to fly than to walk. We need to find some place to leave Theon. A place to shelter and to sleep would be nice. On our left, a bank of clay and sediment led down to a small pond. I was thirsty, but given that there were more bright colored predators bathing in it, I'd stick to our rations. With how tired I was, I didn't feel up to exterminating any threats now. This place is infested with predators. Only a few artificial structures, Zahn grunted. I studied the doctor's grimace. I don't think humans call their predator population at all. This is what happens when you don't have extermination officers. Can you imagine living on a planet like this? What an uncivilized world. This alien hellscape could be host to all kinds of nightmarish murder beasts. The vicious creatures around us had lean, nimble forms and fangs that put the sapient primates to shame. Most humans were unlikely to set up shop in predator territory. It could be a very long walk to civilization from this wilderness. After a brief pause, we began the laborious trek toward the far-off tree line. The expanse seemed to stretch for kilometers, with no sign of the nearest settlement. This region's heat was punishing, making me want to collapse in a puddle. No wonder the human's fur had evolved away. We need to put this dead weight down. This fossil intruder is going to get us all killed. Gala spat. I glared at her. I don't leave my crew members to die. There's wild monstrosities everywhere, and the humans could do anything if they stumble across him. So what? The rations would be better spent on people who can walk and fight. Leaves are not trading chips, Jello. Haven't you killed enough people today? I'll leave Theon when there's an appropriate spot, hidden and secure. A cave, or any kind of cover, would be a welcome sight. There was no locale devoid of predators to stash Theon. Leaving him in the open, to be gnawed on by a cast of beasts, wasn't an option. It was unclear how much energy any of us had left. Our flock might have to camp among the demons soon. I was relieved to spot a breaking point in the grass. 
There was an uneven dirt path, which had faint vehicle marks in its silt. That meant Terrans did stray to this region from the safety of a metal cage. At least we could communicate with human predators, an isolated one could be threatened into giving us supplies or shelter. Zahn looked to me with watering eyes. Kalzim, Captain. The Tuckan doctor heaved some strained breaths and placed Theon on the ground. He bent over, trying to catch his breath. Theo was swelling in his amber gaze. The realization that we were stuck on Earth amidst livid humans was settling in. Humans have definitely visited this place. Jala scanned the red arch in front of us with the prototype visual translator. The writing says, Ranthambore Tiger Reserve. I'm guessing those orange predators are Ranthambore Tigers? Alarm awakened my senses. Reserve, you say, like an area set aside for a specific purpose. The humans intended for this predator growth to happen, Jala? I think so. That is peculiar. Why would they want rival, stronger hunters on the loose? Even the sociopath seems stumped by my question. Such animals were not conducive to modern living. Maybe the humans wanted whatever prey the tigers prioritized for themselves, and snatched it away from them once the hard work was finished. It didn't make sense. There were much easier ways to feed their hunger than by stealing from ferocious fiends. I was certain a species with guns could hunt without assistance. They like the chaos and the violence, Zahn panted. This human war tribe could want to keep out dangerous visitors, especially their own kind. We might be in the most vicious nation on the planet. I didn't know what the truth was, but I was going to assume it wasn't anywhere close to that. The doctor lacked crucial understanding about humans. Their society was too structured for a state entity to stoke chaos intentionally. It must be something more philosophical in nature. Given how many galactic religions were organized against predators, it could be that Terrans saw hunters as deities. The Krakotos farming goddess, Inatala, brought plants to the universe to feed her children. Predators were considered a perversion of her natural order, who turned to Maltos, the god of violence, out of greed. Our reality was the eternal struggle of good and evil. I strayed from the faith once I became an extermination officer. The priesthood had a way of twisting the goddess's teachings. None of it matched with their written beliefs. Maltos wasn't an inhibitor of empathy, but merely an agent of destruction. We had seen that predators were violent and greedy, while not without some positive qualities. I think this is some kind of worship center, I decided. Maybe somewhere to pray surrounded by carnage, for hunting success, or for the expansion of war. Jala chuckled. A religion devoted to bloodshed? How interesting. It was interesting, actually. This is why I wanted to preserve their culture because we understand their kind so little. We've become enthralled with violence and killing ourselves in trying to be pure. The doctor curled his lip. A brutal race doesn't deserve any legacy for their culture. I'm enthralled with the punishment of the wicked, not killing itself. Your motives are rich with hatred. It poisons you, I hissed. Now let's get moving, before the sun finishes setting. The group hobbled away from the reserve in uneasy silence. There was no telling where the road led, or what animalistic carnage lie ahead. A more spiritual Krakato would see this as a temptation by Inatala. I had never intended to get up close and personal with human territory. Our mission was supposed to be impassive. Distant. 
This is a test to my soul. Regardless of divine presence, we must face Earth's horrors without surrendering our values. As we progressed past a clump of trees, my hearing detected a faint sniffling. It was accompanied by sporadic gasps, so I figured it must be a predator crying. Jala cued in on the sound as well, and drew her sidearm. The female Krakatla looked eager to kill or mock the beast. Sympathy tugged at my heart, and perhaps a bit of regret. If a human was mourning the devastation we caused, what right did we have to disturb it? Something told me I was outvoted though, so I raised my weapon. The flesh eaters were too dangerous to leave on the prowl while we were out in the open. If a single extermination was necessary to safeguard my people, so be it. I gestured to set the injured fossil on the grass. Zahn, watch over Vion and alert us if any other predators are approaching. I can't wait to see your extermination skills in action, the doctor chuckled. Jala clicked her beak. His skills? Kyle's aim is soft on the humans, but don't worry, I'm going to crack its skull. I expect you to be as silent as possible. We don't want it to know we're there until we have it cornered. Also, let me ascertain some information before you off it. What if I want to scare it? The sociopath drawled. The human is not in a stable state of mind now. It could go into a fit of rage on a whim. Let's not push our luck, we just need its shelter. The female Krakal curled her neck in disdain, but took cautious hops forward. My feet glided across the leaves, and I took care to avoid any twigs. A fabric dome, supported by stakes in the earth, was established amidst a clearing. A single human was stretched out on a blanket. It appeared to be watching videos on a handheld device. Terror swelled in my chest, as my instincts urged me not to approach. The feeling subsided upon drawing closer. Secondary observations swayed my emotions. This primate was of a lesser stature than indicated in Noah's data dump. Its skin seemed untouched by aging, and its register lacked a booming growl of males we had spoken to. If I had to hazard a guess, this human was an adolescent. Perhaps it was crying because it lost its parents. That would explain why it was alone and had wandered to predator-infested territory. My thoughts began racing with unpleasant images. It took a great deal of effort to push them away. I stopped a few paces from its blanket, put the electronic device down, and slide it to me. Don't even try to alert any fellow beasts. The human startled and pointed its tear-stained eyes at me. Its lips parted with alarm, it flung the device toward me, like it burned to the tut. Video footage was still playing on the screen, as Predator anchors described the loss of life in a city called Bengaluru. I wondered if that was the kid's home. Please, take whatever you want. Just leave me alone, it whined. That begging was rather unbecoming of a predator. Maybe it hadn't become desensitized to bloodshed yet. I focused my gun barrel, careful not to keep my grip too close to the trigger. We just want to talk, I lied. What's your name? The beast swallowed. Aryun dot dot. And your age? You don't look like a human adult. I'm... Twelve. Uh, we're not grown-ups till we turn eighteen. Jala traced her gun barrel across its furless chin, snickering as it shied away. The fear in its gaze twisted my heart. The little beast still had years left of adolescence. It looked harmless, helpless, even. I knew that was deceiving, 
but it still had an effect. Little predators become big predators, and reproduce exponentially, my mentor's voice said in my head. I stared at the shaking primate. Hey, eyes on me, Arjun. Why are you out here? Dad thought it was a good place to hide. He said you wouldn't target the parks first, Arjun croaked. If this is the end of the world, we could spend the last day outdoors. Together, kind. All right, I know humans care for their children. Where is your father now? My, uh, my dad is a wildlife photographer. He wanted to get some animal shots with the space battle overhead. It'd be a damn good picture if we... if you survive. The predator bobbed its head emphatically, and more tears streamed down its face. The kid's distress was apparent. It would be merciful if I limited the scope of my questions. I didn't want to prolong its suffering. Chala couldn't be allowed to botch the job or make a mess. Gosh, what if there was a way to curb a human's full-grown instincts? Pulling the trigger on iron, that extermination broke my heart already. It would grow into something terrible, but now it was innocent. It wanted its father. I struggled to steady my voice. You're doing great. Can you... Just tell me what this place is. We were curious about the predatory wildlife. National parks are like an animal sanctuary. We preserve species that are threatened or have lost their natural habitats. Why? Those orange tigers are menaces. They'd eat children like you. Tigers don't bother you unless you bother them. They're majestic animals. Lots of people tour this place, and there's resorts, campsites, hiking. Disbelief flooded my veins at the idea that humans wanted to stay in such a dangerous venue. To think that the locals went out of their way to preserve monsters. Arjun's tone had been reverent, but not religious. Did predators find thrills in challenging superior counterparts? I cleared my throat. Thanks. That's all we need. Finally, the talking is over. So I can kill it. Jala trilled. Eh, well, it, its binocular eyes pleaded with me. No. I helped you. I stared at the colorful leaves on the ground, avoiding its gaze. The reds and oranges reminded me of a raging inferno, sparking across a pool of gasoline. The little pups squealed through it all, and their frail silhouettes writhed in agony. When they looked at you with those big eyes, you wanted to help. But you didn't. You wouldn't. I couldn't help but feel that our mission had been wrong. The thoughts of how the predators tugged at my talons, playfully, was still a vibrant memory. Looking at Arjun, it was impossible not to recall that first extermination. Younglings didn't deserve merciless death. Captain Kalsim. Gala squawked. I blinked. Leave the predator alive. It's not a threat. Not a threat? San's voice made me startle as I found him looming over my shoulder. It's an offshoot of flesh-eating barbarians. What kind of extermination officer are you? Doctor, I told you to wait with Theon. Well, I was worried you'd do exactly this, predator lover. Gala. You don't have to listen to him. Kill that thing. Arjun was curled up into a ball, shielding its head with an elbow. The female Krakal's eyes twitched, and I could sense her temptation. 
I had to reel in the rebellious sadists before I lost control. Admitting my actions were born from sympathy would be suicide. I'm no predator lover. How dare you? I roared, shoving my beak in Zahn's face. I'm a skilled extermination officer, while you're someone who sits on the sidelines. Talk is easy. The doctor stiffened. You just said that sithing is the only bargaining chip we have. Humans value their children, so keeping it as a prisoner is the logical choice. Maybe we can make them trade us a spaceship. Food. Medicine, you arrogant fool. The Tacon gulped nervously and slunk back a few steps. He stole a glance at Arjun before swishing his tail in defeat. Jala also scrutinized my enraged form. I met her stare for several seconds, goading her on. She lowered her weapon, using their kids against them. As a shield, maybe. I like it. I knew you would. I exhaled a silent breath of relief and turned to the doctor. Sedate this human, Zahn, like you did with Marcel. Adjust for weight. I need sleep, and I can't watch a ravenous predator. The Tarkin nodded and filled a syringe with a light sedative dose. I watched which vial he grabbed, making sure he wasn't loading it with poison. The physician handed it over to me for administration. A quick jab plunged the needle into the human's neck. Hopefully it was only a light pinch. It should knock Arjun out for a few hours. When I was rested and able to think again, I would be able to deal with the predator. There was no telling how long it would act obedient. The greater challenge would be restraining my companions from tormenting the child. We'd failed to eradicate the Earthlings, and its continued survival was simply an admission of failure. There was no reason for a stranded crew to dole out needless death. The Nature of Predators 52 Memory Transcription Subject Ali A. Captain Sovlin Federation Fleet Command H date was standardized human time October 18 2136 The Yulan fleet deposited me predators stopped visiting me altogether Based on the claw tallies on the wall I calculated that it had been at least a week The Venlo guards were colder than the humans one of them spit in my evening gruel and muttered a curse against my depraved soul. Against all odds, I found myself missing Carlos and even Samantha. I kept busy by contemplating the Arxos' interrogation and how to refute their absurd story. There had to be reconciliation between the Terrans and the Federation. It had required an unthinkable cost but the Gojic government was swayed to the human's corner. Unfortunately, Prime Minister Piri's death was confirmed by Yuan ground forces. Her final transmission could only achieve so much. I offered to bargain with the Federation for them, but then the humans abandoned me. They're just gone, I mused aloud. If I strained on my hind legs, I could peer between out the window to the capital below. Venlil Prime was a massive planet that dwarfed the likes of Earth and the Cradle. By comparison, it had a shorter orbit and slightly higher gravity than the average world. Interestingly, much of its landmass was inhospitable. Sunlight never touched half of its surface, leaving it too cold for plant and animal life. Its bright side had the opposite problem too scorching hot to sustain water sources. There was only the thin space between extremes to build settlements. Then those scientists searched for new ways to push the frontiers with various methods to cool their planet. They manipulated it 
atmospheric reflectivity with aerosols, built an artificial upwelling system in their ocean, and used cloud seeding to generate rainfall. It took colossal effort to keep the gears in motion, and not all species are blessed with a perfect home. If it weren't for sentiment, Venlo colonies are much more conducive to habitation. I... The sight of human predators walking about became more frequent over the past few days. Many Venlo would give them a wide berth or cross to the other side of the street. I wondered why Earth was suddenly sending so many people abroad. Such a widespread presence was a lot to ask of their friends. A pointed cough came from the other side of the cell door. Enjoying the view? Looks like you've had I plenty of time to study the intricacies of Venlo society. I whirled around to see Samantha, with her auburn hair tied back in a knot. Her predatory eyes were unfocused, as though her mind was elsewhere. The anger in her voice bore a colder aspect than last time I saw her. My instincts pronounced her demeanor as highly threatening. Was there something I had done to infuriate the humans? Or worse, were they becoming corrupted by the Arxa? Hey, hello, Sam. I thought you guys had forgotten about me, I answered. She bared her pearly fangs, eyes dilating in a flash. My friends call me Sam. You're not my friend. Right. Sorry. That you should be. Bootsteps sounded behind Samantha, and I breathed a sigh of relief as I recognized Carlos. For a moment, I thought the female had snuck in alone to assault me. Everything about her stance screamed that she was thirsty for blood. Maybe it was simply not seeing a human in days, but I felt there was some substance to my inference. There was a jingling sound as the male guard slid keys into the door. The spark was gone from his brown eyes, and his subdued mannerisms were uncharacteristic. The last time I saw Carlos, he was ribbing me and striking down my thoughts at every turn. There was no sign of playful mockery or admonishment now. My spines bristled in alarm. What happened to you both? Something is wrong. Carlos gave me a weary frown. Earth was attacked by the Federation over a, a billion dead. Don't pretend like you care. You got what you wanted, Sovlin, Samantha growled. Horror washed over me, and I sank back onto my bed. No wonder the humans were upset. I remembered what it felt like to watch the cradle burn, to grapple with the loss of my home and culture. Why did the Federation have to piss off the only species to defeat the Arxir? There was a time where I wanted to cripple the Predator's breeding grounds. That derogative terminology still rang in my ears. When I turned myself into you in custody, I was expecting to witness a brutal society. Instead, Earth amounted to decent people going about their daily existences. It was a structured planet, rich in life and culture. That's not what I want now. I nibbled at my claws with anxiety and tried to keep my expression submissive. I'm sorry for your loss. I know what it's like to be in your paws. Samantha clenched her fists. Of course you do. You caused your world's death while trying to kill us, just like the Krakal. You're right. We brought it on ourselves, and I know that. We were horrible to humans, more so than any apology could ever excuse. Yet you showed mercy and compassion. Fuck mercy. The rest of our fleet went home. But we get tethered to you while Earth is under siege. How is that fair? It's not, but I have no say in that. 
I can see you're hurting. Air, if it makes you feel better to quarrel with me, then I encourage you to do so. Samantha turned her back in disgust. There was no way for me to offer amends that would satisfy her. All the same, my concern for her mental health was escalating. I knew how grief could swallow a person without a proper outlet. I cast an inquisitive stare toward Carlos, looking for direction. The male guard's nostrils flared with pent-up frustration. Had the humans only visited to extol their anger on me? I'm glad you're both okay, I added, breaking the icy silence. I hope some of Earth was able to hold out. Carlos nodded. We drove them off. With help? 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 From the Venlo? Sure. And other interested parties. Kat is a vague descriptor. Who else would have come to rescue humanity? Carlos waved for me to follow him, and the absence of his snarl was striking. It was like the guards had received a personality transplant. Both seemed infused with hatred and impassivity, though one was directing it at me more than the other. I was frightened of what their predatory emotions could compel them to do. Dark thoughts raced through my mind as I tried to recall why I trusted these predators. Their heroism on the cattle ship seemed a distant memory. My eyes widened in alarm at consideration of the rescued. That reminded me of the Gojids on Earth, cared for outside a large metropolis. What happened to the Gojid refugees? I blurted. it. I'm sorry if that's selfish, but I have to know, the male god sighed. The primary camp was brought to Venlo Prime when we started moving human evacuees. Most are safe. That is positive news. How many humans did you evacuate from Earth? Millions. We've known the Venlo all of three months. Some people preferred to ride it out in a bunker or were banking on us to rout their forces. Stop talking to that racist delusional prick like he's your pal. Samantha spat. Carlos. I thought we had this conversation. The olive-skinned human crossed his arms. I'm being civil. There's a difference. Not wanting to sow more division between the duo, I kept my other questions to myself. That did explain why the human presence had increased rapidly. The cynical part of me wondered if the predator influx resulted in a spike in crime. The primates posed an extraordinary threat when they were angry, and they had to be more prone to deviant behavior than Venlo. Carlos led the way past native wardens, and we stepped out into the capital's crisp air. The guard's strides seemed a bit strained from gravitational exertion. The difference on Venlo Prime wasn't enough to be significant, but the humans would tire quicker in physical activities. It was another reminder that they weren't home. A pair of Gojids were waiting by a spacecraft outside, joined by several UN personnel. My eyes widened as I realized why they were familiar. It was the deaf youth, Tobin, and his sister, Bernada. Both seemed to be in better spirits than the last time I saw them, and were carrying necessities. I can't believe I thought the humans were going to kill the kid, first time I saw him. We all shared that thought. Hello, Captain Sovlin. A synthesized voice spoke the words in the Gojit tongue, but with a bit of human growl. Tolpin must have been given an AI program with Terran phonies installed. Why are you being kept in a prison? You are a hero to us all. The young Gojit finished sliding his claws across a keyboard and fixed me with an expectant look. I didn't want to recount my crimes in detail. Then again, I wasn't sure how to begin translating my reply. 
At least Samantha seemed mollified by Tolpin's presence. Perhaps it served as a reminder of her deaf brother. I deserve to be there. I made another person, a human, suffer, I muttered. Tolpin turned his pupils to a nearby human and scanned the contortions of their fingers. His eyes widened. The adolescent struggled to believe that I could be involved with anything nefarious. His beige claws hovered over the keyboard for a moment before he typed out a reply. Why? Came the synthesized question. Your deeds are spoken of in legend. You are a hero, a righteous man. You save lives. I lowered my gaze. I'm none of those things. I thought causing a predator pain would fix my problems. Banner appeared stunned as well. You sound like you're talking about torture, Sovlin. That's vile. The humans are sweet, sensitive, generous. I blinked in agreement, lowering my gaze. The predators beside Talpin projected fondness toward him. But I could see their jaws tightening as they listened to me. At least if Berna spread the word about Marcel, my people would squash the myth of my heroism. I deserve to have my legacy tarnished, and to be remembered for the sum of my crimes. Topin tapped at his keyboard. How could the humans treat you so kindly? I don't know. Ask them, I answered. The UN volunteer beside him thought for a moment, before launching into an emphatic reply. The human translator seemed passionate about whatever she was conveying. The deaf Gorjid looked impressed at what was passed on, and nodded in acceptance. He shot me a disdainful look. I cast a nervous glance at Samantha. You speak sign language. What did she tell him? The guard flashed her teeth. That you deserve to live with what you've done. That human discipline doesn't stoop to your level. Well, that was a recurring sentiment when predators spoke of me. What I didn't understand was why the guards brought me to meet Talpin and Berna. It looked like the two Gojids were about to depart on a spaceship. After my disclosure, I doubted they'd want to send off from me. I don't want to travel anywhere with him. Talpin waved his claws emphatically at the predators. Not if he tortured a human. He is a disgrace to our kind. Banner curled her lip. I second the notion. We both owe humanity our lives. My confusion intensified and I shot Carlos a questioning look. Talpin seemed to think I was accompanying them on a trip, but I didn't have an inkling what he was referring to. Where were the humans taking them? Was I actually involved? Sovlin is the perfect person to pass on several messages for us. He can get you two through the door with those Colchian bastards. The male guard tossed his shoulders in a non-committal gesture. He's also the one some Federation fuckwits might believe about the Gojid refugees and the war. That was a good omen if the humans still wanted peace and dialogue. Maybe the attack on Earth hadn't completely pushed them to the Arxer side, as improbable as that seemed. These Terran predators had a merciful side, and I hoped we could appeal to that. It didn't sound like the entirety of the Federation was involved. The neutrals had minded their own business. There had to be some people that could convert to Terran advocacy. Other races didn't have to end up like the Gojids. Warmth filled my chest. A messenger? I'd be happy to testify on your behalf and broker peace with your enemies. I know about remediation. Samantha scowled. Peace is not an option anymore. Frankly, I'd declare war on all of the skeptics now. At least, not yet. 
We're going to purge the 24 who attacked us, followed by the 14 others who voted for war. Gavel what? That's the message? I gasped. Carlos shook his head. No, I'll get to that in a minute. Firstly, we need someone who can look into several items for us. Read this. We had it printed in your tongue, extra special for you. The female guard sneered. My shaking claws accepted the pamphlet, terrified at what the predators had inscribed. The paper nearly slipped from my grasp at once, mournful tears pooled in my eyes. Riesel was dead, killed by his own government for siding with humanity. I had mentored the Kalshian since he was a child, and shepherded his development. His advice on the bridge, combined with his honor, was steadfast. I wanted him commanding my ship in my absence. It pained me that our last interactions were him viewing me as a monster. My vision burned, and I dabbed at the wetness with my fur. The humans wanted to uncover why the Kolshians would resort to murder. It was unclear whether any future violence was planned against pro-human factions, but the predators weren't taking threats lightly. Not after Earth. Karens don't want species reaching out with false friendship. They want anyone who plots against them exposed. Humiliated. Why would the scholarly commonwealth be so opposed to humanity's diplomatic outreach? I was itching to demand Chief Nicholas's reasons for myself. He came across as a fair leader, reasonable to a fault. I would have considered him the kind who would give predators a fair shake. Look into the Kolshian matter for us and find documentation of first contact with the Arxir. See what you can dig up, Carlos growled. Samantha crossed her arms. We need to know who's complicit in every scheme against us and our allies. Who's worth sparing? Who started this predator hatred and why? The male guard narrowed his eyes. Our governments believe that you feel remorse, that you're not a flight risk. This is what we need from you, Sovlin. Okay. And the message? I stammered. You implied there was a statement to deliver. Oh, that's easy. Tell the Federation we're done contacting or negotiating with them. They never raised a finger to stop the attack on Earth. Let the neutrals know that they either reach out to condemn this terrorist act, or they can prepare for total war. That message sent a chill through my blood. The other Gojits looked horrified as well. I needed to find a more tactful way of phrasing that flagrant threat if there was to be peace with any species. The humans could rack up a lot of collateral damage in seeking revenge for their Earth. The Nature of Predators, 53 Memory, Transcription Subject Among Secretary General Elias Meyer Game Dake You Standardized Human Time October 18th, 2136 There was something uncivilized stirring in my soul as heartbreaking images flooded energies flooded in Insurage up from Earth Seeing historic cities pounded into rubble, and hearing tales of incalculable devastation was a gut-wrenching blow. It had been a mere three months since the first contact mission. In that span, 25 species had taken concrete actions to genocide human civilians without the slightest provocation. Crappling with my own actions, my own failure weighed heavily upon me. I was responsible for mankind's future, and I hadn't used every option at our disposal. What if there was something else I could have done? Was I a coward for abandoning Earth, especially to bargain with the metaphorical devil? It would take years to rebuild our homeworld. 112 bombs had detonated on its surface, 
churning up contaminants, and killing more than a billion. Dot reversing the atmospheric pollution would be a gruesome challenge, and we would witness more casualties in the aftermath. Strange how it wasn't humans who leveled our planet. I always thought it would be us who were our undoing. Elias? We're docking at the luxury resort on Titan Station in 60 seconds. Dr. Kuemba, the current Secretary of Alien Affairs, tapped my shoulder. Are you going to be up to this? You look unwell. My first thought was always diplomacy in the past. Brutal warfare was something that I thought best relegated to our ancestors. It should feel monstrous for a pacifist leader to long to see our enemies' worlds desolated down to their cores. But now, I couldn't see myself restraining the generals. Their path seemed the only way. I craved the Federation's destruction as an organization, regardless of the understanding that a small percentage were involved in the attack. Their bigotry was incompatible with our survival. A mere two, excluding the Oxus, unexpected arrival. The Zerulians were the only new race I cared to bargain with in the aftermath. The words of friendship other diplomats spoke proved to be empty. None of them backed us when it came down to it. The bystanders felt every bit as sinister as the Krakotl and their pals in this moment. Your head has to be in this, Elias, no matter how impossible that is, Quimper said gently. We can't afford any mishaps when 10,000 Oxer ships are still in the Sol system. I met her eyes. I never meant for them to come here. This wasn't what. The Greys already knew where Earth was. You couldn't have known that. For what it's worth, they did save our asses. Staving off my self-pity, my thoughts returned to the urgent matters at hand. The Arkshire decimated the Krakotl strike force with an excess of arrivals. It was concerning that the reptiles had so many vessels in this sector. Chief Hunter Isif kept his fleet in orbit to protect us from secondary attacks, but I couldn't help but to think they were scrutinizing us. The unpleasant reality was that the reptiles could plunder or conquer Earth now, if they wanted. We were vulnerable, and the heavy losses left military defenses sparse. The Dominion's philosophy was still reprehensible to me, a far cry from the UN's modicum of equality. However, at this point, we had to keep the Akshur sated at all costs. So when Izif requested an audience with me by name, I chartered the first ship I could find off Venlil Prime. Governor Tava, bless her heart, squeaked out an offer to join me, but I wasn't going to place her in the line of fire. The Akshur hunter understood our inability to accommodate him on Earth. He agreed to wait in Titan's travel lodging for my arrival. I don't like rolling out the red carpet for someone who called the Venlo a delicacy and referred to Tarva as dinner. I'd like to punch him in the nose for saying that. Kuempa, do you think that the Arxa are capable of societal change? I asked, as our ship completed its landing protocol. If, let's say, they had a stable non-sapient food source? The former SETI employee tilted her head. I don't know. The greys weren't always like this, but they altered their gene pool. I don't know if they still have art. Whether they indulge in empathy. That is the mystery. By the way, can you set up a comms link with the Zerulian fleet in 15 minutes? We have some damage control on that front. I'll do that. After a, I hear that you're alright. From your own lips. You need to hear yourself say it. I am fine. Once these alien visitors are handled, it's time to bring every government together. Then, to rally the people behind our banner and remind them not to give up. My shoes clicked on the decadent marble floor, and the crystal overhang reflected the colors of the rainbow from above. 
A glass viewport stretched the length of the lobby, complete with interactive holograms and exquisite telescopes. I observed a surreal view of Saturn as I passed the vacated concierge desk. This was considered the nicest hotel in space. For the sake of Earth survivors, I hoped the Oxer agreed. I felt awkward approaching the suite given to Isif. There was no question that the reptile could snap me in half with his jaws, if he desired. Given the aggressivity the Oxer were prone to, and how they detested weakness, this was gambling with my welfare. But with humanity's precarious position, someone had to pacify the baby killers. I wrapped my knuckles against the door. Hello? My voice couldn't have sounded more uncertain, and I cursed my nerves. The door creaked open. A pair of slit pupils surveyed me from the pitch-black interior. Isif didn't have any lights on, which added to my unease. He towered over me by at least a foot and a half, showing teeth longer than my finger. The alien's tongue flittered. Elias Maya. Two names, yes. We meet in person, come in. I clasped both hands behind my back and attempted to keep my strides even. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I noticed three other oxes scattered about the living room. It was a assumption that they were advisors, servants, or military personnel. Perhaps it was a mistake to come alone, or even conveyed that I lacked support. Thanks for your military assistance, I croaked, pawing at my dry throat. I'm sorry, do you have any water nearby? Isif tossed a water bottle at me, and I barely reacted in time to catch it. The liquid was lukewarm, but I chugged it with gratitude. The grey seemed to be dissecting my every move, like a specimen under a microscope. There was never a plan for formal first contact with the Oxer. I wasn't sure where to begin. We were supposed to be using the greys to get the crocodile all off our back. Now, would you like our assistance with rescue efforts? Human command indicated that your ground residents may react poorly to us walking the street, Isif growled. I scratched my head in discomfort. Air, yeah, I suggest asking each nation specifically. I'm sure some would accept the offer, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you, from us all. The people of Earth are in your debt, and the Arkshire curled his lip. Hey, relax. You've gone through a lot, human. Don't worry about offending us. I prefer honesty. Right. Why? Well, many people did not have a favorable view of your species prior to this. Myself included. I don't imagine that will change overnight, especially with xenophobia abounding. Isif's eyes glittered in the darkness, narrowing to the point that they were hardly open. His nostrils flared and he seemed to meditate on a scent for a second. His grin intensified. I wondered if he could smell my nervousness. The chief hunter's gaze moved to the holopad clipped to my belt. We wish to access your system's internet, the reptile continued in a polite rumble. My scientists here requested documentation of your hunting and domestication specifically. It would also answer if your research is remotely professional. I nodded. All right. Though we're quite different types of predators, air, I have no issue with sharing those search results. My holopad made its way into my hands, and I punched the keyword domestication into a search engine. An online encyclopedia article popped up as the top result which should be sufficient. Unless I deemed it a necessity, I was going to try to conceal our persistence hunting ancestry. It might make the Aksha view us as a serious threat due to our ability to weather a war of attrition. Easy snatched the device from my grip, 
The hunter must be quite eager to learn about us. I wasn't sure whether that was a positive sign or not. Perhaps the Dominion was assessing whether we shared their child-munching fervor. They could also be checking if we were on board with culling our weaker population. Had I just tipped them off by admitting our disdain for them? Fascinating. So humans did use animals for labor and livestock purposes, like us, he murmured. However, you keep pets too. Lesser beings coddled for entertainment and companionship, in return for emotional benefits to their owners. This is a normal practice? Yes. This behavior is derived from a pack predator's social needs, I would presume. And you care for these pets like they are part of your tribe, I assume? Usually. Many humans struggle with living alone. An opposite to how we tire of company in swift fashion. Your affinity for the Venlo stems from this pet category, does it not? It took a great effort to refrain from a reflexive denial. I would never classify sapient beings, especially our friends, as animalistic playthings. But if the Arkshire could view the Venlo as mere pets, that would be an upgrade to cattle consideration. It might make the reptiles willing to facilitate the release of the Venlo captives. I remember, the greys might require a predatory basis to accept our claims. Whatever concessions must be made to stall, to convince them we're on the same side, just do it. Yeah. Yes. Humans love adopting companion animals, I grumbled. As if glared at his advisors. Satisfied about the Venlo. I told you that humans are just social predators, and those animals are a misapplication of their evolution. An Arkshire scientist coughed uneasily. Humans are the first documented pack predator sapiens, sir. It was reasonable to ask why. You're dismissed. Wonder until you are summoned, so that Elias Meyer and I may talk in private. There are discussion matters that are above your clearance level. The reptilian subordinates swish their tails and slunk off in obedience. Isif watched them depart, exhaling a hearty sigh. He pressed my hollow pad back into my hands and searched my gaze with his own. There was a certain trepidation in his dark orbs. He waited in silence for a full minute, clearly apprehensive of prying ears. I studied the alien's mannerisms with curiosity. Was the chief hunter expecting mutiny from his own ranks? How disciplined was Arxa command? Something told me his private divulgence would be enlightening as to what he expected from humanity. I'm sure you intend for Earth to repay your assistance with some form of compensation, I said. As if bared his fangs. Oh, you will, Elias Maya, but not today. In the future. I don't follow. The fact is, you don't like that we keep the prey sapiens as food. That is your entire issue with us. It violates your moral code. I'm not blind. This commander could not realize we had backed the Federation with full-throated support. We didn't want the Dominion classing the UN as an enemy now. I tried to maintain my best poker face, though the Arxer seemed to see through my neutral expression. My silence must have confirmed his suspicions, but what could I say? I shrugged. We're different. Humans? Well, you haven't bred out your empathetic people. I thought you could help us attain an alternative food source. Isif's voice was hardly more than a whisper, and he looked jumpy. That is why I sent our entire sector fleet to your aid. My species could have a better future. 
someday, with your guidance. Beyond war and cruelty. What? A week ago, you gave me a speech about what a delicacy the Venlo are. Called our beloved ally dinner, I hissed. The reptile sighed. Tava had some spunk, for prey actually. Don't be unreasonable. I was recording that transmission in front of my crew, and also sending it home. I like my head, attached to my body, human. My eyes widened. It wasn't a shock that the Arkshire Dominion executed anyone who spoke out against their policies. However, it was encouraging news if some high-ranking officers didn't toe the party line. None of our captives saw any issue with the atrocities. They had boasted about how sophisticated their ideology was. I cattle ships could be stocked with the true believers. Not the best sample size, I suppose. <laughs> so you don't support your race's farming practices? I pressed. A growl rumbled in Isif's throat. I prefer food that doesn't talk. This war has gone on long enough, and your allies have shown me that some of them could accept predators. If we're reduced to our animal instincts, we're no different than the Federation. I concur on the instincts. Fine, I'll bite. Why are you telling me this? So that you understand that I'm on your side, and you'll be more forthcoming with the future compensation. If you don't push your luck, I might be able to bargain for the release of more friends. That was enough to pique my interest. Liberating any captive Zerulians might make them a bit more forgiving of our Arxa saviors. Humanity had to reward the teddy bears for their fealty somehow. They sent aid without any history between our worlds. It also meant that Isif might follow through with the Venlo deal. I still clung to the hope that one day, we could end all sapient farms. No matter what the Federation had done to our two species, eating and torturing children wasn't the answer. Downplaying or excusing atrocities wasn't going to bring back London or Los Angeles. Mankind was better than that. I cracked my knuckles. How on earth are you going to sell mercy to your government? Simple, not phrasing it as treasonous. Mercy, as if chuckled. Just stating it as reclaiming the farming glory of our ancestors. Talking about how simple prey breed quicker. I work within the powers that be. Clever thinking, I'll do what I can to uphold our bargain, though our production capacity is limited now. Human, I'm understanding. Rational, dot dot. Don't starve your people for this Fenlil deal. What's important is that we're allies in the long run. This Arkshire wasn't a feral creature that saw hunting as life's sole joy. There was an empathetic capability in his concern for human life, and that weariness of the war he was born into. He projected an aura of sincerity, in contrast to their reputation. That was more than I saw in the Krakatoa and their ilk. I wondered what this predator race would have been, without outside interference. Thanks, Isif. If you are certain you can control your people, I'll find amenable places for you to direct your assistance, I whispered. Humor flashed in his eyes. Anything for a friend. Though I presume you don't want me to share a food stash? I hesitated. Actually... If you have extra herbivore feed, it might be edible to us. We're omnivores. Ha, ah, you were a leaf lickers, duly noted. I'll see what I can do. This encounter went better than I anticipated, but unpleasantries were still ahead with the Zerulean call. Even if Isif had given us grounds to work with, a federation and Arxer confrontation was a powder keg. 
I didn't want it going off in the Sol system. Humanity had to find a way to smooth the ruffled fur and keep two polar opposite species on our side. The Nature of Predators, 54 Memory Transcription Subject, 1 Secretary General Elias Meyer, AU Standardized, Human Time, October 18, 2136. After bidding farewell to the Arkshire Commander, I made my way to the conference hall. This hotel was once a primary site for technological conventions, expensive weddings, and even celebrity events. Now, while the catering and decor was missing, it was still a lavish enough venue to field a call to the Zerulians. My headquarters on Earth probably didn't exist anymore. The government needed a temporary base of operations. Secretary Kuemper extended invitations to every world leader, with the option to attend virtually. Many would be unable to procure space transportation, while others wouldn't want to leave during the crisis. Sir, the Zerulian ambassador is waiting on a secure channel, Kuemper offered. I straightened my posture. Good. Patch him through. The adorable face that appeared on screen was enough to soften my demeanor. The side-facing eyes made him look like an anxious teddy bear. I suspected that Visage would fill most humans with the urge to scoop them up and hug them. The Zerulian narrowed his eyes. I stifled a giggle at how stern he was trying to look. The expression was almost comical. That would be an inappropriate reaction, given how they felt about the Oxer's arrival. It would be preferable to keep these cute aliens as allies. This is Secretary General Maya. Thank you for taking our call, and for your timely assistance, I offered. I am sorry for what happened to Earth. Chosen pawed at his nose, a forlorn twinkle in his eyes. But my colleagues and I have some concerns. I believe you didn't invite the Oxa, but you haven't tried to push them away. The consequences of aggravating the Greys would be severe and inadvisable with our current readiness. Candidly, we need the help. There isn't exactly an outpouring of aid from the galactic community. The Zerulian began licking his paw, which his species did when thinking. The absent-minded grooming was distracting. I couldn't stop my lips from curving up, despite knowing it was a hostile gesture to their brains. The cuteness was melting away even my practiced composure. There is something amusing about not having aid for your planet, Mr. Ch- Maya? Oh. Chosen yipped. I shook my head quickly. No, not at all, Ambassador. My apologies. Hey. <sighs> I've talked the Zerulian commanders into writing a more favorable report. We'll do our best to neutralize the headlines, but I'd still expect incendiary accusations. I understand, and thank you for trusting us. It wouldn't surprise me if certain media outlets ran with the Predators scheming together narrative. Having the Arkshire in our court was the fuel Federation factions needed to turn on us, but I didn't care. Humanity was done crawling through mud to appease paranoid bigots. Species were either for us or against us, and they needed to decide which side pronto. In the long run, our Zerulian neighbors looked to be decent friends. I couldn't imagine their fleet's thought process when the Arkshire arrived. It would be understandable if they left at the sight of greys and humans fighting side by side. The fact that the quadruped stayed meant it was worth justifying our position. East I could do, Chosen purred. We want to help with the rescue efforts. We have thousands of hospital ships in the system you called Proxima Centauri. That's where I am now. Our military may be unimpressive, but our doctors are second to none. Medical assistance would be appreciated, Ambassador. Please, 
Send them at your earliest convenience. My voice took on a pleading lilt, contemplating Earth's desperation. If there's any information you need about human biology, the Venlo data has given us a baseline. But the issue is sending unarmed civilians into an Arxer occupation. I want to help you, but how do I authorize that order? You want me to get rid of the Greys first? Yes, for our safety. Chosun, with respect, they haven't attacked a single one of your ships so far. I'm sure that the monsters who snack on our cubs have benevolent intentions toward the Zerulian race. I should invite them over for dinner. That's not what I meant. Human lives are, what about our lives? These are good, selfless people. With emergency services down in most metropolitan areas, there was nobody to respond to medical calls. Anyone who suffered a heart attack or sustained serious injuries was on their own. I would prefer Zerulian medics tending to our people rather than famished Arxer. That said, Isif's forces were the only protection Earth had right now. We needed both of their offerings. As I said, I am unwilling to aggravate the Arxer now, I replied. But I'm confident this commander will not attack your doctors. Chosun bared his tiny teeth. You can't be confident enough. The Arksha are not trustworthy. They're sapient-eating fiends. I know. But there are good people on Earth that need your help, and I believe the Greys will stand down if asked. Please, trust my judgment, this one time. Oh, damn it, human. I'll send the medical ships. But if anything happens to them, this is the last Zerulian aid you're getting. We have not a expendable. I inwardly curse this gamble. Thank you. Kuempa, please contact the chief hunter. Let him know the inbound fleet are rescue workers and are not to be harmed. The secretary of alien affairs departed with haste. The Zerulian scientist began pacing in a nervous daze as he sent a transmission to his men. Humanity would remember the quadruped's heroism for generations. I didn't know how we could thank them enough. A close-knit alliance might form out of this tragedy. What am I going to do about the other friendly diplomat? They showed just how much they care for predator lives. I pedal sapient popped up in front of the camera as though my thoughts summoned him. His coarse pelt was the tone of a red fox, and his face had some white markings. I racked my brain, identifying him as a yotl. It was all I could do not to launch into a tirade against his inaction. What was Ambassador Lolo doing with Chosen? I'm sorry about Earth, too, the marsupial barked. Humans have been the only ones that treated us as equals, rather than a charity case. I narrowed my eyes, and forced myself to maintain a level tone. The Zeruleans didn't mention we had company. What can I do for you? I just want you to know we do care about what happened to humanity. Stars. I feel stupid saying this out loud. I really wish we could have helped, like Chosen. Those words are easy to say, aren't they? Why didn't the Yotor raise a claw? The Zerulian ambassador watched in silence, flicking his ears in discomfort. I urged myself to reign in my fury, for his sake. This wasn't a discussion to have in front of our newest allies. Holding the bystanders accountable could alienate our neighbors. Laulo averted his gaze. We don't have our own fleet yet to send you, so, ah, I guess we're useless to you. We're the newest uplifts, guess you think we're worthless primitives now too. I mulled over his explanation in silence. That did alter my perspective, if the Yotol hadn't developed any military assets to mobilize. 
It didn't sound like the Federation had done anything more than dump technology in their lap and expect them to figure it out. Perhaps the apologetic sentiment was worth something. Anyhow, I scrounged up millions of volunteers to help you rebuild, the uplift grumbled. We have lots of untapped resources, and it's labor if you want it. We'd need external transport to get to Earth. I'm sorry that my offer is so underwhelming. I raised my hands in reassurance. We would love any help you're willing to extend. Aid doesn't have to come in a military form, Lalo. Maybe we can teach you a thing or two about our engineering. Really? You would do that? Of course. We're still new to Federation technology ourselves. The two of us can figure out their secrets together. The Yochul's expression was the image of relief as he squeezed his eyes shut. I felt sorry for the poor guy if he was expecting to be rebuked for technological deficiencies. Perhaps this exchange was reason enough for me to move the goalposts. Anyone who offered assistance would be in my good graces, whether it was military or not. Some of our allies might have been too scared to fight, which could be fixed. They might have been too far away, or didn't have spare military resources. Shosong gave the uplift a friendly nudge. You can ask us for help, too. I knew I was right to bring you along. I apologize if I snapped at you, Lolo. It's been a difficult 48 hours, I muttered. Have you guys heard anything from the other human allied races? The Zerulian sighed. No, I'm afraid not. I pursed my lips. If no additional species expressed the slightest concern for our predicament, that lessened the possibility of extenuating circumstances. According to my sources, the Mazix and the Sivkits hadn't been partial to us. Maybe the absent races had blamed us for killing their diplomats because of our predatory compulsions. Should I even bother reaching out to any of them? My throat felt dry. Well, I appreciate both of you. Please, keep in touch if you have any concerns. Shosen waved a paw. Wei, Maya, I know now may not be the right time, but there was an idea I'd like to mention at least. Go on. The Zerulians and the Yochul are both interested in a human exposure program. Like you did with the Venlil at first contact. Chosen flicked his ears. Obviously, some civilians are going to be sharply exposed with rescue efforts. But I still think it's important to foster understanding and discussion in a controlled environment. I nodded. We'd be amenable to that idea, though any human candidates will carry emotional baggage after this attack. I'll see what I can do to set that up. Excellent. Take care, Maya, and let me know our hospital fleet's status regularly. The Zerulian terminated the call, and I flopped down on a chair with exhaustion. Human participation in an exchange program shouldn't be an issue, given how cute our helpers were. A few friends in the galaxy was a silver lining. The future ahead of us was going to be rife with war and suffering. We needed to maintain some positive relations to stay sane. I fished out my holopad and contemplated the address I was live streaming tonight. My original speech was mired with blame and bitterness, focused on revenge. There was room for such sentiment, but that was also how the Arxer ended up with such a warped ideology. What humanity needed was hope. The first words spilled from my fingers in a burst of inspiration. Kato, the people of planet Earth, who have been preyed upon by an unreasonable enemy. I know you are grieving the innocent blood that has been spilled this week. You feel hurt and anger for the loved ones taken away too soon. 
I share every scrap of your pain. What I want you to know is that humanity will endure, and that we're not alone. Not only do we have each other, but we have friends who stand with us. The Zeruleans and the Venlo fought with us, and gave us back a sliver of optimism for a better life among the stars. It is time to unite with everyone who believes in our ideals, to stand as a single species with a single purpose. Kyo, gather. We will go for the Federation's throat, relentless in the face of injustice. We will bring our enemies and our persecutors to their knees, if it takes millennia to rectify this vendetta. Humanity calls for atonement, for our right to exist. When we are done, the galaxy shall know what a hunter is. <sighs> My lips curved up with malice. The speech required some tweaking, but it carried the suitable degree of vengefulness. Governor Tava would be relieved that I tempered the prior message down a notch. If humanity could unify for the purpose of destruction, then the Federation would have a genuine reason to fear us. There would be a reckoning for Earth, and I didn't know that their organization would survive it. The Nature of Predators, 55 Memory Transcription Subject, A.K. Captain Kalsim Krakol, Alliance Command Date Westandardized Human Time, October 18, 2136 Darkness, had fallen over the reserve when I peeked out from the tent. Sleep had instilled new energy in my veins. There was a slim hope of escaping Earth if we could keep away from human search parties. Our posse needed to figure out our next move, and how to transport the Predator Kid without harming it. A muffled whine echoed from behind me. I twisted around to see Arjun, bound in tight rope from head to toe. It must have woken before me, and been struggling to break free. Several layers of tape had been slapped over its mouth, wasting medical gauze. I assumed Zahn didn't want to hear a human speak. Swallowing my nerves, I approached it. Shh. It's okay. I'm going to have to rip the tape off. Close your eyes. How could Dr. Zahn treat it like a thoughtless animal? Predators or not. Humans were feeling sapience, the level of bindings was both excessive and unnecessary. The predator child squeezed its eyes shut. I yanked the adhesive off as quickly as I could, and winced at the grimace on its features. The skin by its lip carried a red patch behind. The creature refrained from biting me with its slobbery canines, which was a relief. I set to work untangling the series of knots. What happened if Arjun tried to take me by surprise, once it was loose? It could go for my gun before I knew what hit me. I was within grappling distance, and its reflexes must be quicker than mine. The last of the rope came untangled, and the human wriggled out of its entrapments. My gaze drifted to my sidearm. I took a few steps back and barely resisted the urge to draw a weapon. The kid had faced enough hardship these past few days. It needed someone to be civilized to it. Care a watery look in its eyes. The poor thing is terrified. There's no question these wretches have feelings. I'm sorry that they did that to you, Arjun. Are you okay? I asked gently. It sniffled. The only reason you're not killing me is because you think they'll trade resources for me. I heard how you talked about me. That stopped Zahn and Jala from shooting you, didn't it? I would have let you go. Trust me, I want to get you back to your family safely. That's bullshit. Those two aliens are evil. 
If you want me released, then help me get out of here. I was beginning to regret taking the tape off this thing's mouth. That combative shouting wasn't helping anyone. It needed to keep its voice down, or Zarn would realize I was trying to console a human. However, expecting an aggressive predator to keep its head was a bit overambitious. Holding this child to Krakatl sensibility standards would be unfair. I need the doctor cooperating. My feathers puffed out with irritation. My friend with the bandages will die without him. He's a good person. Smart, witty. The predator bared its teeth. None of you are good people. You killed millions indiscriminately, and you liked it. You don't know what you're talking about. I had to choose between hundreds of civilizations and yours. It was a terrible decision, but a necessity for the continuance of life. Every step of the way, I tried to minimize human suffering. By dropping bombs on cities? Do you hear yourself? To the very last moment, we approached Earth, I was trying to think of another way. My own crew hates that I treat your kind with dignity, and that I offer predators surrender. Then your crew are assholes. Arjun's voice sounded hoarse, and its lips looked dry. How had Zahn expected it to drink water, with its mouth taped shut? The Takan doctor hadn't even left rations nearby. It probably would make that hateful expert giddy if it died of dehydration. I fished through my own rations, making sure never to turn my back on the human. It would be foolish to leave myself vulnerable to pouncing or strangulation. The child watched with interest as I procured a canteen. It gulped down a bit more than I'd like, before handing the canister back. Jala is the other Krakatl you saw. Her brain doesn't feel empathy or fear, I said. She can't help that she's vicious any more than you can. In fact, Aryun is much more capable of compassion. It has tried to appeal to my morality several times. It cares for more than its own life. Gaia Beast scowled. Humans are not vicious. You're brainwashed, Kalsim. We have lives, families, schools, jokes, songs, and games, just like you. I am sorry for all the beauty you've lost, but that doesn't change the truth. Tell me that you can't see humans killing or enslaving weaker cultures. That you wouldn't happily take our worlds away and reduce us to playthings. What? That's not our plan. We would never do that. Yet you've done these things to your own kind. And we are alien, not human. You'll build your empire off our backs, one way or another. It's in your DNA, passed from your ancestors to little ones like you. That... your growth is the threat. Arjun clenched its fists in indignation, but was distracted by its stomach growling. Racking my brain, I tried to recall what Noah shared about human needs. The speaker claimed that their diet was primarily vegetation, and that they could live without meat. That meant this adolescent could consume our food without issue. My talons retrieved a slab of dried tree bark. Here. Stop arguing with me, and eat this. Um, that doesn't look like my food. Arjun eyed the offering suspiciously. It took a hesitant nibble, then spit the bite out. That is bitter, gross. I'm giving you my rations so you don't starve. It doesn't have to taste like your delectable, blood-filled cuisine. The kid made a disgusted face, but swallowed several bites. The gagging sound it made seemed rather dramatic. You'd think it was expelling its lungs 
or that I had fed it a corrosive poison. This ruckus was going to ensure Zahn and Jala checked on us. Few Krakot would have gone out of their way to ensure Predator's welfare. Arjun didn't understand why its planet was attacked, but I didn't blame it for that. It was emotionally distressed and unable to see these matters with objectivity. Maybe the youth would come to know that I protected it in time. The Takan doctor sauntered in, wielding a pistol. Good grief, Kalsim. You've let it loose, handing your feeding it? Tree Bark. We don't want it to lose its mind and gorge on Theon's corpse, I said. Speaking of which, where is the first officer? Don't change the fucking subject. So now, instead of being bartered for supplies, this human is using up precious resources and manpower? It's a temporary loss. We don't want to offer up the kid as a walking skeleton. Why the hell not? If you keep its stomach empty, the humans will be under more of a time constraint to get it back. That's assuming predators care at all. Arjun shoved the last of the bark in its mouth, inching away from Zarn. Its cheeks were tear-stained, but absolute hatred shone in its pupils as well. I couldn't imagine how overwhelming the predatory chemicals flowing through its veins were. The doctor's lack of compassion was staggering, with how cold his suggestion of starvation was. You would think he had Jala's disorder. I fixed the Takan with a glare. First off, we would encourage the humans to treat us the same in kind. This predator doesn't deserve to suffer for existing. It has suffered enough pain and heartache today. The physician swished his tail. You're all oh so worried about its feigned emotions. Why do you care what it feels? Fuck you. I'm not an it, the human growled. Zahn charged the kid, rearing back with his firearm. The doctor trembled with anger as he swung the gun toward its head. The predator's binocular gaze widened in alarm. I couldn't let it be beaten to a pulp for speaking its mind, when all it had done was complain about our language. Arjun had a family and a future out there, which was jeopardized by the Takam's malice. The more I considered our conversation, its intelligence was impressive for a child. Granted, it would help propagate the survival of the human race. But, that seemed a likely probability no matter what. So what did harming it achieve? I don't want to see it in pain, or worse, end up like Theon. Ah, without realizing I had moved, I stretched my wing in the strike's path. Zahn was committed to the blow by the time I obstructed his angle. The metal gun connected with my soft tissue, while the human cowered behind a feathery shield. Pain flared down my left appendage, resonating to the bone. The throbbing sensation was nauseating, and a single glance told me it was broken. You broke my wing, I screeched, doubling over in anguish. What if that had been Arjun's head? You could have cracked his skull. The doctor leveled his gun barrel at me. His? My eyes widened as I realized my slip of the tongue. I shook my head, trying to filter away any positive assessments of Arjun. The kid was lying prone on the floor, and its eyes were bulging. If their tools and pack were taken away, humans weren't competent predators. I was the only one that could protect this beast. Zahn's concentration waned as a squawking Jala landed behind him. I took the opportunity to wrench the gun from his grip with my good wing. Ironically, I could use his services to patch the broken bone up. The pain intensified with the slightest movements or vibrations. The Takan hadn't even flinched at assaulting me. 
I brandish the firearm awkwardly. Mutiny is punishable by death. Unless the captain is deemed unfit for command, why shouldn't I carry out your sentence? Kalzim, Pete put the gun down, the doctor stammered. You're being unreasonable. I am unreasonable? Then what on Neishtal do I call you? Yala issued a hearty laugh. What did I miss? The female Krakatl's eyes darted behind him and she drew her own firearm. Arin had capitalized on the chaos, making a break for the exit. The human skidded to a halt once the armed sociopath blocked its path. After witnessing how slippery Terran forces were, I really should have been paying more attention to it. I hope Jala doesn't make any hasty decisions here. Zahn proved himself a threat to crew safety in this mission. I lowered the pistol, and noted the contempt in the doctor's eyes. But he's not going to disobey orders again, is he? The Takon sighed. No, Seer. Your wing isn't supposed to bend like that, Kalsim, Jala chuckled. I struggled to ignore the searing pain. Tell me something I don't know. Ah, go on, laugh at my misfortune later. Is there something you need? I circled the perimeter from the skies and spotted a human a few clicks away. It's heading toward our position, and it's armed. Arjun mustered a feral snarl. Dad. Panic swelled in my chest at the thought of Terrans converging on our position. Confronting Arjun's father was an option, but we didn't know that it was alone. The photographer might notice that something was wrong and alert authorities. Humans were dangerous without the element of surprise. It was unclear whether our small posse could survive direct combat. It would be in our best interest to leave the kid, and that was what my conscience demanded. However, that plan wouldn't be popular with my companions. With a crippled wing, taking on Jala and Zarn was an incredible risk. Both could aim guns without difficulty, and a flight-worthy Krakotl could maneuver freely. More importantly, the doctor's incapacitation would damn Theon. That was the main reason I couldn't punish this mutiny. The Farsal's life took precedence over Arjun's welfare, plain and simple. I had to keep this together until Yon regained consciousness. It's time to move, I decided. Where is your patient, son? The doctor scowled. The honest safe. Jala crafted a pulley system and put him up in a nearby tree. Predators won't get to him there, though I can't speak for humans finding him. Good. We need to hurry before dozens of full-grown beasts descend on us. We'll come back as soon as human activity cools off. Gala began collecting our supplies, as well as anything Arjun had that was useful. I steered the kid out into the open, trying to be gentle with my gun prodding. Intimidating it wasn't my desire, but we needed to move quickly. There was no time for a diplomatic approach. Arjun looked around in desperation. As we staggered out of the encampment, I knew it wanted to be rescued. That pleading gaze reminded me of the burning pups, praying to be saved from their extermination. Why did it have to jog up those memories, with every expression? I thought I was past that guilt. Dad, that... Help! The kid screamed. There... I clapped my good wing over its mouth. You idiot. Are you trying to get yourself killed? Zahn passed me a roll of medical gauze, a conceited glint in his eyes. I could hear the words, told you so, from the smug doctor. He scowled at the human, tracing a toe over his own throat slowly. The child swallowed, and I suppose it understood the gesture. 
I applied a single layer of tape and offered a sympathetic pat. The predator hadn't left much choice other than to gag it. Not only could that wailing cry have alerted its father, but it could have drawn attention from forest beasts. That squashed all hopes of Arjun's guardian accepting the disappearance as a tragic accident. Its suspicions were going to be elevated, and its protective instincts would seek answers. The Nature of Predator's 56 Memory Transcription Subject Dolwal Dolhal Kalkal Alliance Command 8 West Standardized Human Time October 18th, 2136 The leafy ground crunched underfoot as we steered the Terran prisoner The park I was certain Arjun was purposefully stomping on brittle patches. The kid wanted to make as much noise as possible in an attempt to summon others of its kind. It didn't matter how much of a ruckus it made or if it dragged its feet. With how slow humans plodded along, we had at least an hour of walking between us and the returning father. It would tire after sustained exertion and be forced to retrieve a vehicle to close that distance. That left time to snack and hydrate. I ambled along on weary legs. How do you land animals walk everywhere? I wish I still could fly, Izan. And I wish I could exsanguinate that thing of yours. It would die in minutes if I sliced that big artery on its neck, the doctor muttered. Jala chuckle, do you think its eyes would stay open after we axed its head? Or maybe they would pop right out of its skull? We are not killing it. I snapped. Life, even tainted life, is sacred. True exterminators do not kill for fun or for laughs. Zan pulled a scalpel from his bag and inspected the reflective metal. The Takan must be considering how it would slice through predator skin. I wondered why he hated humans when his species government voted to be their allies. What left him so certain that social hunters had no emotions or benefits? I tried to focus on our travels, knowing we couldn't rest before Arjun's father did. The kid's skin was damp, but the strain to its breathing was minimal. We had been walking in the afternoon heat for an hour, and its legs weren't fully grown. It shot and be panting and stumbling with exhaustion. What regiment has this human hatchling been through? Its little lungs must be on fire. We need to rest, for its sake, soon. Hainini, there had been a surprising lack of predator sightings in the forest environment. Did other hunters fear the apex humans? The primates shouldn't scare wild beasts with their unimpressive forms. Hmm. Kilomer Sam. Arjun jerked backward and howled against the tape. Hmm. I cursed as the kid clipped my broken wing. Did I tell you to stop walking? Air. Yeah. I mean, we'll rest in a few minutes. You're almost there. It continued screaming beneath the gag, and its binocular eyes were almost hysterical. If something frightened a predator, that gave me pause. There must be a reason it refused to walk, unless this was a time-wasting trick. The fear looked strikingly real though, so I was inclined to believe the antics. A blood-curdling hiss permeated the air, and movement flashed across the leafy ground. A brown creature uncoiled its scaly body, lifting its head toward us. A forked tongue waggled from its mouth like a seesaw. The way it slithered forward was alien and unnerving. There were no legs that I could see. That's a prey animal. It has side-facing eyes, I decided. Tch. Poor thing must be trying to scare off the predator, flattening its neck like that. 
I can't believe that works on a sapient human. K, the alarm in Arjun's gaze intensified and beads of sweat surfaced on its skin. We would have stepped on the reptile if the kid hadn't flailed about. Why was it so terrified of a crippled animal? The tiger's bite was much more petrifying than this thing. The human seemed to forget about the gun to its back and bolted away with impossible energy. That mad dash reminded me of Federation species in a mindless stampede. Maybe these frail primates incorporated some prey instincts into their hardware to compensate for their weakness. Jella lined up her gun barrel. Better learn how to fly real quick, Arjun. My eyes widened. Don't shoot it, you're no fun. I'm not just letting that scrawny beast go. The sociopath was airborne before I could stop her and bore down on Arjun with powerful flaps. She swiped her talons across its shoulder, carving twin gashes into its flesh. The human yelped. It lost its balance from the blow and toppled to the ground. Jala's takeoff aggravated the hissing animal, which hadn't blinked a single time. Shouldn't it calm down now that the predator was gone? Zahn seemed to feel bad for it, since the sight of Arjun had traumatized it. He wanted to show it we weren't like the humans. The doctor reached out to give it a comforting pat. Nobody's going to hunt you, sweetie. Did those nasty apes eat your babies? I, the panicked animal, was still in fending off predators mode. It was worked up in a frenzy, desperate and aggressive to any movements. Zahn was oblivious to the opening of its mouth. It bit the doctor with tiny teeth, and he grabbed his arm in pain. My gun was readied within a second, and I dispatched a shot through its head. I cursed the Takan for making me shoot a non-sapient victim to Terran incursions. To make matters worse, any nearby humans would hear that reverberation. You had to try to touch a terrified, helpless prey animal. I sighed. Zahn inspected the two tiny puncture marks. I just wanted to soothe it, Kalsim. Let me disinfect the wound. Barely a scratch. My pupils swiveled toward Arjun, who had ripped the tape off its own mouth. Gala was looming over it, and pecked at its earlobe to draw a reaction. I rushed over to intervene, pushing the female Krakatl away from the downed kid. My curiosity demanded an explanation for the freakout. That was irresponsible of you to run off. You startled that poor animal, I grumbled. All that panic for a rudimentary threat display? Arjun gawked at the marks on Zarn's grey skin. The snake bit you. Listen, Kalsim, if you don't get him to a human medic, he's going to die, painfully die. I'm not falling for that, the doctor scoffed. Our species actually knows how to treat infections. We have penicillin too. Dr. Psycho. Do you have no concept of venom? You're going to be paralyzed and unable to breathe. In an hour. It does burn quite a bit, Captain, but I have painkillers. Besides, if I was actually poisoned, this human would want me to die and languish. That's all they're capable of wanting. My eyes narrowed as Zarn confessed to localized pain. His arm did look rather swollen near the puncture wounds. Then again, a medical professional should recognize the signs of blood poisoning. I hoped he wouldn't brush off Arjun's warning just because a human passed it along. They do need to keep moving, urgently. I'll monitor Zarn's symptoms, and if it gets worse, I'll figure something out. Hey, hi. Let's get in a few more minutes of walking, and we'll settle down, I said. 
We can disinfect your wound and Arjun's incisions. The predator kid flexed its shoulder with a wince. The crimson blood staining its artificial pelt was drying. It pursed its lips like it wanted to argue, but I waved it along at gunpoint. The human shuffled ahead in silence, not wanting the tape reapplied. The tree cover thinned out, and we pressed ahead for several monotonous minutes. I remained on the lookout for snakes, just in case. It didn't make sense why Arjun would help its tormentor. Also, if snakes were really that dangerous and frightening, why hadn't humans exterminated them? Zahn sucked in a sharp breath, facial muscles contorting. His pace had begun to lag several steps behind ours. He touched the affected area with the other paw and screamed in a high register. Tears trickled from his eyes. Gah. My bee blood is on fire, he squealed. The Takan slumped against the base of a tree, writhing in agony. Arjun's eyebrows twitched, as though it was in pain itself. Perhaps I had underestimated the scope of human empathy. The best we could hope for, after this failed mission, was that their murders were less sadistic than archer hunts. Make it stop. Zahn shrieked. Jala puffed out her feathers. Shut up. You're giving away our location. It hurts so bad. Help me. It's like acid. It's... The female Krakatoa retrieved the medical tape, and I slapped it out of her grip with the good wing. She wasn't going to shut Zahn up, like an animal, while he was in anguish. Losing the doctor was unacceptable. His services were needed for a fine officer's survival. Arjun knelt on its knee and coaxed the Takan into a prone position. I knew Zarn was out of it when he didn't resist the beast's contact. The predator was remarkably gentle with its motions. It showed decency to an enemy that did not deserve it. Just like my officers said I had where humans were involved. I'm glad I treated their kind with respect. That I didn't make them suffer and I didn't enjoy their deaths. Kai, Kalazim, we need to get help, Arjun pleaded. The doctor's grip tightened around a grass clump. Get lost, Predator. You just want to watch my suffering up close. You're lapping it up. I don't want to watch anyone die. You're the one who wanted to watch humans suffer up close. No. Wounded prey smells good, right? Wait to get your pickings until I'm dead. We never wanted to eat you. I'm a vegetarian. It's part of my religion, to show compassion for animals. My eyes widened at its proclamation. The predator in Harding to be joking. It was Federation religions that dictated that preying on animals was greedy, bloodthirsty, and evil. Natural born hunters would never follow any ideology that demonized their own existence. How did that make the slightest sense? I thought humans were interesting, Jala clicked. But they're pathetic, just like everyone else. Cowering in the face of danger, religions about compassion, crying over people that are dead like it's IA so sad. I glared at her, as I've told you from the beginning, humans have selective empathy. Our knowledge of them is evolving, but their expansionism is incompatible with peace. Don't be fooled, Jala, they'll be brutal. Cunning and manipulative. Zahn gasped. Their history is one of conquest and invasions. Humans cook up new ways to kill each other, always. The doctor howled through gritted teeth as a spasm rippled down the afflicted limb. 
His pained cry morphed into a full-throated scream. Arjun wordlessly poured some water on Atakan's head, trying to cool his burning skin. Somehow, I trusted the predator not to finish him off. My attention shifted to finding an effective painkiller. Before I realized what was happening, a deafening gunshot echoed behind me. Jala was hovering over Zarn, a crazed look in her eyes. The physician's body went slack, as blood gushed from his temple. The human gaped as the corpse brushed its leg. I aimed my sidearm at the sociopath. What did you do? Drop your weapon. That's precisely how to shut someone up, she chirped. Enough of your games, Kazim. We do this my way now. Drop. Dapple. The. Con. Come on, you hated San. He was making too much noise. The predator said he was going to die anyway. Plus, you would have had us stay here and listen to him scream. This is your last warning. The human is slowing us down too, and it will actively work against us at every turn. I'm doing you a favor. Make your choice, me or Arjun. Jala swiveled her pistol toward the predator kid, who seemed stunned by Zarn's death. Arjun had never seen a creature die in front of it, had it? The words it said about compassion for animals reminded me of my extermination philosophy. We both killed when it was necessary and contained our damage to the rightful sources. Against all odds, I appreciated this predator's way of life. It was honorable and empathetic enough, not yet lost to its destructive instincts. I had more in common with this prowler than Jala. There was some attachment to it, to him, in that I didn't want to watch him die in front of me. I squeezed the trigger, and a succinct pop indicated a successful shot. Shock flashed in the sociopath's eyes, before her body crashed alongside Zahn's. The gun slipped from my grasp in a daze. Had I really just lost both able-bodied crew in the span of a minute? Aryan scrambled to his feet, scooping up the weapon. He didn't point it at me, for some reason. Blue Takan blood was spattered alongside his own scarlet shade. The little predator flopped down beside the doctor's satchel. You're hurt. We need to tea treat your wounds and find your father, I stammered. The human didn't respond and merely got to work patching up his own injuries. My instincts should have created an uproar over my proximity to an armed predator. However, I couldn't process fear through the shock. This world of death and wilderness, Earth, could not be my reality. I zoned out, staring into the distance. My story would come full circle if it was ended by the predator I chose to spare. Quite a poetic conclusion for turning my back on my occupation. The three Federation castaways could lie unburied in this infested land for all eternity. Kion is unconscious and abandoned in this predatory hell. Snap out of it, Kalsim. There was a slight cracking sound from above, which broke my trance. Before I could glance up, something rough brushed against my throat. The next thing I knew, ropes cinched around my throat in a suffocating knot. My body was yanked upward, and I found myself standing on empty space. I instinctively tried to loosen the noose, as my entire mass dangled in its secure embrace. My wings attempted to tread air, searing, all-encompassing pain lanced down the broken bone. Generating lift was impossible. Sun. A thunderous voice barked from above. Get out of here and call for help. 
Marcos is looking for these fuckers. How had Arjun's father gotten here so soon? There was no way a human predator could have closed the distance without running. But running that long was impossible, unless their endurance was nigh divine. The kid hadn't tired at all either. Oh, sweet Inatala. Aryun palmed his black hair. Tell me you regret what your species did, Carlson. Please. <sighs> Bimia. Ah. Sure, I always did, I croaked. But it was the only way to secure a future. I did my D-duty. The human youngling watched as my oxygen supply dissipated. His vicious eyes watered. I knew he was thinking about Bengaluru, contemplating how my orders leveled dozens of cities like it. The poor thing never understood the bleak necessity. Constricting pain centered around my larynx, and my field of vision began to diminish. Awareness was receding like sinking into a vast ocean. Struggling didn't seem important anymore. I felt like I lived a good life, a meaningful one. Cut calcium down, Dad, please. Arjun's voice sounded as though it came from underwater. He saved my life from the other two, multiple times. I don't want him killed. The adult human growled a reply I didn't register. Its voice was charged with bellowing savagery, a preview of what Arjun would sound like at full maturity. I didn't want to see him transform into an unstable beast, constantly beleaguered by the need to chase. That sickening development was the reason why pups were supposed to be exterminated. The kid offered a plea that was incoherent, as my eyes fluttered shut with grim realization. The rope released its grip, and I plummeted back to the earth with a muted sensation. The little predator poked at my beak, but I couldn't move a muscle. The world faded away, leaving me helpless at the paws of the warlike monsters. The Nature of Predators 57 Memory Transcription Subject All El Space Course Date You Standardized Human Time October 18, 2000, 136, Marcel leaned over the destroyer's railing, allowing the salt water to splash his face. The predator's eyes stared where the towering skyline of New York City had once been. His loved ones were in one of the nearby bunkers, perhaps buried beneath a mountain of rubble. The human resolved to search for Nulia and Lucy but I feared his reaction if they weren't found alive. The American military sent most available service members to the remnants of its largest city once the environment was deemed safe. Rescue prospects weren't promising for the main hubs, so efforts would be focused on the city outskirts. With the traditional naval ports and space docking sites pulverized, the boat would allow alien visitors to touch down. My skin crawled at the thought of the Arxer landing on Earth. I remembered what the Greys had done on the bombed-out cradle. It terrified me that they might get a taste for human flesh. What if the survivors, like Marcel, were rounded up onto a cattle ship? The thought of him being caged or tortured again filled me with despair. Minutes from now, those monsters were going to be walking onto this very deck. I couldn't stop focusing on that image. Every instinct compelled me to hurl myself overboard. The Terrans were in no condition to protect me. I didn't believe for a second that those emotionless predators were genuinely here to help. The red-haired human studied his reflection in the water. Shit. Do you remember the first time we chatted online, Slanik? You said... Hello. I sat at my keyboard for two hours, trying to envision your true intent, I muttered. I was terrified to talk to a predator. Wait, that's why you didn't answer right away. 
I mean, I was nervous too, but more about fucking up first contact, Mark. All I could think was, what have I done? After several bouts of crying, multiple drafted messages to Republic Emergency Services to drop out of the program. You asked me, with no context or greeting, what I saw when I looked in the Shuto. In the mirror. Marcel didn't finish the anecdote, instead tilting his head in consideration. At the time, the human answered, I a mouth, a nose, two eyes and ears. I'd be concerned, if that changed. Cars of my imagination evaporated with laughter. I felt guilty that I had been so preoccupied with his appearance in the beginning. The worry creases on his forehead aged him by a decade, as did the blemish of the scars on his cheek. By comparison, my friend's paralyzing gaze had been full of life, with that snarl he couldn't contain. I wanted to remember the humans as that optimistic race, affectionate and carefree. Whatever compromises our beloved predators had to make, I wouldn't let them change my perspective. I see a survivor swallowing my nerves, I propped myself over the railing. My grey fur was a matted mess, and my slender ears were pinned in terror. T2 of them, actually. Please, don't let the oxer eat me. He ruffled the stray tuft on my head. I'm scared too, buddy. I have nightmares about them eating that immobilized gojit, then eating you or Nulia. Is it wrong to admit that? No, but... Your F feelings are important too. You're just really good at acting strong. Key word, acting. An angular craft rocketed down from the cloud cover, and I squeezed my tail around the human's wrist. The curvature of the ship's belly suggested it was stocked with missiles. It was brimming with weaponry from every angle. The engine roared as it completed its atmospheric descent, following the Terran glide slope. The Akshur vessel slammed onto the open deck, and our personnel eyed it warily. There's a human sniper watching them from the mast. I wonder if the Greys noticed. Better hope my friends can react quicker than those demons can snap me in half. Paralyzing terror coursed through my bloodstream as dozens of Aksha lumbered out into the open. They lugged some supply crates onto the deck and waved for the humans to collect them. Terran personnel scurried over to sort through the offerings. I could see in the primate's eyes that they were concerned about opening up a cattle gift. One Aksha was directing the others, with the cracked skin around its eyes suggesting its age. Its nostrils flared with obvious hunger, entranced by the whiff of Venlil in the breeze. Ghastly reptilian eyes snapped my way, and yellowed teeth flared in a ferocious snarl. Why had Marcel's benign canines ever frightened me? The enemy commander began ambling toward us. It leaned forward as it walked, poised to drop into a primal lunge in a heartbeat. Its pupils were darker than the frigid side of Venlo Prime, and its drab scales glistened like obsidian. It's okay, Slainik. I'm right here. Marcel growled. My heart hammered so furiously that I swayed on my feet. The human caught me with steady hands. All thoughts were shutting down, like a hard reset to the noggin. Every conscious impulse screamed to propel myself into the ocean, but my brain signals weren't registering. I sank my claws into the human's forearm, whimpering like wounded prey. Tears flowed down my face dripping onto his pale skin. Marcel massaged my scruff and tried to stop me from shaking uncontrollably. His gentle touch wasn't enough to counter an Arxer, standing right across from me. How could we have ever considered such an abomination sapient? 
It was the spitting image of death itself. Nothing motivated it other than its appetite and its cruelty. Greetings, I'm going to assume you're in charge, since you have a Venlil attached. The Oxer's warm breath hit me on the cheek as it spoke in a reverberating roar. My name is Chief Hunter Isif. We understand this was the United Nations headquarters, so I decided to accompany this landing party. Marcel cleared his throat. What can I do for you? A faint sliver of awareness crept back in. I didn't understand why my human wouldn't point this monster toward the actual officers and far away from us. I wanted to study the vegetarian's expression, but I couldn't turn my eyes away from the Arxur. It hadn't stopped staring at me from the moment it approached. Requesting permission to set up emergency housing. I can have structures and basic amenities organized in a day, Isif barked. I don't think that'll be an issue, the red-haired human said. If you're aiding the search and rescue, would you come with me to a neighborhood called Meatwood? The people in those bunkers are a UN priority. Gladly, I'll pick several of my finest to accompany you. Oh... And tell your soldiers not to IT secrete in any human bodies. Cut it out. We don't eat each other, whatever the Federation told you. So why would any of us want to eat humans? The Chief Hunter's eyes lingered on me, the actualization of every nightmare I ever had. My spine pressed back against Marcel's chest, using his muscular form for support. Every muscle in my body felt weak as jelly, and my nerves were overstimulated, beyond salvaging. I wanted to crawl under a rock, and never show my face again. The Aksher sighed, slinking off with a swish of its tail. It conversed with some Terran personnel for a moment, then issued emphatic orders. Several greys filed into a human helicopter a strange aircraft that had twin blades on its roof. The racket stung my ears as the propeller revved to life. Okay. I don't expect you to come with me, Slane. Marcel released a forceful exhale and set me back on my paws, but getting to my family can't wait. I, ha I have to know. So you're hitching a ride with the ye child-eating predators... What will Nulia think if she's alive? I spat. You just said you have nightmares about those things devouring her. Using the Arksha will get me there quickest. I'm sorry. There's no line I won't cross. I have nothing to live for without them. What about me? I care about you. After what we've been through together... Don't make this about you, buddy. I get why Sovelin losing his family broke him now. If they're dead, so am I. Marcel, pee please, go home, Slanik. I hope you succeed in all your future aspirations. Thank you for giving a predator like me a chance. The red-haired human shouldered his rifle and duffel bag and limped over to the waiting helicopter. Those hazel eyes never so much as glanced back. His slender fingers were curled into a fist. Recollections of my predator, starving and beaten, darted through my mind. I could see those same hands pressed up against the glass as he reached out with the last of his strength. Anacel tried to protect me in his final moments too, through unimaginable pain. I can't let him throw his life away. I remembered how helpless I felt, watching the vegetarian held at gunpoint. The pain in his eyes had been like glass shards in my heart. The thought of never speaking to him again, and learning that the Arxer chopped him up into little pieces, it filled me with the same despair. How did my Terran friend expect me to abandon him to a senseless fate? 
Riding along on this suicide misadventure was out of the question though. Marcel wasn't engaged in proper thinking right now. He needed someone to drill some sense into him. Humans were significantly weaker than the Arxa, so he'd be helpless when they ambushed him. Damn you. I scampered after the hobbling human, who was only a few paces from the chopper. I nursed you back from death's door, went with you to a gojid warzone, and stayed here when we all thought your earth was going to be glass to the core. Marcel clambered up into the chopper. You've done enough. Go away, Slanik. Get lost. And go home, like none of this happened. I'm telling you, as your friend, not to do this. I need you safe and alive, and I don't care if that's making this about me. I bounded the last several steps, and hurled myself at the human's leg in desperation. My hind legs scrabbled for traction on the floor. I struggled with all my might to pull the bulky predator off the helicopter. Marcel panted and shook me off with a grunt. The Yorkshire passengers watched with amusement. The human set his supplies on an empty seat, adjacent to the cockpit. Chief Hunter, Ezif was ordering the Terran pilot he'd borrowed to take off. I had to get my friend out of here now. With panicked desperation, I yanked at his injured arm. Marcel could forgive me for the pain that caused later. It was the only way to mitigate his superior strength and save him from his own recklessness. Shit. He cursed. Gige, the fuck off of me. I, the vegetarian's eyes dilated with frustration and his cheeks turned that flushed shade of red that unnerved me. His teeth bared with obvious hostility, that was no human smile causing his jaw to tremble. I wasn't about to be scared away by growling, even if it made my throat go dry. He was never going to hurt me. Marcel pried my claws off of him with predatory strength, his typical gentleness was gone. I mewled in protest, but the human clenched his fingers into my scruff. He carried me toward the exit in cold silence, and seemed ready to toss me outside. My legs flailed about in desperation, but the struggling didn't have much effect. The helicopter rose the first few feet off the ground. Chief Hunter Izif retreated from the cockpit, and darted between Marcel and the exit. The Arkshire commander slid the door shut, sealing off the escape route for both of us. Its eyes widened in confusion as it noticed me dangling like a pup from the human's hands. Take a seat. There's room for you and the animal, it snarled. Pair the map overlay, this should be a short ride. The aircraft was ascending rapidly, now above the mast, in altitude. My heart sank in my chest compounded by sheer panic. Jumping from this height would be suicide, though it might be better than being turned into cattle. Not only had I failed to get Marcel away from these monsters, but I had ended up escapeless with him. The red-haired human adjusted his grip, bringing me into the normal carrying position. I burrowed my head against his shirt, and he patted me with a sigh. Isif watched with keen interest as the Terran settled into his chosen seat. The vegetarian placed my shaking body on his lap and turned my chin toward the window with a delicate push. I was certain the other Aksha were gaping at us and salivating at the flesh on my skeleton. That didn't lessen the dread in my heart. There was nothing worse than being trapped hundreds of feet above the ground with feral carnivores. The Nature of Predators, 58 Memory Transcription, Subject, 1L Space Course, Payday Standardized, Human Time, October 18th, 2136. The tension was palpable, as the Arkshire occupants studied Marcel in silence. I gathered that the human didn't want to engage with them either. 
The predatory savagery from the cradle plagued my recollection, and the chilling screams of the unfortunate Gojids echoed on loop. It would be all too easy for the Greys to gut either of us with the swipe of their fangs. Chief Hunter is if dropped into the seat right next to us, the monster was inches away from me. It disregarded the shift in Marcel's body language. The human had leaned away, though there wasn't anywhere to go in a helicopter cabin. I got the impression his concern was for me, rather than himself. After the attack on Earth, it's like he doesn't care what happens to him. If I wasn't about to be carved up, I'd insist he seek help. Key, is if bad its teeth ferociously. Well, I've introduced myself. What's your name, Venlo? Its voice was a discordant snarl, amplifying humanity's typical rumble by a thousandfold. A pathetic squeak escaped my throat, and I sobbed into Marcel's shirt. The vegetarian stroked my ear with patience, unfazed by the salty wetness soaking the fabric. I didn't know how even a persistence predator could be so calm in the face of such an eyesore. That scaly demon was sensory hell. I'd rather be hunted by Marcel's kind for hours than look at Izzy for another second. Okay. That was the response I expected, the Aksha sighed. What are you called, human? My human stiffened. Marcel Fraser, but just Marcel is fine. The Venlo here, his name is Slunik. I knew you hadn't lost your voice, Marcel. Slunik is here on Tava's behalf, yes? My ears perked up in alarm. How did Isif even know that name? That must mean the Aksha were targeting the governor, or had other nefarious plans for her. I refused to believe the humans would betray us by turning over intel on the Republic. Marcel offered a curt head shake. Zlanek is a fighter pilot. We're training him to be a proper soldier. Ha! Huh. Good one, as if this specimen could fight. Izif's eyes glittered with decadent mirth before the expression dissolved. Oh, prophet. You're serious, aren't you? The red-haired human glared at the floor, not answering the reptile. It was clear my friend had little interest in the conversation. I think he only entertained the first question to get the commander to leave me alone. The monstrous predator gave up and turned its focus to the window. Our helicopter drifted above a sea of rubble, which stretched to the horizon. Building husks lingered as statues to a fallen world, and fires were splashed across the landscape. The ground was covered in a thick coating of soot. This looked like the aftermath of an Arxer raid. My heart sank in my chest, as I realized how dire the outlook was for Marcel's family. The human pilot guided our craft toward the designated neighborhood. Chief Hunter, Izif craned its neck and narrowed its disgusting eyes with solemnness. I didn't understand what game it was playing, trying to make nice with the humans. They must have some dastardly plan at work. The Akshur commander maintained the brooding expression as we touched down. It ordered the other greys to sweep the area for survivors and accrue intel for their government. Marcel rose to his feet to follow them, but Isif blocked the human's path. The scaly monster gestured to the devastation behind it. What do you think of what the Federation did, Slane? The chief hunter growled. My ears laid flat against my skull. I T think it looks a lot like what you do. A sharp glint flashed in its eyes. Ah, that's a good answer. You think our species is an instrument of evil, yet you admit your friends are no different. The F Federation are monsters, dot not friends. But they don't eat people. Because they don't have to. 
You all want my kind wiped from existence. Hell, you probably wish I'd drop dead right now. Do you even see us as people? After everything you've done, you'll never be people to anyone. My sudden outburst took me by surprise. Marcel's fingers tensed around my scruff, and his stance shifted to a defensive posture. That commentary placed my human in a precarious situation. My money wasn't on the wounded, squishy primate if this turned physical. I should have never boarded this aircraft to begin with. The Aksha raised the ridges above its eyes and turned around with a sigh. As if somehow restrained its aggression, the pointed half emanated disappointment. It drew its sidearm before shuffling into the ruins of New York. Marcel followed with a bit of hesitancy. I'm sorry for what Slanik said, Chief Hunter. Any sapient is a person, no matter what they've done. Is that so, human? The reptile grumbled. Look, our race has become a shell of itself over the centuries. I wish it wasn't like this. My eyes widened in surprise. Polite concessions, lamenting their current status, wasn't what I expected it to say. For an emotionless predator, it was doing an, an excellent job at emulating regret. The fear eased enough for me to wonder what it had to gain from this act. The Aksha never attempted to converse with prey, as a rule. Why are you so cruel and merciless? The words spewed from my mouth in a rambling fervor. Why did you kill my brother and bomb my planet and eat people alive while they were running? Its nostrils flared. I... Yes, it's well documented that I did all those things personally. I'm a busy guy. I get around. Your species. D, don't mark me, demon. There's no good reason your breed are that cruel and morally deficient. The Federation are the reason we're starving. Cruelty was, and is a defense mechanism, in my view. I'm not excusing it. I'm answering your insult. Gary defense mechanism, don't they? Oh, how? Oh. How so? It was needed as a way to cope with what we had to do to survive. We're also fighting a war of extinction, while vastly outnumbered, so it serves psychological purposes to encourage recorded sadism. The Federation loses because they're afraid. The Aksha crested a mountain of rubble, and Marcel escorted us atop the debris too. One human was crawling through the street, with serious burns across her extremities. Her breathing came in ragged gasps, and the sight of peeling flesh made me wince. Two Zerulian medics had arrived on the scene already. The Americans must have directed them to a separate landing site from the Greys. A young volunteer rushed to the burn victim's side, repeating soothing words. The other quadruped kept a wide berth from the aggrieved human and trembled in terror. Willen... I need a dose of painkillers and antiseptics now, the youthful Zerulian chimed in. Willen flicked his ears in skepticism. We know nothing about these predators, other than that the Warkshire like them. Our government has gone mad, Fraser. I can't get close to this thing. Ezif's scowl intensified. The hunter gripped its sidearm with malicious intent. Rich hunger danced in its gaze, and it shared an enraged glance with Marcel. For once, I agreed with the monster. We couldn't let the medics dilly-dally with an agonized human. Fraser rounded on her partner. What we know is the humans haven't done me anything wrong. They sought peace and were brutally attacked for it. Also, the Vendelin, our ambassador adore them. But they're predators. I'm here for the Venal. No. 
We don't play God and pick and choose who we help. We save lives indiscriminately. Get with that, or get the fuck out of my sight. The injured human watched with glassy eyes. Willen lowered his head, before crouching at Frace's side. He began applying wet dressings and antiseptics, while his partner tended to the pain. The Zerulians then prepped a transport to their hospital ship. Izif lowered its gun, and watched as the quadrupeds strained to lift the human. The Aksha marched down to the site, swishing its tail in a display of dominance. The Zerulians dropped the patient when they saw the grey skulking toward them. I was worried the abomination had regained its appetite too. Maybe it likes charred flesh, like Tyler did. It could see the Terran burn victim as the perfect meal, oh stars. Guy, the chief hunter lifted the primate onto the gurney and fastened the straps in seconds. It backed away and growled to get the medic's attention. Fraser was wielding a syringe in her mouth, pointing it as if a shot of painkillers would stop the murderous demon. Stay back. The female Zerulian quivered and seemed aghast at the sight of my human behind the grey. Human and Venlil, please. Help us. It's kidnapping my patient. I'm not kidnapping the human. I put her on the stretcher so you can move her for evac, Isif growled. If I was hostile, trust me, you would know. I'm subtle as a sledgehammer. Marcel trundled up beside the Arxer. The last Federation physician I met wanted me dissected. Our doctors pledged to do no harm. It's a relief to see someone mirror the sentiment of the Hippocratic Oath. Willen squinted at the vegetarian. You're that human named Marcel from Noah's video. I recognize you. Shit, Fraser squeaked. I'm sorry for what they did to you. Your treatment Dubby went against every, um, ethical principle. The chief hunter inspected the red-haired human with confused eyes. The demonic predator mouthed the name, Noah, to itself, and noted something on its holopath. I think it wanted to ask what happened to my friend. Obviously, a feral animal that loathed weakness would mock his traumatic experience. Marcel pointed a hand to the stretcher. The Zerulian sidled up to the patient hesitantly. The medics shuffled in a terrified stupor, and our oddball group traversed the ruins. It was sad to see Earth like this, having witnessed this city in its sprawling glory days ago. It took several minutes to reach the Zerulian hospital ship, which was hovering over a decimated roadway. We glimpsed rows of beds in its loading bay, and my human's eyes widened with hope. Panic shouts echoed from the ship's occupants at the reptile sighting. The chief hunter ducked its head, perhaps to seem less threatening. The Akshar pulled away, and more Zerulian medics hurried over to lug the patient on board. Fraser and Wylan bore delirious eyes, which suggested the fear was overstimulating them. That little excursion must have been psychological torment to them. Have you rescued a gorgeous child, hopefully with a human female? My human growled, Willem blinked. What? Oh, gorgeous. You know, spiky, brown furred, big claws. Where is she? The Zerulians cowered at Marcel's roar, and their hackle fur stood on end. I swatted my tail at his chin warning him to calm down. His desperation was something I recognized, but these medics didn't understand humans yet. They probably thought he was about to go on a rampage. Mark is very upset and loud, but he's harmless, I hissed. Please, just tell us if you've seen a gojit. Fraser drew a shaky breath. 
No. God. <sighs> Only humans here. I can check with our groups in the other cities, Wylan added hurriedly. Maybe Berlin, Toronto, Bangkok, or Manila. Be big predator dwellings there. Marcel slumped his shoulders in defeat. No. They were here. They... Oh, I see. Understanding flashed in Isif's pupils. Why don't we search for your packmates at their last location? These Zerulians could help us look around. The human nodded, blinking away tears. The Arkshire focused on his watery eyes and gave him a rough tail slap on the arm. If I didn't know better, I would think it was a poor attempt at comfort. A species devoid of empathy was mimicking the trait, of course. Isif was clearly awkward and unpracticed at that falsified aspect. Fraser's gaze softened, and she shared a glance with her partner. We'll help you search. But I prepare for the likeliest possibility. As a predator, you should be logical about the situation. Willen, he clearly grasps the extent of the dead. There's nothing logical about this. Where are we going, Marcel? The red-haired primate browsed his holopad and searched for a location via GPS. The local terrain was unrecognizable, so I doubted he could distinguish Nulia's bunker from any other scrap heap. The device pinpointed a location a quarter mile from the hospital ship. All I could see there was a thick hill of concrete. Anything living must be crushed beneath that. It's likely the bunker collapsed from the pressure. I Marcel could barely put pressure on his injured leg, but he staggered ahead for the minutes-long trek. I could feel the human's grief expanding with every step. My predator was cracking right alongside the buildings of New York. It hurt to see my friend who I believed could withstand any emotion, crumbling. His distress frightened me as much as the hideous arcs were flanking us. Marcel reached the selected debris mound, and I dismounted onto my own paws. This must be the fallout shelter his family relocated to. The human hurled himself on all fours, flinging the smallest rocks behind him in a frenzy. An animalistic grunt reverberated from his chest as he strained against his arm injury to tug a massive rock chunk. Chief Hunter Isif pressed its shoulder against the debris and moved it enough to leave a tiny gap. Marcel pawed at the scraps below, trying to catch a glimpse of the shelter. He dug furiously with his flimsy fingers. Blood streamed from his dust-caked nails, but that only quickened his scrabbling. Lucy. Nolia? He wailed, in the highest pitched voice I'd heard him use. There was no reply from beneath the ruins. Through choking sobs, my friend returned to parsing rocks with his hands. His fingers were drenched in crimson fluid. Sympathy clasped my heart with a vice-like grip, and I tackled him in a desperate hug. Mark, Stop it. You're hurting yourself, I pleaded. Fraser placed a cautious paw on his neck. That's enough. We'll excavate the bodies and make sure they get a proper burial by your customs. I promise. The human collapsed atop the wreckage and pressed an eye against the opening. He screamed incoherently punching the rubble in outrage. I watched the life leave his sweet countenance, even the gushing tears dried up. My friend was unresponsive to any prodding. Wylan dabbed at his eyes, affected by the extent of the predator's raw emotions. I recognized that realization as he decided humans were sapient. Anyone who saw this display as a performance had to be heartless. There must be countless others across Earth in such a state. I nuzzled his leg. 
Step aside and rest, please. Let the doctors disinfect your wounds. Why? My human croaked. They've taken everything. Oh, Slamek, put me out of my maze, Mossel. A childish voice cried, faintly audible. Where have you been? It's really dark down here, and I don't like the dark. Marcel's head snapped up. You're alive? I'm coming, darling. Just hold on. We're working as fast as we can. But I want to go somewhere safe now. Somewhere monsters won't find me or pick on your eyes. Don't leave me here, Mousy. Never. I'm right here. A chorus of human growls joined Nulia as they realized rescuers were above. Relief coursed through my veins. Against all odds, some of the bunker withstood the blast. Chief Hunter Ezef Radio to send heavy machinery to our coordinate, and withdrew with a fierce snarl. Untrustworthy as it was, I couldn't deny it had been helpful so far. Amidst the chaos and devastation on Earth, it was a relief to save a few human lives from the ashes. The Nature of Predators 59 Memory Transcription Subject Oh, 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 Captain Sovlin Federation Fleet Command Date Was Standardized Human Time October 20th 2136 the United Nations had only scratched the surface of species in the Federation, having meaningful interactions with a small percentage. The Krakotl and Farsal received the most fanfare in the Anti-Predator Coalition, but 24 total species had participated in Earth's attack. Of those, 17 committed only a minority of their forces. One of those was the Harchen, a reptile species famed for their natural camouflage. The waddling prey bipeds were half a human's height and could morph their skin into a multitude of alluring colors. Their species was a stellar average in most fields, notable for a few media franchises and software startups. Thus, all they had in common with the Arkshire was animal class. My decision to wander into Harchin territory looked dicey though, in an obvious Venlo ship. Given their hostile relations with Earth, I doubted they'd welcome us with open arms. That was why I weaponized the human stealth tactics to remain hidden. Their cunning strategies, deployed against Gojit border outposts long ago, had become useful in ironic fashion. Our ship lacked between high gravity spots until we lurked behind a satellite of the blissful modernity. It was a wealthy colony, which housed media conglomerates and tech companies. Most importantly, it was the home of an investigative reporter I wanted to recruit. Her stories were hard-hitting, and she was steadfast to the facts, whatever they may be. Why are we here, Sovlin? The deaf Talpin demanded through his synthesizer. You are escaping with the Harchin, a Terran enemy. You still want to kill the humans for being predators? Berna, his sister, flicked her claws. Countless people died on Earth, you monster. How can you turn your back on them? I'm going to pick up a journalist named Silene, who I trust, in the shuttle, I replied. You're going to wait here, where no one can see you. In and out. Then we head to Arthur. This Silene must have an interest in protecting her planet. Her species is hostiling to the humans, the female Gojit returned. There are other journalists in the galaxy, hell, thousands on Alpha. We don't need an enemy. The media figures who can be impartial to humans are few. Selene's the one who exposed the Civ Kits for turning away millions of refugees a year and dissected their unsustainable colonizing practices. Though, it was outing the Karkotl military 
for prolific extortion that got her famous. How does any of that connect her to you? Because I was the anonymous source for both stories. Gunboat diplomacy wouldn't retrieve intelligence, whatever my own guards had thought. Berna and Tolpine objected to my plan, but they were missing the big picture of our Kolshin excursion. Mouthpieces were little good without the means to spread their message around. Besides, investigating the Federation was something that mandated professional assistance. Sensors indicated a large ship presence around the Iblis for modernity. Perhaps the Harchin anticipating a human counterattack. Scanning for subspace readings or life signs wasn't an option in our precarious stealth mode. The situation would be clearer once I got a visual. The escape pod was cramped on the inside, but I wriggled through the emergency hatch nonetheless. My hope was that this Venlo-sized four-seater would escape detection. Care you go, Sovlin. Fly through a waiting armada, and then... You have to get back up here, too. This was a remarkably bad idea. Hi, my surroundings became visible on the viewport, as I coasted out from behind a solar station. The Harchin colony glistened a dusty brown and lacked any signs of native vegetation. Hundreds of warships were centered around the planet, which set alarm bells off in my head. The prey reptiles never had this many heavy craft on standby for a minor colony. After fiddling with the buttons, I magnified an orbiting warship on the screen. The breath was sucked from my lungs. That clunky, explosive-laden death machine was an Oxer bomber, and it was surrounded by many brethren. It wasn't being challenged by any Harchin vessels, despite the fact that most of their fleet stayed at home. Had the Harchin's involvement in the attack on Earth left their colonies vulnerable? Perhaps they had to ration their defenses to the most populated areas without complete numbers. It was also possible, local coordination was too poor to resist a full-fledged assault. Regardless, something must have caught the Grey's eyes. The emergency channel crackled to life when I switched on the radio. Requesting immediate assistance from any Harchin vessels in the vicinity. Harchin Command, do you copy? Our evacuation ships are being slaughtered. There was a brief pause before a tourist reply came through. We can't divert assets from Fall. The Arkshire are trying to lure us away from the homeworld since their head-on approach failed. I'm sorry. B, but... You can't just leave us here. Send a few ships to cover evacuation, please. Blissful modernity, you're not the priority. I suggest you broadcast the chant of remembrance planet-wide to secure your passage to the afterlife. Good luck. The chant of remembrance was a traditional folk song that the Harchin used as a last rite. That was one way of saying that the entire colony was going to be sacrificed. If I attempted to land on the surface, I might get blown out of the sky or gunned down on foot by the Arxer. Worse yet, I could be herded onto a cattle ship. Overall, this was becoming a worse idea by the second. Banna and Talpin could be spotted in the main ship at any moment or be left without a pilot to complete the journey. The humans needed our testimony to reach the Federation. The fate of the galaxy hinged on the reception of my plea. But if I was ever a good captain, I had to try to rescue an old friend from the Arxer incursion. What kind of man stood idly by as innocent civilians were butchered? The Harchin people didn't deserve this, however complicit their government was in Earth's bombing. I wondered if the Terrans still understood that. You just land by the iBlissful Network's office, run in, rescue Selene, and take off, I told myself. This will be fine. Nobody will notice a tiny escape pod amidst an orbital bombardment. I plotted a descent course for the address. My shuttle snuck past the greys, 
as they focused on decimating the landmass. Aksha looked for visuals of escape craft from the surface, not suicidal rescuers. They probably relied on sensor data too. Our stealthy approach gave me a chance to land, but the return trip was another matter. The shuttle blazed into the thin atmosphere, rattling from the external force, fiery missiles streaked down alongside me. They were a relentless barrage meant to inflict high casualties. The people on the ground knew that it was raining death, and their escape chances were close to none. Would the humans come to the rescue, if they were here? I asked myself. Kazamantha spoke like she wanted this to happen, but I can't believe she truly meant that purge line. A arch and ground enlarged on the screen, with a smoky mist fogging the air. Precise explosions targeted a few city blocks, smiting residential areas and infrastructure. The Arkshire wanted to flush any civilians from their homes, so the cattle collectors would have an easy time. It was a page out of a playbook we'd seen many times. Landing complete. Initiating shutdown sequence, my pod's computer announced. I scrambled out of the shuttle, gun in pause. The polluted oxygen sent me into a coughing fit, and my eyes watered. Mushroom clouds dotted the horizon like treetops. The sole relief was that there were no lanky Aksha silhouettes in the vicinity, although I could hear gruesome screams in the distance. The press building was still intact, and that was a positive sign in itself. Stampeding wasn't a viable instinct when bombs were going off on every corner. The runners were likely half-eaten corpses by now, but some people must have sheltered in place. I had to hope my reporter friend was one of them. Autopilot kicked in as I sprinted up the emergency stairwell. There were no signs of footsteps, electricity, or chatter. My prayer was that the Arkshire hadn't swept this building already. I doubled over once I stumbled onto the third floor. The steep ascent left me winded. Terrified screams followed my entry. Don't eat us. We're... Uh, Reptiles like, oh. Silani gasped. Sovlin? What the hell are you doing here? My gaze swept the room. There were four Harchin reporters hiding under desks, quivering in terror. One was holding a seat cushion over his throat, as if that would protect him from an arxer's teeth. I relaxed my gun and gestured toward the stairwell door. No time. Come with me. I parked the shuttle outside. You can all fit if you squeeze together, I growled. Silani blinked in confusion. Not so fast. We've heard you're a human prisoner, and that you were mentally unstable before. Why and how long are you here? I won't be a predator's test subject. The humans sent me to Alpha as a messenger, and you can see I'm in good condition. I need your help. You'll have every opportunity to stay with the Colchians. Prove you're not re-educated, Sovlin. They could have turned you into a mindless minion. Doing their bidding, advancing their agenda. The other Harchin reporters watched with apprehension, though they inched toward the exit. I respected that Silani hadn't changed her skeptical ways, but these questions were wasting time. She was too inquisitive for her own good. From the tone of her rhetoric, I wondered if she had bought into the anti-human propaganda. Their sickening eyes made my spines bristle for days. I thought the humans would torture me and lay waste to any civilization they cross paths with. I chewed my claws with impatience. I believed every empathetic act they did had an ulterior motive. I wanted them all dead. And I remember it all, unlike a brainwashed individual. Silani climbed to her feet. So why would we help humans send a message? After what they did to us. 
what they did to you. You attacked their home unprovoked. It's the Arcs you're attacking you now. They're not affiliated. This is a coordinated bombardment against every species in our coalition. At least, those that we can make contact with. Someone yearning to tip the greys off days ago. Are you sure about that unaffiliated claim, Sovlin? Shock coursed through my veins. The other coalition members were under siege too. A specific attack against the races who targeted Earth led to some dark conclusions. If these raids weren't spontaneous acts of violence, then maybe the Gojit Cradle. No. The humans were kind to non-combatants on the Cradle, imperiling their own lives for our welfare. Terran rules of warfare disallowed attacks against civilians. Those soldiers fought tooth and nail to protect our cities and cared for our refugees with the utmost kindness. I couldn't believe that they would set such a plan in motion. But who else would have contacted the Greys? Keenans were very interested in negotiating with the Oxa during that last interrogation. It's possible they reached out. I decided. Protector help us if they jumped sides out of desperation. E. Silani shuddered. You know the Terrans talk to the Greys. I can see it in your eyes. The humans were pursuing diplomatic avenues, but they also despised what the Arxer did to our worlds. It has to be an accident if they shared this, I sighed. All I care about is the honest truth and you might not like what that truth is. I can't help you spread human deceit. Not even to save my life. This isn't about humans, silly. I'm here because the Federation are killing each other over how they voted. It's going to doom us all. Just please, come with me now and take a look at the facts. That's it. Fear shone in the female Harchin's eyes momentarily, and her skin morphed into the beige shade of the walls. I took that as a sign that she was camouflaging to head out. The other staffers had no qualms scampering down the stairwell ahead of me. They'd take their chances with an unstable, predator-tainted Gojid over an Arxa slaughter fleet. Terrified shrieks echoed from the first Harch and staffers to exit the building. They turned back, tripping in their haste back up the stairwell. I gestured for them to quiet down and raised my gun. There must be an Arksha cattle squad or an Eaton Harchin in sight, which meant we needed to depart quickly. Horror brought my spines to full bristle as I saw five greys leaning against the escape pod. The vicious predators were waiting for the prey to wander into their grasp. My stationary shuttle must have been sighted along their route. The hunters seemed delighted by the unexpected appearance of a gojid. I suppose that was a rare meal, post-cradle. There was no way I could shoot all of them, especially with their superior reflexes. Running was impossible too, since my shuttle was our ticket off this rock. Had I just brought the Harchin to their deaths? My brain froze in terror for a split second, sealing my fate. One Arxer pounced from all fours and dragged me by the arm out into the open. Saliva coated my fur in a sticky dousing as its monstrous fangs pierced my skin. My initiative for the humans was going to end with me as a predator's meal. The Nature of Predators, 60 Memory Transcription Subject, Newgate's Captain Sovlin, Federation Fleet Command State U Standardized Human Time, October 20th, 2136, the feeling of teeth in my shoulder produced a sharp pain. The joint was about ripped from the socket as I was dragged across the asphalt. I wriggled in the Predator's jaws, punching its snout to release its grip. The stabbing of my long claws drew blood, 
and it tossed me onto the ground with a shake of its head. My body slammed against our metallic shuttle. All I could see was stars. The pounding of my heart was a nauseating experience. This must be what my family felt as they were toyed with before being turned into a screaming meal. I couldn't give these Oxshire cattle fiends the satisfaction of screaming or crying. Maybe it was worth some sort of plea to get them to spare the Harchin. The sole option that crossed my mind was to invoke the humans. They were the only ones the Greys had a remote respect for. If the primates had directed the Oxshire Dominion to this vulnerable civilian populace, perhaps they would abandon anything the Terrans allegedly claimed. S stop. I squealed. I'm a human slave on a mission to expose T the Federation's lies. When they killed your sea cattle like you say, they want, want to get T the details for you. To my amazement, the Grey paused in its stalking position. The humans did claim the Gojid homeworld, and we recognized their stake. I can smell them on your fur. But where are our fellow predators if you're their property? They wouldn't set you free. T, they have my family, I sobbed with fake despondency. I'll do whatever they want, even if it's harmful to the Federation. Confusion flashed in Silene's eyes. The Harchin reporter knew my family was long deceased, so that lie wouldn't fool her. I didn't understand why the prey reptiles hadn't made a run for it yet. There were no good options, but stalling the Arxer gave them a small window of escape. The bloodied predator flashed a snarl, clever. But why are you on this world? With those who attacked Earth? These Harchin are P priority assets for the humans. I don't ask questions. But I'm sure it's for a good reason. Let us leave, please. The Greys conferred for a moment and inspected a smoking section of the shuttle hood. I couldn't believe they were listening to any of my bullshit. There was a brief flicker of hope that we might fall under Terran immunity. Plopping myself upright, I nursed the wounded arm with a ginger touch. Talking to them is revolting. But the Arxer just confirmed that this assault is retaliation for Earth. Selene was right. What have the humans done? I will let you leave as a token of good faith, slave. We mangled your engine though, so you'll need to find another way off world, the Arxer spokesmonster decided. But the Harchen stay. I think you are disobeying your orders to save our enemies. The prey reptiles scampered back into the stairwell, only to find themselves blocked by a laughing grey. A single beast must have landed on the roof, cutting off any escape. They intended to flush the Archon out into the street, one way or another. My eyes widened in horror as the greys herded them into a cage. Stop. T, the humans want these four as media tools, really, I pleaded. The vicious predator snorted. The humans want all of them dead. On that matter, it just so happens our interests align. I wondered whether the Terrans would enjoy the sight of the panicked Harchin reporters, sealed together in a degrading heap. My imprisoners would despise this raid, wouldn't they? The cage door slammed shut, and the ark suggested for me to scurry off. It would be easy to save myself, but I couldn't watch cattle be hauled away. My gaze darted over to my gun, which had fallen into the dirt. Odds were, I could only get off a shot or two before the greys mowed me down with prejudice. I had to try something to rescue these Harchin, no matter how suicidal. It was a matter of waiting for the Arxer to lose focus, and accepting that I, I was about to die. Is there a... a problem? 
a throaty snarl echoed from my right. Carlos stomped across the road, clad head to toe in protective pelts. A flashlight was mounted to his helmet, and his binocular eyes hid behind a glass visor. A massive gun rested across his muscular forearm. I was never so elated to see a flesh-eating predator in my life. But what the hell is my guard doing here? I don't even know that he won't leave the harch into their fate. Or worse, laugh about it. Tiny human stopped a few paces from the Archer posse and crossed his arms in a formidable stance. The talkative Grey, who must be the unit leader, sized up the omnivore. It narrowed its eyes with blazing ferocity, challenging Carlos's will. I didn't know how the UN soldier faced that stare. The reptilian predator bared its fangs. Your slave wants to help these Harchin escape. It is using its subjugation as a cover, claiming this is done on your orders. Carlos' pupils flicked to the cramped cage. You heard Sovlin and his true orders correctly. He's an obedient servant. We want to send a message to the Federation, and these are the right individuals for the job. Simple. A relieved sigh escaped my lips. I was grateful that the human backed me up after I deviated our flight path to recruit Terran enemies. He might take these hearts in prisoner, or even execute them, but he wouldn't eat them. His kind wasn't like the Greys. At worst, I could reason with him and make sense of the questionable things he might do. Why can't you find another... pet? The Grey hissed. We did all the work and we claimed this batch. These prey are of no particular importance, no different than thousands like them, with the same qualifications. Carlos shuffled closer. Our personnel selections are made off of data, simulations, and the best strategic minds on Earth. Are you questioning our judgment? Yes. I am. Say it again, you fucking coward. I'm questioning the judgment of weak, naive, primitives. You haven't a clue what you're doing, or what it means to survive in this galaxy. The human rose up on his toes, and pressed his slender nose inches from the ox's maw. The grey straightened, as Carlos tried to match its height. It breathed a deafening snarl at the Yuan soldier, but he wouldn't back down. Defiance glowed in the primate's eyes, despite being outclassed. I could snap your puny neck with a single bite. The Aksha roared. Carlos jabbed his gun barrel into its stomach. And I could blow your intestines apart with a single finger. But we're on the same side, so why don't we work this out another way? Hmm... Payon... Eita... Ah... Is... A contest of strength. You fight me one on one, without those overcompensating weapons of yours. If you win, you can have these Harchen. I'm game, if you'll agree not to bite. Unless you think you're too weak to fight without overcompensating fangs? Oh, uh, let's do this. I'm going to beat the snot out of you, human. The Terran soldier backed away and tucked his rifle off to the side. He raised his clawless paws in front of his face, forming white-knuckled fists. What was to stop the Grey from executing him, now that he was disarmed? Luckily for Carlos, it was itching to release its aggression. The Arksha lunged at the human with a blunt swipe, which was barely dodged. It lashed out with a tail sweep, knocking the guard off his feet. The monster whirled around with quick jabs, which the primate blocked with an elbow. 
Carlos rolled out of the way and scrambled back to a standing position. He looked slow and toothless compared to the reptilian, not managing a single swing of his own. Carlos scurried backward and tried to deflect the oncoming barrage. Sweat glistened on his olive skin. Tears showed in his artificial pelts. The archer aimed a jab at his abdomen, but the human danced away on nimble feet. While he was focused on the claws, it swung its snout at him with force. The truncated maw nailed the guard right in the chest and sent him flying backward. He, poor guy, is getting his ass handed to him. Why did he think this was a good idea to negotiate? Damn humans and their aggression. Carlos sucked in a wheezing breath, but hopped back to his paws. The gray charged at him once more, and the human pummeled it in the nostrils. It shrugged off the punch with a snort. The UN guard attempted to deliver a kick, but the reptilian caught his frail leg. It snickered as the human flailed, hopping on one leg. This isn't even a fight. The Aksha tugged the primate's ankle and knocked him onto his rump. It dragged him through the dirt for several paces. We may treat you like equals, but you don't make demands of us. You don't intimidate anyone. Carlos kicked its clasped paw with his other leg, wriggling free. You haven't beaten? Stay down, weakling. I've kicked the shit out of you. Know when to admit defeat. Basic humility would do you good. The human began to rise, only to be nailed across the mouth by a tail lash. Crimson blood bubbled on his lip, and he spit the liquid into the dirt. He rolled onto his back, watching as the Arxer gloated in its victory. His hand darted to his head, wrenching the flashlight off his headgear. He shone it inches from its left pupil. The archer shrieked as the brightness flooded its gaze, blinking. Carlos popped back up on wobbly legs and staggered in grappling range. The human drove his knee into its stomach before tackling it with all of his weight. He rolled off to the side and wrapped an elbow around its neck. The grey struggled to break loose, but its oxygen supply was dwindling. Game, set, and match. Tap out, Carlos gurgled. The grey palmed at the human's elbow with feeble swats, its hideous eyes bulging. Carlos released his grip with a toothy snarl. It coughed several times, caressing its throat. The creature struggled to get back to its feet and the Terran helped it stand. You cheated, it sputtered. No weapons. The UN guard shrugged. I didn't use a weapon. Just an illumination device. You broke the spirit of our sparring, which is cheating to my eyes. You show little respect to your allies, and you're lucky I like irreverence. Take the damn Harchin, it's a whopping four cattle. The Aksha slunk off with narrowed gazes as their leader hobbled away. True to their word, the demons left the Harchin's cage behind. The relief that flooded my veins was indescribable, though my hammering heart wouldn't pipe down. I raced over to the human and flung my arms around him with choking sobs. Carlos stiffened and pulled my paws off him. Uh, yeah. Don't do that, man. Eh, sorry, I'm just really grateful for your help, I muttered. What are you doing here? Keeping an eye on you, obviously. We were concerned about your little pit stop and followed you down here. I would appreciate if you'd not go around calling yourself a slave in the future. It was improvisation. Can't argue with results. Speaking of improvisation, you put the whole mission at risk with this little stunt. 
the fuck were you thinking? It was supposed to be a brief, easy trip. I wanted someone I knew, a friend, on the team. I've dealt with enough people who hate me in recent weeks. Whatever. Let's get your friends out of there. Hope they understand we're the only ride out. If they run off, I'm not going to stop the greys from nabbing them next time. The human unclasped the cage door and watched as the Harchin tumbled out. Selene inspected the predator with petrified eyes. Her comrades seemed repulsed by Carlo's lumbering form too, squealing as they returned his stare. The journalist's eyes darted to the side, as though they wanted to run. Did you tell the Arxor to attack us? Selene blurted. Carlos narrowed his eyes. I don't know, that's above my clearance level. If we did, it was likely to deter your forces from attacking us. The UN wouldn't want this to happen. I slumped my shoulders. Not even people like Samantha? Wouldn't she want the Harchin to feel the same losses as Earth? An indignant cough came from an abandoned vehicle behind us. Upon closer inspection, the female human was stretched out behind cover. A thin rifle barrel with a glass ornament was propped on the ground. She must have been monitoring the interaction the entire time and watching Carlos's back in case his confrontation went awry. I don't believe people deserve to die for what they are. That's the Federation, she growled. If an individual renounces their government, I'm sure Earth would welcome them with open arms. Now the ones responsible, complicit, or indifferent, Carlos cleared his throat. We parked a few blocks away. Somewhere, we wouldn't be visible to the whole world, E. so in. Get close, guys, and follow us. The human retraced his route with delicate bootsteps. His rifle was ready if any Arxer crawled out of the woodwork, and Samantha fell in at his side. The Predator guards forged the path for the Harchin journalists, ignoring their hesitance. It was remarkable to see the vengeful primates, aiding a species that partook in the attack days prior. The Nature of Predator 61 Memory Transcription Subject IAKL Captain Sovlin Federation Fleet Command Dateized E Standardized Human Time October 20th, 2000 136 bombs continued to crater the industrial city as we wandered through back the alleyways. I tried to place myself in the human's mindset. It was brave, remarkably so, to wander this Harchin colony, sporting a predatory appearance. Any frazzled prey soldiers would be happy to take a pot shot at an invading flesh eater, not differentiating the primates from the Arxer. The truth was, I knew so little about Samantha and Carlos as people. What compelled them to land amidst an orbital bombardment on a world that bore nothing but hostile intent? Whether they assumed I was a fugitive or not, the Terran guards had no idea what awaited them here. They had no backup and were outnumbered. Kerhach and government thinks humans are a blight to be mopped up. If extermination officers here got their toes on them, well, it might make my treatment of Marcel look like summer camp. Footsteps scurried ahead of us, with no way of telling if the source was Arxer or Archon. Yet the primates showed no signs of distress, plodding along their intended path in silence. I was stunned that Samantha hadn't berated the journalists for their species' actions. She'd been all too quick to lose her temper with me. Don't do anything to draw attention to yourselves. Carlos wiggled ahead on his stomach, the stealthy movements of a hunter inching up on prey. A hutch and patrol of seven or so with, uh, flamethrowers? In metallic suits. Shit, looks like they have thermal cameras. 
my eyes narrowed. Extermination officers. Great. And they're gonna see us as soon as they look this way. The male guard huffed. The Harchin journalist's expression seemed torn between excitement and trepidation. No doubt they were second-guessing the decision to escape with the humans. They just figured it was their only chance. I don't think they'd shed any tears over seeing my guards burn to a crisp, even if the predators saved their lives. What's with the flamethrowers? Samantha growled. I chewed at my claws. You don't want to know. The humans signaled a course to flank the exterminators with their hands, and crept ahead. We peeked out behind the wall, just in time to see an Arxa death squad charging the Harchin. The prey reptiles crept back from the rabid beasts, and lured them forward. Gasoline spurted from the lampposts at their queue, the built-in predator deterrent for our settlements. The oncoming Arkshire were doused head to toe and paused with alarm. The Harchin exterminators flung a match in the gas, spared from the effect by the flame-proof garments. The screams were on another level. Happiness fluttered in my heart, finally seeing the greys taste a bit of suffering. That was the agonized death these cattle collectors deserved. That was what I wished I could dole out to them for years. Carlos and Samantha looked horrified, however, watching the burning oxer flail about. I guess I couldn't blame them, since that was what the officers would do to their kind too. The Harchin exterminators chased the greys with flamethrowers, and steered them away from any source of water. My heart twisted as I thought about them putting the humans down like normal predators. Well, now I see what the flamethrowers are for, the female guard sighed. Must you burn predators at the stake? It's the worst way to die. I tossed my head in a non-committal gesture. It cleanses the affected area. Not just of any offspring or other dens, but also any traces of their filth. I don't want to step in fecal matter that used to be an animal. No offense. Silani nodded in agreement. What if your traces and fluids get in the water supply, or half-eaten carcasses you leave behind attract more predators? Gross. You, as in humans? Samantha hissed. God forbid you might inhale some predator molecules on the wind. Carlos and I should be put down at once. The male human pursed his lips, leaning back against a wall. Sadness glowed in his eyes as he listened to the conversation, and I don't think he had the words to express it. For the first time in my life, I thought about whether animals deserved agonizing deaths. Why couldn't we put a bullet in the ones we saw, and ick then torch them? Terran presence was a contaminating factor. By technicality, I could only imagine the reactions of Venlil extermination officers. Nothing ill-fated had come from me breathing the same air as predators, or eating plants grown in infested earth soil. Our species had survived in Eris, where hunters left their excretions in the landscape, inhabiting every corner of our planet. Humans have shown us a different side of nature, even if some of it is disgusting. Suffering for what they were born as is wrong. I'm sorry, Carlos. Your life has no value to them, and they'll have no qualms about killing you, I said. That said, I didn't mean that you are filth. I mean you need to shower, but... He snorted. You're an asshole. And you're a sweaty, bloody mess of a predator. If they could burn off just those grimy pelts and that outer skin part, that might be okay. The human flashed his teeth, and I hoped that was the friendly version of their snarl. Perhaps, this wasn't the safest choice for cheering him up. But from what I'd seen, 
teasing was good for their mental state. If I had misread those cues, the guard might be socking me in the jaw in a second. My spines bristled with unease. Terran behavior sure was an elusive concept to gauge. Selene gaped in alarm at the sight of the predator's fangs on display. She seemed concerned for my safety, especially after I riled up the primate. The Harchin shriveled away in disgust as he wiped the sweat off his neck with a towel. The male human wrapped a grimy rag around my neck, chuckling at my mortified expression. He looked pleased with himself. Sometimes, I almost like you, Sovlin, Carlos growled. Okay, we have to get across the square. Let's take these fuckers out, and don't walk under any street lamps. My reporter friend shared a glance with her colleagues. You're killing them? I'm sorry, are we supposed to let them fry us alive? Move out, and keep to cover. The human soldiers lined up their rifles, and marched out as a pair. The Harchin exterminators hadn't heard our chatter over the Arkshur screams. They were leaving no chances of a grey living to fight another day. One officer was waddling toward us, pursuing a blackened cattle soldier that had collapsed on the street. Her head snapped up as she spotted our heat signatures and she pointed at us. More predators. Humans, with hostages, she spat. Light them up. Carlos cleared his throat. Shit, there's no cover. Uh, maybe we can use you all as bargaining chips? Just pretend, of course. They won't shoot us with you leading, surely. Oh, they'll nail us too if they can't free us. Better dead than to be your cattle, I sighed. Though I imagine our deaths will be quicker. Samantha rolled her eyes. Yes, Trion sapiens don't deserve to burn alive. But predators don't feel anything, right? We were destined to be firewood. It's just perfect. Well, I for one like you guys not exterminated. So hurry up and find a hiding spot. Try the buildings. Carlos attempted to kick down an apartment door, but couldn't get the metal base to budge. He took a running start at the frame and fell back with frustration. Samantha fired several bursts at the Harch and exterminators, covering for her partner. The enemy responded with their sidearms, while lighting the street ablaze in all directions. The Terran male glanced for another entry, before gesturing to retreat to the alleyway. The two humans ducked back into cover, their heavy breathing unpleasant to the ear. The Harchin journalists ran away from the confrontation. I chased after them with frustration. Thinking quickly, I wrestled the gun out of a burned oxer's paws. Get the fuck back here! I fired several shots at a balcony just above their heads, and watched as those four dropped to the floor in unison. We need to get off this world, before the cattle squads finish up shop, or we're all fucking dead. Silene raised her limbs. Exactly. Sovlin, that area is on fire, and the predators are shooting their guns at Harchin. I was trying to trust you because you've never steered me wrong before. But we need a new plan. There is no other plan. Yes, there is. The humans are distracted by the exterminators. Let's go take their ship. We know it's close by, and there's not much time. We're not leaving them. Those two you see back there saved hundreds of Gojid lives from the Arxer. And now, they're trying to save you. I care about them, don't you get it? The female journalist's skin morphed into a bright orange, mirroring the tone of the flames. Her pupils surveyed mine for several moments, and I realized my eyes were watering at the thought of my guards on fire. Slumping her shoulders in defeat, she scampered back toward the hiding humans. 
Colleagues followed her lead. It was clear the close-knit team didn't want to separate. Seven exterminators charged through the alleyway, buffeting flames at the dumpster the humans crouched behind. Samantha unloaded a clip, a suppressive fire, but she was cornered. Carlos cursed as his lower pelt sparked, an orange light danced across his kneecap. On instinct, he leapt up and shook his leg. An exterminator lined up their sidearm, ignoring the human's pleading shout of, Wait! I needed to get a few paces closer to make the shot. There was no time. Fear glistened in Carlos' eyes as he tripped onto the street in a sprawled out position. The fire had spread to his boots and was making quick work of his pelt. I didn't want to see the predator die, but how Silene emitted a high-pitched scream and distracted the exterminators for a split second. I sprinted with the last of my energy, pulling the trigger at the gun wielder. My first shot nailed the harchin in the shoulder, the second one was a perfect rocket to the brain. Two officers whirled around, spewing fire at me. I grabbed my reporter friend and we tumbled back behind a building wall. If we don't, I'll die now. That is the second time I've saved Carlo's life, I muttered. I knew you wouldn't leave them. Silani shook her head. I came back for you, Sovlin, not them. Every second we spend here is time we're still on the Oxer's radar. I hope hideous predators with a monstrous history are worth that to you. Those hideous predators are people like us. Just watch them, how they act under pressure, you'll see. Carlos tried to ignore the flames, shooting his sidearm despite the blinding panic. The male human only connected with a single harchin by way of ricochet. Most of his wild rounds ended up in a wall, missing his target by a wide margin. The primal terror of being set ablaze must be overwhelming his brain. That unbearable heat on his lower extremities, and watching it spread, I couldn't imagine. Samantha was a one-woman harbinger of death, rolling out from behind the dumpster with fury. Her green eyes glowed with hunger. I could see the predator energy buzzing through her veins. She grabbed the flamethrower from the downed exterminator and decided to give the officers a taste of their own medicine. The heart information wavered. They weren't used to predators wielding their devices. The extermination officers had flameproof gear to avoid this eventuality, but two sported tears in their suits from today's engagements. Samantha switched to her sidearm as the panicked professionals bumbled into each other. She dished out two headshots before diving back behind the dumpster. That left three extermination officers on the prowl. While watching the human duo take out the majority of their comrades, they forgot all about the Rogojid prisoner. I popped back out from behind the wall and sprayed gunfire with my claw locked on the trigger. Two Harchin figures toppled to the ground Samantha didn't hesitate to terminate the final one. Carlos. You good? I questioned. Several grunts came from the alley. Fuck. Help me. The human's pant leg had almost completely burned away, little more than tatters. He kicked off his scorching boot and his face contorted in a mask of pain. Those silly artificial pelts saved him from serious nerve damage, in all likelihood, but we needed to put him out quick. I tugged that sweaty towel off my neck, slapping it on his ankle. The flames began to dissipate as I smothered them, and the human rolled around to put out the embers. Samantha hustled over with a water bottle, breathing a sigh of relief at the sight of her partner unharmed. He rubbed the reddened skin on his leg and struggled to his feet. His limbs trembled as he tried to stand. The female guard supported him with a gentle touch. Carlos closed his eyes. Thanks, Sovlin and company. Let's get out of here. 
I think I've had enough for one day. Samantha studied me in silence, with a little less venom than usual. The glint of surprise hung in her eyes. I figured she had expected me to abandon them when push came to shove. The curt predator didn't resist my aid when I propped myself under Carlos's other arm. She flashed pearly fangs and gave me a small nod. I see what you meant about their behavior. These humans help each other, even when one is weakened, Silani noted. And you don't seem alarmed by their snarls at all. That makes them capable of earning trust, attachment, loyalty. My nostrils flared with indignation. And it makes you wonder why so many species tried to kill them, without giving them a chance. Assuming they have malevolent intentions, purely based on looks, is a recipe for disaster. It's not right. Before you jump to conclusions, I need a deeper dive into human history and everything the Federation has on pre-space flight predators. I'd like to interview the pale, angry one there. That ape isn't hiding their emotions. They would make a good contrast with Noah's polished speech. The angry human has a name, Samantha snapped. Unless you just want to refer to me as... It. Fascinating. Why is this one like this? Carlos limped ahead, clinging to my neck. Sam's family was in Melbourne. Everyone she cares about, her relatives, her husband, presumed dead. No chance to say goodbye. Her home, off the map. Right that, us predators grieve our families too. I suspected the worst case when she visited me on Venlo Prime, exuding hostility. Samantha never shared much about her life, but she had imparted to Tolpin that her brother was deaf. Her fondness had been unmistakable, with how thorough her offense was to the suggestion of him being killed. It was the first inkling I ever got of how tight Terran family units were. But the husband tidbit took me by surprise. Carlos hadn't mentioned any progeny, though perhaps she planned on starting a family in the future. I had no idea that humans made it for life. I always thought that predators bred for breeding's sake. It sounded like they coupled for purposes beyond producing viable offspring. Of course, humans were capable of love, but their familial obsession always seemed to be the kids. I for predators. Shouldn't procreation be a competitive selection process, driven by impulse parenting roles, or a way of protecting offspring from rival mates? Or so I thought. Poor Sam. Ta the female human lowered her eyes. That wasn't your fucking place to share, Carlos. If you want to smear me for wanting revenge, Harchin, I couldn't care less. Just keep your racist thoughts to yourself. Now listen, if there is something more to your kind, I'm trying to unearth it. But I must start with your problematic auxular ties, Silani explained. I also wonder how far humans will go after the attack. It's strange that you freed us, Sam, since it's counterintuitive to your revenge. Revenge isn't about blind genocide. Now how about less chatter, more walking? Our posse trudged across the square, vigilant for any other activity. If any of my old crew saw me now, with a predator clinging to my body, they would have a conniption. Those arms built from the digestion of flesh felt warm and heavy, yet I wasn't disgusted by their touch. The emotional connection we established was hardly different than any other soldiers I'd served with. I wanted the humans to like me, to forgive me. We staggered onto the Terran's ship with exhaustion, and the Harchin journalists skittered aboard close behind. Silani was surveying the humans with interest. I could see the makings of a story brewing in her mind. Our little band was going to leave no stone unturned investigating the Federation. With a team of inquisitive individuals at my side, 
it was time to get the answers the predators desired. The Nature of Predator 62 Memory Transcription Subject Governor Tarva of the Venlo Republic Gate Standardized Human Time, October 22, 2136. The fact that the Arksha came to Earth's rescue caused less of an uproar than I expected. It became a fact that was conveniently ignored by my government at large. Instead, we celebrated the brave Venlo who hurled themselves in the Krakotl's path. Many talking heads were happy to sell the narrative that the Greys were taken for fools, assuming the newest predators shared their wickedness. The general public were uh, unaware of the looming deadline to trade for our cattle victims. That ticking hourglass was on my mind, as I accompanied Noah to the United Nations Remembrance Speech. The event was open to human refugees. I hoped that I could find the strength to treat the upset primates with kindness. The shock of the heartbreaking images on Earth was beginning to wane, but my soul still ached for our friends. It was terrible to see an innocent species suffering without cause. This has all been so sudden, and I know you've had pushback from your opponents. Have we outstayed our welcome here, Tava? Noah asked. I pressed my cheek against his forearm. Never, none there. There's a few people that want you shipped off our world, soon as possible, but they're a minority. I'll always fight for you. Fight, huh? All that's left is fighting. My pops used to say space was our ticket to a better future. I'm glad he didn't see me fuck it all up. How disappointed he must be, if he's watching from the afterlife. Oh, sweetheart, I'm sure he'd be so proud of you and the man you are. There was nothing else you could have said to the Federation. What happened to Earth has nothing to do with your speech. Nothing, you hear me? I appreciate you saying that. I do. And if you don't mind me saying so, you look beautiful today. I had no idea how to respond to such a forward remark coming from a human, but it did warm my heart. The dynamic between Noah, an alien predator, and myself was not something to address at this particular moment. Clearing my throat awkwardly, I tried to track down Elias Maya. Earth's chief diplomat proceeded with grace in the past, but a nudge toward sensibility might be necessary. It was my hope that he lacked conviction in any violent rhetoric he touted. The last time I saw the Secretary General was when word of Earth's devastation reached Venlo Prime. The fact that their militaries tallied such a miserable failure and left their home at the Arxer's mercy morphed the dignitary into someone else. The distraught Meyer had promised to rend every enemy from limb to limb before rushing off for an audience with that ghastly chief hunter. I hadn't been sure he'd survive an encounter with a predator that openly called me dinner in our brief encounter, but the gray-haired human here now, mingling with alien dignitaries, was the person I knew. Meyer had spent his lifetime building relationships with unique cultures. The only aspect he was unaccustomed to was the constant terror Prey felt. But he was mindful enough, careful not to show his teeth to non venlo His hands were kept in his pockets, to avoid gesticulating. Glad you asked about the Arxer, Meyer was saying to Kupo. When I spoke with them, face to face, their hotel room was pitch black. I couldn't make out much of anything other than a massive shadow looming over me. There's a group of them, lying in wait, sizing me up like a cut of meat. And you still went in. When you wanted to run away, the Mazik president asked, What choice did I have? Our instincts are nothing compared to yours, but I was thoroughly creeped out. I do hope 
that you can forgive us for accepting their tete-a-tete. -tete. With 10,000 warships surrounding Earth, a dialogue felt much more palatable than subjugation. The other Federation representatives were crowding the Secretary General, eavesdropping. It was a relief and a bit of a surprise to see him conversing with those who didn't aid Earth. That smooth-tongued dialogue seeking the Mazik's forgiveness, not the other way around, was stunning. I had expected him to launch into accusations over the indifference of their allies. Katie Meyer was acting a week ago. I thought Earth was going to isolate from everyone but us and the Ceruleans. I don't know what made him come to his senses, but this is a positive sign. Ka Kupo stepped forward on all, all four paws, shadowing the human leader with his bulky stature. I snorted with amusement as I noticed Elias shuffle back. He tried to play it off as fidgeting, but the predator seemed nervous about the mazic size. I don't think the sand-colored mammal realized the Terrans were equally intimidated by him. The Earthborn diplomats were well aware that a single kick of panic could cause serious skeletal damage. I appreciate your explanation, but it still leaves me worried that you're turning on us, Kupo said. Maya coughed pointedly. There's a billion dead humans, and nothing will ever be the same again. Humanity stood alone, apart from the kindness of the Venlo, the Zeruleans, and yes, the Arxer. Perhaps there would have been other options if we received more help from our neighbors. I have never been dishonest with you. I don't trust you. I think humans should be given a chance because you are our only hope. But placing my people in harm's way for predators, when that friendship is still a hypothetical, is unthinkable. Let alone raising arms against known sapiens, who share centuries of partnered history with us. The Mazik tensed as he breathed out the last word, expecting the predator to fly into a rage. The other alien diplomats listened with interest, perhaps because they held similar reasons. The Secretary General's pupils darted around, and his lips curved down with disdain. Was it my imagination, or did his hair look whiter than last I saw him? That's valid. It would have been easy for you to choose them over us, when it came down to the wire. I suppose doing nothing is a concession of itself, Maya growled. Kupo blinked in surprise. What? I expected you to disown us. That's not why I'm here. Humanity, under UN leadership, will found our own federation. I want as many members in our alliance as possible. I've started a project with promising results to weed out alien fear responses. The Mazics are one of the races I think have the most potential. You could lead this initiative. This would require leaving the current federation. I would want to retain membership in both, if I'd even roll in the dirt with you at all. Tassa, the Nevok diplomat, flicked her cream-colored ears. I wouldn't do anything that causes further risk to our trading networks. We can discuss this on a case-by-case -case basis, Maya said. What I need right now is for each of you to step up and bring the thousands of Gojid refugees we saved to shelters. Their colonies are also without a government and supplies. Who knows how long the Arksha recognize our claim to them? We no longer have the power to do anything about that. Kupo flapped his big ears. I can handle that, Predator. The Gojids deserve help. Good. Beyond that, we politely request that you send aid shipments to Earth. Anything you can spare out of generosity to get us back on our feet. I hate having to beg so plainly, but my cities were turned into a radiated soup. The Secretary General's eyes darted over to the Civkit Ambassador, who had leapt into a waste bin at the first sight of humans. Perhaps it was time to confront her on her skittishness.
though that would require a more private setting. While Maya was on the topic of aid shipments, this was the perfect time to slip to his side unnoticed. The Nevok ambassador pounced on Elias' perceived weakness, and was rattling off a laundry list of terms. Tassa had attempted to barter for ownership of Luna and the asteroid belt. In the wake of the attack, this was an obvious non-starter for the United Nations. This time, she was offering to manufacture ships and airdrop food in exchange for trade exclusivity. That was her true goal, to stop the Fissan Compact from landing advantageous deals. Kessans often undercut the Nevok's prices, and their trade war has spiraled to new heights. The fact that both of them reached out to actual predators, solely to screw the other over, Halmina, the Fissan representative, pointed her horn in a threatening manner. I landed here, two days ago, after our first representative, Adai, Adi, Human Maya, I'll give you a month's worth of food shipments, if free, with no strings attached. Just don't agree to that. Predators, the Fissons will steal anything proprietary right under your noses, Tassa hissed. Do you want a species known for corporate espionage on your turf? Accessing military blueprints at the first opportunity? We didn't steal your technology. We built it better and cheaper, and you can't accept that. You used your monopoly to rip people off, so you can't stand competition. We turn a profit which we deserve for the hard work of our brilliant engineers. You upstarts might as well be uplifts with shoddy shut up. Noah roared. Is now the time for your stupid feuds? What about Earth? If you want shit from humanity down the road, try helping us for the sake of helping us. The tension that fell over the conference hall was so thick that you could cut it with a knife. Sivkit Ambassador Axley was banging her head against the waste bin, wailing at the predatory outburst. The representatives were lucky the media cameras weren't rolling, and that the human refugee audience hadn't been allowed in the auditorium yet. Maya scratched his head with discomfort. Well, I agree with him. A little charity and unity would be nice. I find the behavior of capitalizing on our misfortune Rather, shall I say, predatory? The Nevok recoiled in shock, floored by a literal flesh-eater directing that insult at her. Halmina at least had the decency to look shameful, pawing at the mane on her long neck. Something flashed in Noah's eyes as he inspected her silver horn. He muttered something about thistens, only needing hooves. I was beginning to wonder if my friend was losing it. Maya glanced at a wristband, then gestured for everyone to find their position. He curled his lip at Axley's trash can hideout, and pushed the squealing grazer into a back room. The auditorium doors were unlocked for public entry, and human spectators shoved their way inside. It blew my mind to see this many predators in one spot, on my own planet. I leaned over to the Secretary General's ear, I want to talk to you, friend. You deserve an overview of how we're treating your refugees. Not right now, Governor, but I have urgent information on the Arxa. You won't believe what Isif actually said, he replied. The grey-haired primate's eyes flitted to the entryway and widened in alarm. I wondered what spooked him about the incoming Terran refugees. There was nothing to make any of these people look more predatory than the others. If someone tried to charge the Secretary General, I'm sure his bodyguards would intercept them. It seemed paranoid to travel with armed soldiers nearby at all times, but humans were poor at assessing danger. Tava, where the hell is the event security? Maya hissed through gritted teeth. There are a lot of important figures in one place. I snorted. 
You actually think people would march through that door and attack a public gathering? I... yes, I do. Damn it. You told us this was a secure venue. Get every diplomat to leave, only a few at a time. We don't want to incite panic. You think danger is lurking around every corner. Humans are safe here, Elias. I've guaranteed that nobody will try to exterminate your packs. You misunderstand. I'm worried for you. Any of us are capable of violence when pushed. You're dealing with humans who have lost everything and are looking for anyone to blame. Especially aliens, and especially the UN, understand? My focus turned to the incoming humans. Many were holding printed images of their cities, or loved ones, and their predator eyes were stained with tears. Several Terrans were comforting each other, with light embraces or hand squeezes. These people looked devastated and heartbroken, nothing like angry beasts planning to maul the fluffy aliens. Regardless, it wasn't like Fennel executed the attack. However, the level of jumpiness Maya was displaying was going to interfere with his speaking ability. If he required muscle to assuage his paranoia, it was better than seeming unstable on a live broadcast. Who would be cruel enough to target an event with such a gut-wrenching focus? I hadn't thought Elias a man with delusions of grandeur. But maybe the recent power bestowed in him had gone to his head. The purpose of this was to console the hurting humans and honor Earth's memory. Even I know these predators don't just attack out of hunger. He will postpone the ceremony, if you insist, I whispered, but you can tell it to our Federation guests. Elias sped off. The human exchanged words with the Fissons and the Paltons. They were the only two to send a replacement for the deceased ambassadors. Perhaps the Takans, Dossa, and Thafki were weighing their options, or they doubted the Predator's message. Regardless, the Secretary General made it a priority to evacuate the newcomers first. I suppose he didn't want to risk them losing another diplomat to a violent end. Whatever Meyer told the duo, it scared them sufficiently. Fearful expressions stretched across the aliens' faces, and they bolted from the auditorium without hesitation. Was that predacious delivery necessary? I glared at the human, willing him to be more tactful. Kupo stomped up to the UN leader. What are you up to? Is there a reason two ambassadors spoke with you and immediately saw themselves out? Keep your voice down, Maya hissed. You damn predators always keep me in the dark. We're in danger, aren't we? I am sick of having threats concealed right in front of my trunk. Nervous chatter swelled from the primarily human audience as the Masic president made a scene. The fire alarm was activated by a bystander, and visceral screams echoed through the sprinkler-doused room. Several Terrans made a beeline for the exit, pushing and shoving each other to get out. It seemed like the predators were verging on a stampede, which I didn't know was within their capability. Da! Da! Pack! It's blinking. A human's thunderous voice permeated the chaos. Run. Ambassador Noah wrapped an arm around my shoulders and hurried me toward our emergency exit. I had no idea what had just happened, but it was tugging at my own panicky instincts. Through the chemical fog, I worried that someone was going to get trampled in this madness. Kilias was irresponsible. We should have just proceeded with the speech, instead of IG, a deafening blast rocked my eardrums, and the subsequent shockwave sent me and Noah flying. The impact rattled me down to the bone marrow, making every nerve tingle. 
vision slipped away, and my adult brain could only register an incessant ringing. Pain fled in my tail. Something sharp, like a needle or a glass shard, had impaled itself in the bushy appendage. I coughed weakly, trying to move my arms. My pupils flicked out toward the sitting area, where a charcoal-colored mist shrouded the vicinity. Humans closest to the blast area were soaked in blood, and some seemed to be missing limbs. Their open mouths suggested they were screaming for help. I still couldn't hear anything but high-pitched reverberations. Maya crawled over, his attire caked in dust. The aged predator was sporting cuts across his wrinkled forehead, but his eyes were something alien. I'd never seen a human in combat mode in person. That dilated stare jolted some life into my veins. My brain recognized him as an animal with the erratic eye movements and strained breathing. The Secretary General stopped adjacent to me and jostled the shoulder of a face-down human. Horror flooded my chest as I realized it was Noah beside me. Elias punched at the Ambassador's chest several times until glossy brown eyes blinked open. The Elder Terran slapped the astronaut across the cheek, trying to snap him away. Maya's gaze searched for other survivors before resting on me. His lips moved, but I could only make out hints of the sound. I think he was telling me to run away. The only reason I suppressed my fear of the adrenaline-fueled predator was concern for Noah. That worry was a sickening knot in my stomach. I needed to see him stand up. T. Va. The human ambassador croaked. Get here. I had no idea if he was saying get out of here or get over here, but I took it as the latter. My paws rushed over to his side and his glazed eyes drifted to my tail. Horror flashed in his pupils. Concern crossed Maya's taut grimace as well. The injury must be worse than I thought, but I decided not to look. I didn't want to pass out now. Noah struggled upright, fueled by worry for me. His hands steered me onward, and his wobbly steps became more certain. My mind hadn't yet processed that humans had attacked their own remembrance ceremony. Right now, I prayed that there wouldn't be a follow-up strike from whatever deranged predator plotted this. The Nature of Predator's 63 Memory Transcription Subject, a Kavanagh Tava of the Venlo Republic, 8 Standardized Human Time, October 22nd, 2136. When the humans began their cultural exchange, they shared the blemishes of their cultural history. The satellite wars almost sent the powerful nations back to the Stone Age, by their own words. Federation researchers also documented the senseless atrocities of a prior era and noted the uncanny resemblance to Arxer brutality. It had been difficult for me to picture the Earthlings acting so violent toward each other, those moral people killing millions of their race was unimaginable. The scale of bloodshed today forced me to reckon with that truth. I knew in my heart what the predators were capable of but I hadn't wanted to accept it. Sweeping their history under the rug, in favor of the empathy tests and the charitable acts toward us, was easier. Talking with Noah and Meyer made me want to believe they changed as a species. Maybe even your human friends could act out of aggression? You've seen outbursts from both. They restrain it because of learned morality, empathy, but does Noah ever fantasize about killing people? Just a tiny bit? Keep walking, Tava. Dot. The Terran ambassador placed a trembling hand on my shoulder and made me jump. You can't go into shock. We need to get you to a hospital. Please, please, stay with me. Tears soaked my cheek fur. Davi. 
Where are the other alien diplomats? I'll look for them. But Tava needs a tourniquet, Williams, Maya growled. Yeah, I agree. Listen, Tava, if anything happens, I want you to know that I love you, Noah whispered. You don't have to say it, or feel it, back. I'm going to protect you. The chocolate-skinned predator scooped me up into his arms, passion alight in his binocular gaze. His visage became fuzzy, I felt cold, despite the warmth of his body. Salini swelled around his eyes, as he ripped his shirt sleeve off with his bare fingers. His nails had turned grey from grime and soot, and orange blood was smeared across his chest. Knowing the aggression hardwired into his genome should have struck sense into me. Humans were coded to be destructive and violent. Still, the fondness in my heart cried out louder than ever. My Noah was a little hot under the collar, but only when faced with injustice. I trusted him with my life. I couldn't make myself regret befriending the Terrans. I love you too, I croaked. The human's lips quivered, torn between a smile and sorrow. He wrapped the cloth around my tail tightly, and blinding pain rocketed up my spine. It felt like he was amputating the limb, wrenching it from my body with an iron fist. I yelled in agony, burying my face in his chest. His brow furrowed as he finished tying the knot. The astronaut patted my head. It's done now, I'm sorry. I had to stop the bleeding. You're going to be fine. I don't know if I am. This was an isolated incident, right? I whimpered. Honestly, we've had tragedies like this happen on Earth before, though it's rare. All I can ask is that you don't judge us by our worst individuals. This is why the Federation wants us all dead. Most humans would never do something like this. You know that. But what kind of monster would? I don't know who did this or their motives. They're sick with grief or some disorder. Anything I say is speculation, but we're going to hunt the bastard down. Eh, pardon my word choice. If this was a drastic action born of anger, Human emotions needed to be monitored under a microscope. I had tried to normalize the predator's stay, and welcome them like any other class of refugees. But if there could be mass carnage any time a lone Terran was upset, I didn't know how safe it was to integrate them into our society. What other venues could be targets of senseless violence? How many Venlo lives could be lost? My vision began to dim as the fear chemicals lending energy tapered off. Ambassador Noah lunged at me with bared teeth, catching himself a hair short of my face. He released an incoherent roar in my direction. The feel of the predator's warm breath on my lips, and the sight of maddened eyes inches from my face, sent flight cocktails coursing through my veins. Electricity jerked at my muscle fibers. Instincts propelled me upright, and sent me stumbling away, blindly. It took me several seconds to realize Noah was intending to startle me awake. Triggering my flight response had jolted me back to consciousness, though that might not last long. I collided with Meyer, who had his back turned to me. Shit. Watch where, Tava. Noah. You need to get her out of here. The Secretary General spat. The human leader had thrown caution to the wind, pressing his shoulder by a downed Kupo's side. The Mazik was bleeding from several places, including a mutilated leg. I appreciated Meyer's efforts, but he was going to be crushed if Kupo fell. The old primate couldn't support a creature several times his weight. 
Leave him, Elias. You can't carry him. Come with us, I cough. Kupo flared his trunk. I am conscious, Tarva. I don't want to die, enough that I'm letting a predator touch me. My skin is crawling. The grey-haired human gritted his teeth. Nobody else is going to die on my watch. We have to help the big guy up, give him a fighting chance. Ambassador Noah frowned before kneeling beside the Secretary General. The two humans pushed Kupo off his side and hoisted him back to his round feet. The mazik teetered on his legs for a moment, but the predators strained with the last of their might. I noticed scarlet fluid dripping through Noah's short mane. The sand-colored mammal swayed as he fixed a glare on the human. Wh what the fuck happened, Predator? You predicted this, so you clearly know. Oh, get to a hospital, President Kupo. I'm going to look for Tossa and Axley, Elias growled. They help. I can carry them, the Mazik President offered. In your condition? Just go, I'll deal with it. My eyes work just fine. You're not going to cover up these deaths. I won't leave until we find the Nevok, at least. Whatever. Look around, be my guest. Kubo glanced in every direction before pointing his trunk at the arctic-colored biped on the floor. Elias released an audible gasp and raced to the Nevok side. His slender fingers crept to the pulse point above Tossa's hoof. His binocular eyes closed, and he shook his head with a defeated expression. There was nothing but gore among the human spectators, with many primates dead or dying. First responders were nowhere to be seen. We were alone in this mess. The Mazik president took a final look at the decimated auditorium before trundling over to the nearest exit. I imagined he would blame Meyer for this catastrophe for a long time. I limped over to the back room where Axley was, ignoring Noah beckoning me to the exit. Ironically, the Sivkit's cowardice in the trash can left her more sheltered from the blast than anyone. Her fluffy white form was huddling in the receptacle, unconscious. The rise and fall of her chest was visible so I assumed she passed out from terror. Maya was right behind me and picked the Sivkit diplomat up with haste. That was not going to end well if she woke up carried by a predator. Noah pointed us toward the side exit with a scowl on his face. Fighting off dizziness, I sandwiched myself between the two humans. All strength dissipated as the duo ushered me through an exterior door. The shivering was unbearable, and my paws were becoming heavy as concrete. I want... I'm ready... to sleep. So sea cold, I gasped at Noah. Please, don't scare me again. The human grimaced. We're almost there. Just stay awake a little longer, okay? A shaken own bodyguard brought a bright red kit over to Elias, who deferred it to Noah. The Secretary General couldn't administer first aid while his hands were full with the sieve kit. The astronaut popped open the lid and pried out the fattest syringe I'd ever seen. Before I could wince at the size of the needle, he jabbed it against my neck. An adrenaline surge caused my limbs to convulse, and I fell over, gasping. My heart feels like someone is squeezing it inside my ribcage. Sure hope my atrium doesn't burst. The hormones did the trick to stabilize my blood pressure, and I tried to get a grip on my surroundings. Rough shouts stemmed from a throng of humans by the main entrance, who were barely kept at bay by armored Yung personnel. Those soldiers seemed to have been shipped by the truckload in a hurry. Judging by the signs and vulgar language, 
the gathered refugees were protesting Elias Meyer's arrival. I heard about this gathering, since its organizers did apply for and receive a legal permit. However, the Terran demonstrators had moved away from the designated area in the wake of the attack. Some were pushing toward the scene of the blast, though I had no idea whether it was to help or to finish off the survivors. Others were escalating to violence, charging at the UN officers and throwing objects. What chance would Venlil police have of containing these animals? A few predators were setting fire to glass bottles, then hurling them at their surroundings. Historic row houses lit up like kindling once the picturesque shutters were swallowed by flames. Before my eyes, the Terrans climbed up the hood of a UN vehicle and began swinging a bat at the windshield. Surely these humans realized that didn't accomplish anything. It was terrifying to see their destruction spiraling out of control. This violence must not be as isolated of an incident as I hoped. I thought you were an intelligent species. Why is this? I cried. My shriek drew the attention of the mob, who began jeering at Maya in particular. Several lobbed accusations about Earth, and they overran the UN crowd control with renewed focus. Rocks, bricks, and other blunt objects were thrown with intent to injure. Noah herded me off with a rough grip. I hadn't felt this terrified of humans since first contact. I had no idea what motivated these eye creatures in, or if they could even be reasoned with at all. As much as I loved the first contact team, allowing Terran refugees onto Venlil Prime was a mistake. We were going to have to get the current populace off-world if they would still heed our commands at all. I would warn my advisors to implement stringent psych evaluations for any arriving humans. This was wholly unacceptable. These predators here had no care for who they might hurt and today's death toll had to be in the dozens. I didn't want to judge humanity by their worst individuals. People like Meyer and Noah did not deserve to die for their deranged cohorts. Blanket condemnation was not the answer. But the Venlil Republic just learned the hard way that we needed to be more selective in which predators we dealt with. Maya's eyes darted around. We're going to restore order and fix this, Tava. I'm so sorry. Bad things happen when a lot of angry humans get together. This will pass, love, Noah said. Glass shattered inches from my heels, and my flight instincts bubbled back to the forefront. Coupled with the given adrenaline, I found myself running at full speed. The screeching sound of tires on asphalt met my ears. A black sedan careened down the narrow streets, with no regard for any protesters in the path. The crowd parted at the last minute, raving and discombobulated. The Secretary General pointed toward the car. Run, in. This vehicle had an actual driver, who seemed to be switching between autopilot and manual steering. They popped open the side door, leaving our posse to clear the final few feet. I prayed that we would be able to escape from these beasts. This was what it felt like to be hunted by pack predators, and there was no hope of humans tiring from the chase. Noah positioned his body behind me and shielded me from the projectiles sailing at us. A broken bottle nailed mire in the back of the head, which earned cheers from the crowd. Another human protester rested a gun, away from a UN peacekeeper. They began firing at the figurehead's center of mass, without hesitation. The UN leader clutched at his abdomen and staggered toward the car. He dumped the sieve kit over the threshold, somehow maintaining his grip. The elder human collapsed in a splayed position, which suggested the concerning severity of his injuries. I prayed to any deity listening that nothing had connected with my astronaut. Noah gave me a forceful push to the shoulders, sending me tumbling into the back seat. He dove in on top of me and tugged the door shut. 
The driver floored it away from the mob at max velocity. The Terran ambassador sighed in relief before he turned his eyes to the secretary general. Multiple bullets had pierced through his stomach and the leader was gasping like a fish out of water. Blood was oozing onto the floorboards, draining away with a steady flow. I realized with dismay that Maya might need hospital care more urgently than me. It took a second to roll him over so that I could stare into his dazed eyes. The human tried to sit up but fell back with a weak groan. My paw raced beneath his neck and propped up his skull. Elias' eyelids fluttered. Tava, Chief Hunter, Izif wants to help us. Stop talking. That's not important right now, I said. It is. I want you to make peace with the Arxer. Please let that be my legacy. The primate drew a shaky breath and cued in on the hesitancy in my eyes. I didn't want to argue with a man who was fading in my arms. It was obvious he wanted those negotiations to work, at any cost. Perhaps it was true that Isif aimed to help humanity, the only other predators in the galaxy. But that Grey had outright stated that Venlil were lesser animals, a delicacy that he felt entitled to. That wasn't an open invitation to civil relations. What Isif said to you was theatrics. So he wouldn't be executed, Maya coughed. He wants to end sapient farming and the war. Need better future. Likes your spirit. Told me so. I blinked several times. And you trust I air. Him? Why would lie at his mercy? Meyer's eyelids sealed shut as his irises rolled back in his head. Noah pried a packet of human blood from the glove box and began feeding it into the Secretary General's veins. The vehicle was less than a minute from the hospital, but every millisecond seemed like an eternity. My own weakness was creeping back in, while the UN leader's breathing grew more faint. I didn't know if I could honor that request, despite Elias framing it as a last wish. As much as I respected his discernment, the likeliest answer was that the Arxa Hunter was manipulating human empathy. Isif knew the Venlil Republic wanted nothing to do with him. His species had enjoyed every second of the war, even if the Federation had starved the Greys, they used that as a free pass to slaughter everyone without exception. The tires squealed, and we veered over to the hospital's entrance. Squeaky voices alerted the other staff that an injured predator was on site, followed by recognition of this particular human. My mind was far away when Noah placed me onto a stretcher. Unconsciousness took hold as Vinyl paramedics rushed two planetary leaders to critical care. The Nature of Predators, 64, Memory Transcription Subject, Moments in Delirium. Whatever drugs I was given seemed designed to keep me out of it, but there were brief flashes of humans putting my wing back into place. Rumbling voices cascaded around me and filled me with the urge to claw my way to the surface. The vivid dreams left my brain in anguish. My near-death experience had turned decades of rotten memories into a jumbled casserole. There had been one nightmarish case where we found an elderly crocodile ripped apart in her backyard. With a cruel sense of humor, my dream state decided to reenact the scene. Standing over the rotting corpse and seeing the innards tugged from her stomach, was the abyssal image of evil. Extermination officers were supposed to act in time to prevent these occurrences. I could feel a sour taste swell in my beak. It was followed by a scorching sensation as I regurgitated my meager lunch. 
my partners insisted on immediately torching the area. This body was defiled beyond burial salvaging. The victim's family would understand. Some faint remembrance told me that this was the case that made me transfer to the military. I never found the predator. I looked, obsessed, ran down every lead. Over here, a voice hissed on the wind. My wings flapped with urgency, and I sailed off in the direction of the call. All I wanted was to fry the animal that would commit this heinous deed. This had been the only predator I ever hated. My standard practice was to refrain from emotional judgments. It wasn't a hunter's fault for being born, but the existence of whatever did this was offensive to me. As the Arxer, the scenery blended together with that dreamlike passage of time. The abrupt change wasn't jarring in the moment. Without warning, I was buffeted down by a brutal gust of wind. The forest clearing around me looked quite familiar, and my instinct screamed that something wasn't right. There was a neon fabric dome, a sapient-built structure which tickled something in my mind. Invisible forces tugged the entrance flap open, as though inviting me in. I inched closer, despite wanting to back away, on legs that felt like concrete pylons. Violet crocotal blood formed a thin trail across the grass, which returned a sliver of my resolve. A predator like this could not be allowed to reproduce under any circumstances. The bravado it had to waltz into our settlements meant it was a true abomination. My eyes were not prepared for the sight that awaited. Inside, there crouched a lanky, brown-skinned creature, which I recognized as an adult, human. The predator was chowing down on a crocotal's gullet, and blood was smeared on its chin. How had an alien sapient gotten out here? It looked up as I entered, with feathers jammed between bloodied canines. Those brown eyes with that awful pleading quality still present, belonged to Arjun. This must be that kid, all grown up, and now as ugly as the rest of his freakish race. Humans are not vicious, Arjun whined, in the childish register that didn't match its development. You're brainwashed, Calcium. I tried to raise my flamethrower, but my wings wouldn't move. The predator bared its teeth, inching closer. I should have killed that conniving demon while I had the chance. It didn't matter that humans were capable of empathy, when it was a selective concept that could be turned off like a light switch. What a curse, to be given the gift of sapience, yet to have such an atrocious form. The hideous monster sprang forward, its unrivaled endurance meant that its bloodlust would never be sated. Any compassion was overridden by an instinct much stronger. That was what their history told us would happen, all along. The Federation needed to kill as many humans as possible, but I had forgotten that. Its clawless fingers pressed into my throat, and all I could hear was the pounding of my heart. I'm going to kill you. I shrieked, snapping upright. Savages. My head spun, and I realized I was in a ventilated building. The cool metal beneath my spine suggested I was on some sort of operating table. At least, I hoped that was what the tiny knives were for. My wing was bound in some sort of plaster, and gauze was wrapped around my aching neck. This must be somewhere amidst the predator-infested lands of Earth. The realization that it was a dream provided immeasurable relief. Thinking about the details, it was a senseless nightmare. Social hunters wouldn't wander and pick us off alone. Still, I couldn't help feeling uneasy at that peak of the future. It was tough to picture the human kid devolving. I slid my talons off the table, clicking around on wobbly feet. Why had Arjun's father listened to its son's plea to spare me? 
Weren't the primates furious about the cities we destroyed? Karjun didn't deserve to suffer, but maybe I should have put him down. If I knew humans were such brutal hunters, their compassion wouldn't have swayed me. Those drawn-out methods are far worse than the Arxus. Well, with a bit of hesitancy, I tested the door handle. It was unlocked. The humans kept their structures more sanitary than I expected, from creatures accustomed to constant blood and death. There wasn't any reek of predation or biological markers left to intimidate me. Perhaps the Terrans realized I showed mercy to their kind and stayed their hand? They were a cogent species, not the non-sapient terror I saw in my nightmare. Still, I felt like I should be bound or caged. Maybe the primates were testing whether I could be enslaved. That was the only reason I could fathom why they patched me up. Thoughts of Theon, the only surviving member of my party, raced through my mind. It begged the question of how long I'd been out, and whether that Marco's faction had sniped him. As I turned into a wider area, a gun was jabbed inches from my face. An adult human watched with a neutral expression, but I could see the hunger that lurked in those pupils. The alien predator looked like the result of a disastrous lab experiment, with its exposed face and glistening skin. I felt sorry for the prey races like the snake that had to deal with these things marching around. What was that noise? You're going to kill me? Its eyes glowed in the middling light, and its dry lips tensed. That must be a cue that it wanted blood to wet them. I encourage you to try, bird. I squeezed my eyes shut. W was nightmare. T, there's no point to K killing you now. We failed. Kalsim thinks we're going to conquer them, Dad. Arjun offered from atop a footstool. Well, I don't think we'll have the chance, kiddo. The greys beat us to the punch, or so I hear. Solemnness clasped my heart as I thought of the undefended Nishtal. The Arksha wouldn't pass up a golden opportunity if it was brought to their attention. There hadn't been time to dwell on the reptile's arrival at Earth, but it told us a lot about the humans. The fact that the Terrans were a feeling people, who cared for each other, hadn't stopped them from jumping in bed with their antithesis. You are dangerous, and still I have shown you mercy, time and again. My home is gone. Do what you think you must, human. The father peeled back its plump lip. The name's Mano, Gehi. You have a sick idea of mercy, but my son is alive because of you. That's the only reason I'm not ending you myself. Got it? I see. It, it is difficult to look a serpent in the eye and kill it. Manosh, even for one of your spawn. What happens to me doesn't matter. I won't resist the execution squad. Come, er sister little. I got wildlife doctors to treat you and your pal with some reluctance. They gave in eventually, on the condition that I turn you over to one forces once you're stable. Wait. My pal? Aryan told me where to find him. Pure genius hiding spot. Look under the bedsheet behind me. The full-grown human was positioned just right to obstruct my vision. On closer inspection, the tubes and wires behind the predator were attached to the farcel officer. Horror coursed through my veins. Theon was missing an arm. The jagged edges around his shoulder stump suggested teeth had sawed it off. Manoi must have gotten too hungry around the injured officer, and experienced a lapse in its control. I know it must tough for a predator to stitch together a wounded prey animal, who was in a coma, but my gosh. Key, you ate Theon. 
I checked both of my wings in a squawking panic. The human scalpels could have shaved off tiny flesh bits, in fractions that I hadn't noticed. You're just like the Ark Sewer. Manoy snorted. Damn, you're a fucking idiot. Human teeth aren't big enough, certainly not to do what I thought so cleanly. That, yes, you're right, Predator. Then you fed him to the tigers, I suppose. Actually, it was leopards that got him. Same family as tigers, but with spots instead of stripe. Would have had nothing left but crumbs, except that I showed up when it was picking at him. Arjun was upset about it, else I would have let nature run its course. You're lying. We placed him in a tree. There's no way land predators could have gotten to him. Manoi pulled up a clip on its holopad, with a snarl born of cruel amusement. The human set the device down on a table, and I leaned over it hesitantly. A massive beast with a mottled pelt was walking up a vertical trunk, defying gravity with ease. Sinister forepaws hugged the bark circumference, while its hind legs moved like it was ascending ladder rungs. The predator's speed quickened without warning, and its hind legs pushed off. It leapt onto a branch in an adjacent tree, faster than any landwalker should be able to. I suppose these leopards were more than capable of scaling greenery in a blink. The only reason I could conjure why the Terrans kept such a beast alive was their arboreal roots. That aerial terrorization might be relatable to them. Manoi had shown me that they were quite willing to scale forest trunks themselves. Geiger Reserve makes sense now. The humans respect this family of animals because they recognize the bestial common ground. The adult predator leaned back. So we reduce the drugs keeping Theon in a medically induced coma. He's already starting to stir. This should be good. I assumed you would want revenge, Manoa, and I know it's just how humans are. But please, take it out on me. I gave the orders. I deserve your wrath. All Yon wanted was to stop predators from hitting any more worlds. He couldn't sleep at night, knowing there was another Oxer out there. We're not the Oxer. Nobody understands that but me. I always saw your redemptive qualities and how unique humans were. I wish that was enough. We both know coexistence wasn't an option. I'm sorry that it had to be like this, truly. It didn't have to be like this at all. We wanted peace to fight alongside you, and you committed genocide against us for it. I wonder if there could have been another way. Human conquest is as inevitable as your growth. There are no future generations for any other race with you alive. The human scowl was growing more visceral by the second. I wondered if it was reconsidering its promise to Arjun to spare me. My exterminator training faltered as its narrowed eyes bore into my skull. A fearful squawk bubbled in my throat, but I fought to ground myself beneath its anger. Pain manifested in its increasingly hostile posture. The skin of its hands was tight around the bone knobs, which suggested waning control. My thoughts wandered to how Arjun had appealed to my morality, and claimed Terran religions called for natural compassion. I reminded myself that those emotions were genuine, they didn't just disappear at adulthood. This father, monstrous as it was, resisted murderous urges in favor of its bond with its son. Perhaps if I appealed to that side, and continued to treat this ghastly beast with dignity, I could save the on. Extermination officer is a dangerous job where you're always on call. Not good for settling down, so I never had kids, I stammered. 
I have killed a lot more living beings than I like to recall. But I have to believe that somewhere, for how we slowed Earth's expansion, there's a hatching who will live to adulthood. A low rumble emanated from Minaj. There's millions of children on both worlds who are dead e right now because you tried to kill us, all for our eye placement. Human, your eye placement is a symptom of a bigger problem. Predators do have forward-facing eyes, but it's much deeper than that. That's like saying a virus must be eradicated for its spike proteins. Its actions, the infection, and spread are the issue. The adult human adjusted a rectangular object, which appeared to be a video camera. A red light blinked by the lens, and I guessed I was being recorded. That was a sensible action for intelligence purposes. Manoi bared its yellowed teeth, approaching me with shuffling steps. It traced an oily finger across my beak with a chuckle, before pointing my nose toward the camera. Say hello to the people of planet Earth, the predator sneered. You're being broadcasted to social media right now, wherever the internet still functions. Look the eventual millions who'll see this in the eye and repeat your little virus line. I squeezed my eyes shut. You're angry. I don't hate humans for what they are. It wasn't personal, it's just the reality of the situation. It sure felt personal, drumstick. I happened to find footage floating around from the UN raids, a crocodile transmission sent to a downed ship. Those pink markings on this fella's beak look awful similar to yours, don't they? The Terran pulled up, another video on its holopad. I recognized my own visage on the feed. An allied ship must have intercepted the hail we sent to the downed human, who had shown us a picture of its family. Pity swelled in my throat as I thought of the offspring in its image. Those three primates had looked younger than Arjun, and now were left without a parent. For all I knew, they died in the bombings, and that Yuan pilot had sacrificed itself in vain. Surrender yourself to our custody, peacefully, and I'll see that you survive. The cadence of my voice was overlaid by static interference. You can ensure that your culture is remembered. Manoi offered a chilling grin, its alien features giving off contradicting signals. That's your mercy, Kalzim. A perfect view of the destruction of your planet, your culture, and everyone you cared about. Meanwhile, you're a prisoner among people who want your kind exterminated forever. An exhibit in a twisted museum. I wanted someone to study your culture. I wanted you to be remembered. Fuck you. We could execute you, and that decision won't be up to me. But my suggestion, people of Earth, let's give him the same mercy he offered one of ours. Let him witness the destruction of Nishtal in HD while we keep him locked up to document Krakotl culture. My eyes shifted to the floor. There was never such an undercurrent of cruelty in my offerings. I had been trying to minimize their suffering, while Manoj aimed to twist the knife. Krakotl culture was well documented by every Federation race, so it was not in jeopardy of vanishing from the records. The humans viewing this video would demand a more violent end for me, wouldn't they? A motor revved outside the compound, and predatory shouts rippled through the air. Those must be the UN soldiers picking me up. I shot a final glance at Arjun, who was watching me with interest. The human kid raised a clawless hand as we locked eyes. Perhaps this was some gesture of farewell, like the tail signals of many species. The foresight of Arjun, as a human adult, floated through my mind again. I doubted I would ever see him again, but if I did, he would be something unrecognizable. 
These creatures grew out of the tolerable phase much too quick. Fighting off tears, I lifted my uninjured wing at him. The explosive noise of a door flying off its hinges pierced the air. Terrans couldn't do anything quietly. Goodbye, little predator, I whispered. Don't go scaring any more snakes. Dark fabric enveloped my head before I knew what was happening. Pure terror coursed through my veins, at the sheer number of humans I sensed around me. This was the largest concentration of predators I'd dealt with in my life. Part of me hoped that they would take me as a meal, instead of skewing my mercy into a revenge fantasy. The Nature of Predators 65 Transcription subject, Oi, Captain Sovlin, Federation Fleet Command, 8 Yunnan Time, October 23rd, 2136, by my assessment, to defeat a solar sail in combat. I was certain their craft choice was designed to tail me with minimal risk of detection. Now, it wasn't like I was going to forget they were on my tail so I didn't see the point of stealthy monitorization. With Carlos requiring medical oversight, we persuaded the Predators to dock with us. The Terran shuttle squeezed into the escape pod bay, with little room to spare. The Harchin journalists were floored to see the accommodations the Terrans had whipped up for the deaf Tolpen. I imagine the Federation would be shocked as well. There was a reason the humans chose these gojids to represent our refugees. That painted a different picture of the Cradle Invasion, apart from the story of vicious annihilation circulating now. I'm sure the attempted murder wasn't an enticement either, my guards valued staying in one piece. My expectation was that the humans would detach in their shuttle once we got close enough. Their little clunker would either hide out until our hopeful return, or they would find their own way back. My read was that they weren't eager to stay around the Federation hub. He know what I'm going to tell the representatives about the humans. But I don't know how to justify my own actions with Marcel. The low hum of the ship's engines pulsed into my paws as I slunk around the humans' personal effects. Samantha had left an unlocked holopad unattended, and I was gripped by the compulsion to scour their internet. We wouldn't have access to the live network, hundreds of star systems away from Sol, but there was an archive of what existed before our departure. The guilt drumming away in my skull wondered what the Federation was told about Marcel. I breathed the words aloud as I typed in a search bar. Marcel, human tortured by Gojid. My heart seized, scrolling through the results that turned up. After everything I had learned about the Terrans, it made my sins even more terrible. The thought that a predator could share such similarities with us, and that they could truly be our friends, had been fantastical at the time. Why? Had I not even considered, for a second, that the human captive was innocent. I tapped a video result that claimed to have been shown to the Federation. My claws landed themselves in my mouth, and I chewed with more intensity than ever. Marcel was feeding a prey animal, while a speaker called Noah elaborated on his veterinary aspirations. It was tough to see the life in his hazel irises, the same ones I had seen pleading with me in agony. How could I ever come to terms with the fact that I tormented an herbivore human who found his joy through saving animals? The images switched to close-up images of Marcel's wounds. It broke my heart to see how famished the human looked and to think about his misery. Tears swelled in my eyes and mucus oozed from my nose. A few choking sobs came out as the full weight of self-hatred slammed down on me again. Samantha had been right when she told Carlos I didn't deserve cordiality. 
A clawless hand swiped the holopad away from me. Dear God, Sovlin, why would you do that to yourself? Sam, that's not the worst thing he could have sought out on the internet. Perhaps we should be happy, Carlos chimed in. I jumped out of the chair, wiping my eyes on the back of my paw. Samantha's auburn hair looked disheveled, and my woefulness transitioned to concern. I hadn't seen the female eat anything, which was compounding a lack of self-care and sleep. The reason why she was grief-stricken was obvious now. We had to be certain she wouldn't make any hasty decisions, with such a tenuous mental state. Gavalot is the worst thing, Carlos. Predation? Xenophobia? I asked. The male guard snorted. No, thou. Forget about it. You're going to give the holopad back to Sam and promise never to tinker with our things again. Sorry, I needed to remember what I've done. I was starting to feel almost normal with you and the Hotchin. It felt like I was with my old crew, but that life is gone. I don't deserve happiness. It's time to move on, Sovlin. Samantha showed a rare hint of sympathy, curling her lips in a way that didn't seem hostile. The female predator looked lethargic and downcast. You can honor Marcel by doing something good when you land on Alpha today. But I... You fucked up. Bad. That was then, and this is now. I've decided that there's something worthwhile in you. And so has the Un Liu. Have no right to let us down. My paws relinquished my grip on the holopad, and I allowed the alien hunters to steer me out to the common area. Somehow, Samantha's rough words were comforting. She reminded me I had a purpose here, far beyond myself. Every living creature on this side of the galaxy, Slanik, Marcel, my guards, the Gojid refugees, was depending on me. The entire Federation would be disbanded and slaughtered, if I didn't disprove the Oxers' deceit with conclusive evidence. It would be a travesty for them to flip the script and masquerade as the original victims in this mess. Whatever my past failings were, penance wasn't as important as stopping the humans from forging this unholy alliance. He need to save the Terrans from vengeful temptation. The species who liberated a cattle ship and bashed Arkshire prisoners over the head is still in there. Finding justice for my first officer's death was an urgent consideration too. The Colchian Commonwealth had proved themselves a menace to the Federation and our forums of diplomacy. Someone needed to put an end to their treachery before more innocents turned up dead. This was personal to me now, and I wanted to see the masterminds hang. The Harchin journalists were dotted across the common area, with scribbles and notes strewn everywhere. Silene looked concerned as she noticed my sniffling and bleary eyes. I knew the journalists were worried the predators were intimidating me, or throwing their weight around. It was all I could do to delay any interrogation of Samantha, with her fragile state. The humans needed to talk over their history soon, unless they wanted it covered in an unfavorable light. Silene, has your team located any pertinent information? I asked, the short reptile drummed her toes on a table. If I give you the rundown, are the predators finally going to answer my questions? Samantha bared her teeth. You're not in any position of power here. This is our mission, and I'm not your lab rat. Your... what? The translator mangled that idiom. A rodent in a lair. I repeated. For animal testing. To develop drugs or research behaviors. Every prey sapient in the room gaped at the primate, and even I failed to mask my horror. 
Humans ran unethical experimentation on captured animals, treating them like expendable subjects. That was not an empathetic practice. There was no defense for wide-scale cruelty. It was implied that there were no safeguards to mitigate the suffering either. Okay, all of you, quit it with wit and that look. Carlos leapt to Samantha's rescue, rounding on me with a glare. How else do you develop medicines to cure diseases and uncover the side effects, e before giving it to your own people? Cell cultures, heart and tissue samples, microdosing, and computer models don't murder free, Selene said. My spines bristled from the predator's anger. Hell, like any civilized culture. We don't treat animals as our toys. The female guard bit her lip. Human... no. Sapient lives take precedence over everything else. I'd sacrifice a million animals to save one person. Person I, as much as I wanted to push back against Sam's statement, it was tough to argue with someone who looked so broken. If I believed it was my only option, there were no sacrifices I wouldn't make to bring back my family. Humans rushing disease cures might have come to the same conclusions. I tucked away a mental note to give the predators some simulations that could put an end to that barbarism. The Harchin reporter blinked in disgust. There are better ways. That's not science. On the plus side, at least the humans do try to heal their people, I told Silene. When I first captured Marcel, I didn't even think they had medicine. He moved away from my sedative needle, like he was scared of doctors. Carlos slapped his forehead. Sovlin, maybe we just don't like needles. Between the sight of blood and the pain, it's not a carnival ride. Sorry, we're off to a terrible start. I don't see why these reporters can't get along with you. Work this out, for your sake. This is your chance to justify yourselves to the galaxy, humans. We've done nothing to you. Why do we need to justify anything? Samantha spat. I know you don't want to, but it's about time someone listened to your side of the story. Don't you think? There's a lot at stake here, especially if more races decide to come after you. The two predators shared a glance as the Harchins scrutinized their mannerisms. They both gave a grudging nod and settled down into their seats. I offered a silent prayer that Silene would go gentle on Samantha. If I saw that human showing signs of distress or a breakdown, I was going to intervene. Her welfare was more important than any media coverage. You first, Silene, Carlos growled. The Federation de-dumped a lot of footage from their initial discovery of humanity to undermine Noah's message. The reptile's skin camouflaged with the blue ship walls as the predators leaned toward her. She was brave to face them so early on. I found a clip from their discussion, that unanimous vote to destroy your species, almost two centuries ago. Look. The male guard knitted his brow in confusion. I could sense him biting back a retort, since that wasn't the information the UN was looking for. Part of him must be curious to observe how humanity had been discussed as heartless monsters. If the Gojates had been sentenced to death before escaping our world, I'd want to hear those proceedings. The Harchin reporter tossed a video onto a projector, and my own eyes turned to the screen. I'd never seen this footage. Humanity had been little more than a historical footnote, with a few graduates, like Zarn, diving into the Federation's observations. Why had the vote passed without a single objection? What could be that terrible? A venal male spoke at his station. T, those monsters are our neighbors. If FTL ever falls into their lap, we'll be the first ones dead. It won't be your species' turn to carry in. 
Hurry up and K kill them all. Governor Mulnick is correct. From what we've seen, humans are barely sapient. True sapiens don't develop the weapons they have. Chemicals, diseases, bombs, even early satellites, the Farsal representative added. Ah. Thank you, Ambassador Royon. Can you picture those savage apes making it a day in the Federation? They'd eat us, the first chance they get. I shudder to think of Venlo coming across those... things. Anger returned to Samantha's gaze, and her hands curled up into a fist, knowing how close human Venlo relations had become. I could imagine the damage this footage would do. At least, to my knowledge, Governor Tarva had been forthcoming with the United Nations on her species role in that era. It wasn't her doing, so the Terrans shouldn't have a gripe with her. Kai Van Lil pushed everyone away to save the Predator scientists. It makes me wonder what that first contact team said to make Tarva walk back her distress signal. To announce her species stance, Carlos threw his hands in the air. Even the Venlo spewed that vitriol. Hurry up and kill them all. Savage apes? Samantha echoed. Quit pouting and listen. This is the important part, the Harchin reporter hissed. Royon tossed her head on the screen. The humans have a lot in common with you-know-who. We once believed that predators can have feelings, but we learned that lesson the hard way. The Aksha fake plenty of things, from artistry to passivity. We saw how trying to make them one of us turned out. Silene paused the feed. Did you catch that? The historian species of the Federation claims the Aksha faked feelings. Given the context, that implies they showed signs of emotional intelligence before first contact. I mean the Aksher had artwork? The last part was what caught my attention. I don't like the way they said, make them one of us, Samantha growled. The humans were much too eager to spin everything into evidence for the Aksher's tale. I understood why they resented the Federation as Carlos put in perspective long ago. The way those ancient leaders spoke about the Predators made my skin crawl. I hoped it hadn't been so flagrant when the Snowa figure came to them. All the same, the Terran guards were reading too much into one sentence from a stressed diplomat. It's referencing the Federation's uplift of the Archer. We tried to welcome them into the galaxy, and that started this mess. I spat. Samantha glared at me. Then why did they say, one of us, that meant turning them into prey? I don't have enough evidence to reach a determination, Silene sighed. It is difficult to unearth much footage from the Arxer era. I really don't understand how records can be lost in the digital age. Someone has something to hide. Judging by this dialogue, it's become more and more distorted over the years. Carlos bobbed his head. The people who voted to kill us were much more informed about the war's origins. That's useful to know. Good work, Selene. My spines bristled with irritation as I realized the Harchin reporter wasn't challenging the premise at all. This must be some misguided efforts at appeasement. She didn't understand that the Terrans weren't looking for a lackey. This endeavor was too important to insinuate that the Oxer were angelic victims. Creative ability surprised me, but I was certain what passed for art in their culture were war photos and hunting manuals. They were a sociopathic species to the core, and that was a well-documented fact. We uphold our bargains, Harchin, Samantha offered. To be honest, I'm surprised that you're taking this seriously. I'll let you ask us one thing about humanity, but tone down the racism. The reporter flicked her tongue. 
I want to know about your species heroes, your collective dreams, your moral codes. How did they start, and are they universal? Do humans disagree on ethical issues? Uh, that's not one question. Sorry. Surprise flashed in both of the predators' eyes, and I noticed their postures relax. Carlos studied Silene with newfound interest, perhaps reassessing her journalistic acumen. Her query was a question I was interested in myself. If I read the cues right, Terrans possessed an internal conscience, and could use it to steer their worst instincts. Samantha leaned back, crossing her legs. I'll answer as much about that subject as you want, thank you, for taking an interest in the real humanity. Tell her about your international laws, I interjected. Humans have codified rights, even for criminals like me. They let a hospital ship pass to save active enemies when I fought them at our border outposts. Carlos bared his teeth. That's not an awful idea for once, Sovlin. For all that talk about warfare, we've built rules signed by every modern nation to prohibit attacks on civilian populations. To ensure that combatants receive humane treatment. Rights the Federation denied us, Samantha noted. You could sum up human morality in one statement, we call it the Golden Rule. Do unto others as you wish to be done unto you. The Harchin reporter palmed her chin in thought. Traces of fear lingered in her gaze, but I could tell she was listening to their words. That was a lot more than most people would attempt. I'm glad that I was right about her giving them an honest shot. Silene squinted at the duo. Does that still apply? To anyone willing to return the courtesy, sure. But humanity isn't itching to be a galaxy's punching bag, Samantha replied. Their federation broke that rule first. Sam... If I can call you that, the way we all have talked about you is terrible. The public discourse is hateful, and your personal losses resonate with me. Can't imagine what I'd do in your pause. My species was a part of that. The female predator sniffled. There's nothing any of us can do about that now. Let's talk about heroes, shall we? You might be interested in some ancient mythology, how early and modern humans made sense of the world. Selene hesitantly rose to her feet, and dragged her chair alongside the humans. I could see the tears swell in her eyes, alongside the acceleration of her breathing. Her slender arms were shaking, but she situated herself by the humans. She reached out with a trembling appendage, Offering Samantha a tissue, the UN guard took it deftly, and dabbed at her eyes. I... I'd like that. Let me tell your stories, the Harchin replied. A glimmer of hope crept into those green eyes, reminding me of the humanity that came to the galaxy with righteous seal. Those people were still in there, despite their heartache. I had to believe it was possible to mend our rifts, and to steer them from the path of destruction. Those lost on Earth couldn't be brought back, but my predator friends didn't have to die with them. Samantha wove a yarn of supernatural fantasies, early scientists, and ambitious explorers seeking trade routes. Carlos added his own tales of monster slayers and fictional kings, with their own honor code. Terran Lagans sounded grandiose and heroic from their lips. They elevated their greatest champions as guardians and pioneers who advanced civilization at personal risk. The contrast with the legacy of conquest and subjugation Zahn put forward was striking. The prey reptiles shivered from prolonged exposure to humans, absorbing the descriptions of their early history. All it took was active listening 
to keep the predators talking. I mused to myself that this was how it should have been. This was the peace that could have been reality. The Nature of Predators 66 Memory Transcription Subject 1. Captain Sovlin, Federation Fleet Command GTU Standardized Human Time, October 24, 2001, 36 Territory No doubt, the Predators wanted to avoid being picked up by sensor readings. If patrol ships asked us to account for all detected life forms, it would be impossible to hide their presence. Our concerns were validated by the harsh reception we received on descent toward Alpha. Gunships sidled up to us at full speed, and relayed demands to power down our engines. Then they vessel, you are not welcome on Federation grounds. The Colchian's chief Nicanus was broadcasting a hail on military frequencies, with a glare that rivaled human ferocity. I let your beasts speak once, and that was an error on my part. The Gojid Cradle, the Krakotla Army, and dozens of worlds have perished because of that little misstep. I accepted the transmission, striking my serious pose. This is Captain Sovlin from the Gojid Attachment of the Federation Fleet. I am here to request asylum for our refugees. Do the humans think we're idiots? There's six other signatures on board, and you were a known predator prisoner. Nikonos bobbed his indigo tentacles in irritation. By law, Venlu visitors should be held as enemies of state for raising arms against other prey races. I waved for the Harchin reporters to step into the field of view while Talpin and Berna filtered in on my other side. The deaf Gojid wielded a device that could approximate subtitles, and was growing livid from the dialogue. He began punching away at his speech synthesizer, but I flicked my claws in warning. If the Kolshian Commonwealth realized our Terran sympathizing alignment, there might not be an opportunity to land on Alpha. It was an uphill battle to convince them we were friendlies already. You'd think this roll call would assuage their doubts, but they seem to be expecting predator trickery. News of the assault on Earth has reached the wider galaxy. They know the Venlil fought by humanity. Tension was palpable, as my scans confirmed that the Kolshians kept their weapons powered up. I had no idea if they'd deny us passage or attack us outright since nobody had shown any concern for the suffering Gojids. The Federation had abandoned my people thus far. There had been no aid shipments or reinforcements at our borders. Not one friend would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with either Predator for us. Anger bubbled inside my chest, but I pushed it down. Search us all you want. I rescued these Harchin personnel. From an Oxer attack, we have useful intelligence. You're adding to their trauma also, if you care. <sighs> what? What are they hiding on your ship then? Bombs? Bioweapons? The Kolshian demanded. I struggled to keep my voice steady. The Venlo were able to secure my release and move some Gojid refugees to their territories. I'll be happy to discuss the details before the Federation representatives, whoever is here, gracious Chief Nekinus. Let the Harchin speak. I recognize a renowned journalist when I see one, Silene. I want to know about the Federation's response to this multilateral attack, and your plans to deal with these human predators, the journalist said without hesitation. Fahl is barely holding, and there's a refugee crisis brewing on your borders. The people want answers. My people want answers. That doesn't give you the right to barge in here without clearance. You're disrupting important proceedings. This is important too, Chief Nicholas. 
The Colchian breathed a heavy sigh, brushing the tentacle across his forehead. These ship frequencies were often monitored by various media outlets, and I'd hope it'd still generate bad publicity if they turned non-Venlil away. Selene and I felt that Nicanus owed us the truth, even if we entered his territory on false pretenses. The old Captain Sovlin wouldn't have been turned away from a mission objective by anyone. I plotted in a landing course for the Governance Center, and ignored the target lock icons on screen. We would be through Alpha's silky atmosphere long before Nicanus gave a kill order. Nothing involving bureaucrats happened quickly. What are you doing, Sovlin? Have you lost your mind? The Colchian leader hissed. Fire away. You wouldn't dare. I chuckled, noting the irony. Those were the same words I told Tarva responding to her distress signal, right before the Venlo threw missiles in my face. Shooting down asylum seekers would have the wondrous consequence of raining debris on college students. I will speak my piece, and I don't care if you like it. Nikana's bulbous eyes stretched wide. Are you trying to start a war? This is rash and impulsive, unbecoming of a Federation officer. What have I got to lose? My cradle is dead, and I'm one of the last survivors of a dying species. It's time someone let us Gojit speak for ourselves. We don't even get that courtesy. The Kolshian waved a tentacle in a dismissive gesture and forwarded an open hangar location. It was all I could do to slow to a safe landing velocity. Banna and Tolpin seemed terrified of my flying. The two of them had found their way back to their harnessed seats. Our ship ducked the spaceport overhang with an inch to spare. FTL traffic control gulped from the observation room as I careened down while firing reverse thrusters. Our massive ship slid into the docking port like a plug into a socket. Colchion soldiers rushed across the terminal, flooding from the connector tunnel to the governance hall. They bore weapons designed to hamper any human predators that magically popped into existence, including heavy guns and strobe lights. I laughed to myself, appreciating how absurd this reaction was. Perhaps these extermination officer wannabes will try to arrest me. I doubt they like that stunt I pulled, but the humans would think it's hilarious, I noted. Ah, Traytector, those predators get humor. Kai, the Colchians rigged explosive charges by the exit hatch before we could disembark of our own volition. They entered with gun muzzles ready and hold orders at all of us. My spines bristled at their intimidation, but the fear didn't reach my brain. I struck a bored pose as they pressed a rifle to my temple, pushing it away with a light claw tap. Meanwhile, the Harchin reporters and Gojid refugees had dropped to the floor in terror. Your hospitality needs some work, I remarked. That's no way to welcome guests. The Colchian soldiers shared a glance, incredulous at my derangement. They swept every corner of our ship, including inside storage cabinets. Amusement flared up once more, as I thought about Carlos folded up like a suitcase to fit in a drawer half his size. Several glares latched onto me, and I was flung to the floor by a rough tentacle. It took an inordinate amount of time for their thorough search, but our hosts became satisfied that humans weren't lying in wait. The Commonwealth Guards waved to stand up, and ushered us out the door. The eight-sided landing pad had an array of stores and offices built into its walls. Flashing signs directed ambassadorial attaches to the governance hall, written in several languages including the artificially created e common which was only used by pretentious diplomats. The general public were welcome to Federation proceedings as spectators, but they weren't cleared to land here. Media personnel hurried out from the connector tunnel, just as we cleared the terminal's threshold. 
They seemed disappointed to find the unannounced arrival was a few Gojits and Harchin. Whatever in Outlet's stance on humanity, the Predator's cell mantra was true. Journalists captured footage of us with our Kolshian escort, with a few calling Silani and I by name. I avoided eye contact and kept my lips sealed. Silani, Harch and Ambassador Ryla will welcome you to hear your report on Fall. A Kolshian soldier turned to me, radiating contempt. She is in crucial talks with undecided Federation members now, so you need to show some patience, Ensoflin. I kept a placid expression, though I knew our neutral faction could not turn on humanity. Of course, we'll wait outside until she's ready. Would you show us there, please? The Kolshian beckoned, with a cerulean tentacle, steering us through winding corridors. Our journey ventured away from the massive auditorium, where state business was conducted. Architects on Alpha seemed to derive joy from constructing floor plans that looked like mazes. It was a wonder we didn't get lost. Perhaps a simpleton like me couldn't understand beauty, but I wished the humans would gut the whole place. Terran layouts were always neat and orderly. We reached an escalator that transported us to a basement. A subway train waited for us and whisked us below the street to the ambassadorial offices. I didn't understand why the diplomatic living arrangements were in the hall's premises, while the workspaces were separate. I suppose this was the only way to provide every species with spacious accommodations. The Kolshian soldiers steered us into a lobby once we arrived at the station. An elevator ride to the 12th floor was the last step of our journey, and I yawned to express annoyance. Judging by the iconography of Inatala, with flowers in her beak, this must be the Krakotl's home. Closed doors sealed off a conference room, which I yearned to break into. This is my chance to speak to the Federation, the ones that can still turn back. I have to impress the need to appease humanity. Hi. I sprinted toward the meeting area, catching the Kolshians by surprise. A soldier placed a tentacle on my shoulder, and my spines extended further. In a flash of outrage, my claws scratched gashes into his soft skin. Silani gasped at my violent assault, but I had no intention of waiting. This was too important to let some grunt stand in our way. The Kolshians drew their guns, no doubt worried that the human predators had corrupted me. The Harchin reporter leapt in their path and waved her arms to compensate for her short stature. I burst into the assembly. Dozens of pupils darted in my direction. Ambassador Jerolim squawked angrily. What on Nishtal is this interruption? From the man who pushed the bleeding hearts into the human's arms, because itch poor, Marcel. Ah, what Captain Sovlin did to that human was wholly cruel and unnecessary. Whatever side of the aisle you're on, Chief Nicanus returned. It's a predator just like in Noah was. You traitors use their names, which is validating the whole premise of personhood. What's next? An Aksha speaker named Huggable. A female Mazik flared her trunk. Noah is obviously a monster. Even he realized that. But his arguments were sound. We don't have the luxury of trusting our gut. Fret, not Jerolim, everyone recognizes the image of evil when it's right in front of them. Do they? That's why you're the only allied race that came to this meeting? Varsula Ambassador Dark tossed her floppy ears. They won't meet with you because you physically attacked anyone who sided with humanity last time. I've apologized for that. I'm willing to talk to everyone now, though you don't deserve it. What I did was the only sensible reaction to heresy. 
A clamor of voices rose in disharmony, leveling accusations and shouting conflicting views. I was horrified that these were our leaders. They had the emotional maturity of misbehaving children. The good news was that I didn't need to fake diplomatic aplomb. If talking the loudest was the only way to get through to them, that was right up my alley. I am speaking now. My roar shook my vocal cords as I leapt onto the table to draw attention. Gerald Lim, I think your army is gone. So you have nothing to throw your weight around with. That's why you're talking. The Krakotl ambassador craned his neck in irritation. You have no right, protector. You make more senseless noise than a stampede. The undecided voters here, most notably the Sulian and Italia Alliance, are likely leaning toward war with the humans. This is all based on the Cradle's fall, but nobody here was actually there but me. Are the Gojids nothing more than a talking point to you, without our own voice? We served this Federation for six centuries. Chief Nikonis cleared his throat. The Federation respects the contributions of the Gojiti Union, who worked tirelessly in our defense throughout this war. The Kolshian Commonwealth was saddened by the tragedy that befell your people. That said, we already got the details from Dr. Zarn of the Takan Coalition, your doctor. Zahn? He said that all humans deserve to die from the moment we laid eyes on Marcel. Much like the Krakotlo ambassador with the Snoa. What you need to know is that Prime Minister Piri and I saw empirical and irrefutable evidence that flipped our stance. My question is, does anyone care what really happened? Of course, we care. Go ahead, Captain, the Sulian observer interjected. The simple fact is, the humans never attacked a single civilian or even medical target. We were gearing up for an attack on Earth, so they took out our military capabilities to stop us. The Akshar took advantage of the lapse in fortification and started bombing everything in sight. Terran military personnel risked their lives to evac our people. Jerulim puffed out his chest. The Predators were just collecting their own cattle. It didn't surprise me that the Federation assumed our refugees were livestock. But that was why Talpin was here. The Koshian soldiers stood steadfast at the door, forming an organic wall between my posse and the diplomat. Hearing the Krakatl's claim, Berna barreled over a guard with a headbutt. Her brother was close behind. Zilani slipped through the dazed soldiers, though the other Harchin journalists weren't as quick to act. Top in his death, and he can attest that humans treat him with dignity. One of my guards had a deaf brother too. They don't discard their own like the Orksha, I retorted. I thought I was going to suffer in Terran custody, but my victim claimed that wasn't who he was. The UN gave me a second chance. The Harchin ambassador, Ryla, turned to Silene. Enough, predator. Apologetics. Asphal holding. The reporter wiggled her toes. Yes, but the Arkshire claimed the raid was retribution for Earth. The humans seem to have them under some level of control. That can either be really good or really bad. They are working together? Officially? Jerolim shrieked. How old you? I shook my head. The Arkshar aligned to the humans to gain their alliance, because they recognized their potential. I was on the bridge of a Terran warship when they returned, and took back the cradle. They won against an enemy we can't hold a candle to, with three months FDL experience and primitive ship. They boarded a cattle ship so methodically that the Greys surrendered. Key disbelieving expressions swept across the room, at the thought of those raging monsters giving up mid-fight. Even Silene had difficulty absorbing that tidbit. 
While it was common knowledge that Gojid territory had fallen to predators, the situation was more complex than that. That battle was the moment I recognized how well humanity could harness their instincts. They had better control on their neural wiring than any of us. Silani blinked. Is that why the Greys decided to honor humanity's claim to Gojids? Respect? I know, or care, what goes through the minds of those savages. I care about the empathetic primates who eat fruit and have protective instincts. My Federation friends, don't you understand the importance of appeasing humanity? You're forcing a species much smarter and more tactical into the Grey's arms. Chief Mykonos leaned back. Appeasement was always my plan, and people like Geraldine thought they knew better. Have the two creditors wear each other down, then it will be much easier to clean up the survivors. If they want to duke it out, why make them turn their guns on us? My jaw almost dropped to the floor. Using the humans to destroy the Arxir, then mopping up their remnants, was the cold, calculating idea I'd expect from a predator. The United Nations deserved to be shown genuine kindness. It was all I could do to keep my mouth shut. After cooperating through an alliance, these people would get attached to the Terrans eventually. This might be the only way to save the Federation. I want humanity to survive, but I can't feed every race in the galaxy to the Greys to achieve that. If humans want to know where every race stands, that was their message, I said. Make your decision, and contact the United Nations. Well, those of you that haven't already fucked your species over. Ryla wiggled her toes in discomfort. We joined the attack on Earth and I can't say I regret that. I regret that it failed. Silani glared at the Harchin ambassador. You should be ashamed of yourself. Surrender unconditionally and beg their forgiveness. We can't hold out if the Greys send reinforcements once they finish up with defenseless Nishtal. This is a wake-up call. I growled, nobody who openly opposed the humans has survived, assuming the 24 attackers fall to the Arxer. All that matters is that we survive, but it's your choice. Go with our last chance at survival, or push the predators into the Grey's arms. Agreement glittered in the eyes of the Kolshian chief, and a contemplative silence swept through the room. I hoped my argument was more compelling than the humans' vengeful demands. My trust in the Federation's decision-making was gone, where predators were involved. After decades of faithful service, this plea was a final effort to save the species I pledged to defend. The Nature of Predators 67 Memory Transcription Subject Reconvene tomorrow morning My arrival had disrupted the proceedings from reaching a consensus but I was glad I had said my part. News took a long time to travel at interstellar distances, and the Federation representatives were making decisions based on outdated and incomplete information. With that step checked off, I could focus on acquiring the evidence of Arkshire First Contact. It was peculiar that the records weren't publicly available, but the Arkshire had engaged in planet-wide wars documentation of such brutality could be traumatizing to watch, so it might be best kept under lock and key. Graphic content should be reserved for the highest ranking officials. The general public didn't need to live with the full scope of their nightmarish deeds. How would the humans feel if people were traumatized by their own footage? Carlos and Sam should be more open-minded. Chief Nikonas was one of the last to leave Geraldine's meeting shooting daggers at the Krakotl ambassador. Supposedly, the avian had dive-bombed the Kolshian leader while he announced vote results. I was surprised that Krakotl Alliance personnel weren't removed from Federation activities after not respecting member sovereignty. Their bullying methods were something I'd noticed for years. 
Chakotla were pioneers of all aggressive countermeasures we use. They were crucial to our war efforts, I reminded myself. Kolshian soldiers crowded us as the leaders departed, and I wondered if we were bound for a cell. Trespassing charges could be levied against all of us, with some validity. My captain's rank was still active. To the best of my knowledge, disobeying orders could have me stripped of all credentials. Selene didn't seem concerned by our insubordination though. She was flagging down Nicanus as soon as he rose from his chair. I stand by my request for answers on the refugee crisis, Chief Nikonus. The Harchin reporter shouted. The Veration's disagreement and violence toward each other has left people with no faith in their government. The elderly Kolshian ambled toward the exit. Am I to worry about the people's faith now? Yes. It's a matter of time before someone, maybe at my publication, runs with the info I have. It would be extremely damaging to the Federation. Trust me, you need to sit down with me, if you want to maintain stability. Nikonus paused. The reporter seemed to have struck a nerve with that last comment, and left him wondering what dirt she had on the Federation. He didn't know that much of it was silly speculation, combined with predator lies. I suppose he was thinking more about the killing of Federation diplomats, assuming that plot was government-backed. In my office. Go quietly, he decided. The Kolshian guards shoved us forward on their leader's order, digging a rifle butt into my shoulder. The soldier tailgating me cursed as he ran into my spines and was left with prickle wounds all over his form. It was all I could do to stifle a chuckle. I could transport myself to the elevator without hovering grunts. The lift descended to the lowest floor, which housed the original suite belonging to the Kolshians. The Commonwealth Decor referenced their aquatic roots, with massive saltwater tanks lining the walls. Rows of seaweed were planted on the floor, while floating lilies formed the upper layer. I wondered what the humans would think of placing marine habitats indoors. They'd probably think it was as stupid as I did. Nikonus signaled for his guards to stay outside, and he sealed the doors once we entered his office. Next came a polite tentacle gesture toward a sofa. I was happy to sit down after vaulting onto a table and walking all across the governance complex. Berna shared a glance with Tolpin. Humans are wonderful caretakers, Nikonus. They have nurturing instincts that rival our own. I'll skip the niceties. You two were brought here to sway votes, and I have little time for mind games, the chief said. Tolpin pounded away at his synthesizer. Damn you! We want the Federation to offer us asylum. Why haven't you done anything for us? The Predators could have sent you to their friends, the Paltons. They take the most refugees of anyone in the galaxy. We would be happy to coordinate with them. The Paltons are on the opposite side of Federation space, and you know that. They're a month of travel time away. Ban a spat. The Kolshian chief stood and walked to the door with brisk strides. He whispered something to the guards, who dragged the refugees out by the arm. Outrage pumped through my blood, but I managed to keep silent. All they did was beseech Federation aid. It was sad when enemy predators had gone above and beyond to help us. And our allies thought us an inconvenience. Nicanus settled back down behind his desk. I will not be guilt-tripped into bringing human spies to live with us. Silene, what is it that you think you know about the Federation? I have witnesses who say that you gave the voters for diplomatic relations faulty ships. Forensic evidence confirms their tale, Silene hissed. You set out to kill Federation diplomats in cold blood just for speaking with the Predators. Furthermore, 
you made the Tarkin representative disappear because he saw your plot. Bold, yet foolish, accusations. A person who did such things could make you disappear too, my dear. If I don't contact my people within a few days, that story will be run as it is. Simply with the tagline, Reporter vanishes after questioning Kolshi on misconduct. A cover-up would confirm your guilt, but I want to help make this go away. You need Sovlin and I to protect the Federation's interests. You know we'd pick you all over those ugly predators. Chief Nikonis scrunched up his face at the word ugly. Perhaps he was wondering if we shared the same view of the furless Kolshians. But... Their aquatic skin was easy on the eyes, and they didn't have the paralyzing stereoscopic vision. The bizarre thing about humans was they had small patches of hair, in random places. Regardless, a Harchin individual wouldn't curl her lip at hairless beings, when her race had no fur either. And a better hope Silene's response makes him talk. She just gave our Kolshian host a good reason to dispose of us, too. How much do you know? Nikonus asked. Silene flicked her tongue in anticipation. Everything. I know you deleted the first contact files from the records. The Aksher have emotional intelligence and artwork. The Federation saw those traits in humans when we observed them the first time but only recorded the negative attributes. I get that you wanted Riesel dead for treason. Why didn't you just execute him and the Terran ambassador on Alpha? I waited for a denial to tumble from the Kolshian's mouth, but the troubled glint in his eyes worried me. His pupils darted toward the door, as though he was considering summoning the guards. Chills ran up my spines. There was something off about his reaction. Slander against the Federation should draw a vehement response. Nikonus's bulbous eyes narrowed. The people recognized me as a reasonable leader, who gave a predator the chance to speak. Gunning down a pleading representative, in front of cameras, makes people question our morality. The exact reason that what Sovlin did is a terrible look. Everyone said I was more than fair to Noah. I even fed and provided for the human. Determination sparkled in Silene's gaze. You didn't fully answer my question, also. Why wait until the diplomats were out of Kolshian territory for the shuttle malfunction? Out of sensor range. Everyone, including their governments, would assume the Predator killed them. Nobody saw what happened, and the people don't need to know. Why not? Because you hate humans, and never intended for them to get a real chance. I don't hate humans, but their diplomatic efforts cannot succeed. Look at the disaster that is the Venmil. How many civilians want to see humans attending our meetings, walking these grounds, living here? Also, our people would start asking questions about predators that we don't want them to ask. Unease swirled around in my belly as those lost words registered with me. This Koshian chief must be going senile in his old age. Perhaps I was reading basic paranoia as something more, because the humans kept whispering theories in my ears. Silene palmed her chin. Federation citizens shouldn't ask questions about how first contact with the Aksha really went. We have it on good faith that you starved the Greys to death. You, you must not I run that storyline. The chief hissed, leaping from his seat. It would do irreparable damage to general morale, and it's not the whole truth. You're a good journalist, Silene not someone who lives on shock value. Any reporter worth their salt isn't trying to disintegrate the Federation. Dizziness corkscrewed up my body, and I fought back the urge to scream. 
A ringing sensation drowned out all auditory signals, the tempest of emotions made me want to pass out. The shock was the strongest, as my mind began unraveling. The Kolshian bat couldn't have just said what I heard. The Aksha were the ones who attacked us, because they were the Aksha. My entire worldview was shattered in an instant. The anger over what happened to my family, knowing that the Federation were responsible, it was unspeakable. What I wanted to believe was that humans were unique predators, while the Arksha were demonic monsters. It was difficult to accept that my entire life was based on a lie. Saying that the starvation tale wasn't the whole truth meant that it had some veracity to it. I hadn't even been listening to what Koth said during its interrogation, because an Arxer's words didn't matter. The only thing I cared about was if the humans had made it scream. The Greys deserved to suffer for eating my family alive. Why couldn't the damn Terran see that? What did you do? I charged across the desk at Mykonis, and my vision blurred from rage. My claws were by his throat before I knew it, pinning him against the chair. You move an inch and I'll tug your esophagus through your jawbone. The Kolshian blinked. Thou noun. You are quite unstable, Sovlin. Your monkey pals have done a number on you. Fuck you. They're not monkeys any more than you're an Actalan. It's a distant evolutionary link, a term you use to disapientize them. Start talking your heart out, or I'll carve you up. Silene tugged at my arm. Please stop, you're scaring me. Nikonus is cooperating. Don't you want to hear what he has to say? No, I don't. We came here to stop a human Arxer alliance, not add fuel to the fire. Maybe we should cover this up, so our people survive. Ka, the Arxer say that you tried to make them allergic to meat. I took a deep breath, and backed away from the Kolshian. I didn't understand what it was saying, but I think it meant they starve without flesh. You talk to a grey? Nikonus' voice leapt up an octave, before he collected himself. I'm disappointed in you, Sovlin. You used to be a good officer, now you're a complete disgrace. Your family would be disgusted with the company you keep. You know, in nothing about my family. Talk, just fucking talk now. While my words were still charged with anger, conscious thought crept in. The logical side of me realized how dangerous it was to publish this. Whatever really happened, we were in a war of extinction. There couldn't afford to be any doubt. Narrative clarity is what gave the Federation conviction. Without it, we would start losing worlds faster than ever, and face divisions within our own ranks. The Kolshian sighed. There were three of us who laid out the groundwork for the Federation. When Kolshian explorers came in contact with the Farsal, more than a thousand years ago, the galaxy was young. We were the first in this sector to escape our gravity well. You know about the founding of this institution, but I reiterate it just in case. The Krakotl were the third, Silene offered. Yes. They were a problem from the start. Aggressive, disagreeable. We tried to identify the problem, and why they were so ill-equipped for spacefaring. We learned they were scavengers, who would occasionally go for fish as well. We were more level-headed because we're herbivores. My jaw almost hit the floor as I tried to digest this information. The Krakal, a race I had cooperated with throughout my career, consumed meat a thousand years ago. It was tough to believe that they'd hidden that fact from everyone else. Thinking of them as predators didn't compute in my brain. By the protector, they had side-facing eyes, 
and a religion against flesh-eating beasts. My endearment to the humans was all that stopped me from wanting the birds removed from the Federation. Flesh-eaters deserved a chance, and we had managed to coexist for centuries. I didn't understand what Nicanus's scavenger descriptor meant, but the Colchians must have put an unholy amount of time into predator research. We gave them a choice, take our cure, or we would wipe them out with a bioweapon. It was an easy choice for them. We brought them to be re-educated in camps, and the new religions were the algae, on the fruit mash. They are to hate predators, or they'd find a way to revert back. Silani bore an aghast expression. You invented the cult of Inatala? Beliefs, religious or not, are the best way to control people. We planted fake archaeological texts and rewrote their history. They've become a productive race. Harder to control now, but the cultural changes stuck. They have an enemy, a purpose. Do the Krakotl have any idea what was done to them? The Krakotl know this, obviously. That would be cruel, Silani Data. It's a closely guarded secret of the highest ranking Fossil and Colchians. The process is down to a science, more subtle these days. We keep peace, and give grotesque races a chance at normalcy. Races? Plural? I echoed. A sadistic glint surfaced in his pupils, though it was gone a second later. Perhaps Nicanus sensed how much this narrative hurt me. I had no idea how to feel about the Krakatl being a cured race. It clearly hadn't ended their aggression, given their intimidation tactics still. It would be cruel for Gerilim to learn about this past. Yes, I'll get to that. We learned a hard lesson about giving full-on predator races the same chance. Hunting and scavenging are different. Hunting, being an actual predator, means unchecked war and violence, he explained. The greys gasked us for help with their food problem, then refused to try herbivory. Their arrogance is why they starve. Silani narrowed her eyes. You also killed their cattle to be sure. They've shouted that one from the rooftops before. Blatantly untrue. We don't kill herbivore animals. We're not predators. That's just absurd. I swallowed in discomfort. There's others in the Federation that used to eat meat. You said you'd get to that. Oh, Sovlin, I already told you. For the small minority of species who don't find herbivory alone, we teach them the right way. Doesn't the religion against predators sound familiar? Something clicked in my brain as the prevalence of the great protector faith flashed through my mind. The Federation encouraged it as an emblem of Gojid culture. No, that couldn't be right. I wasn't a predator. The thought of eating meat sickened me, and our government had been the first to take action against Earth. The damn Colchian looked so sure of himself though, somehow, my heart knew he was telling the truth. I sank to my knees, and stared at my lengthy claws in horror. The ancestors in my genes ate carcasses. My body was conditioned for a tut. Acid surged in my throat before I puked all over Nicanus's feet. The Colchian leader massaged my neck. Oh, it's all right. We fixed your species, one of the most successful conversions. Chalk it up as something you have in common with the upright apes. The self-hatred was on the same level as when I realized my mistake with Marcel Silani was giving me the petrified look she gave Carlos like I was a monster. All I wanted was to escape from my body. There was no way I could control predator instincts I didn't know I had. This was a nightmare of unimaginable proportions. 
No. Oh, you are lying, I whimpered. I am not. See, Selene? It's cruel. It... The reporter's eyes watered. I don't know what to say. This is a lot at once. I crumpled into a ball, letting my tears drip to the floor. A faint thought wondered how the humans would react, but I didn't have the energy for hypotheticals. Everyone I ever knew and loved, myself and my family, were abominations. Not only had the Federation done what the Arkshur said, but our members were corrupted. My perennial allegiance was gone. What did Gojid history actually look like? What elements of our culture had been wiped away? I didn't know how we'd begin to figure that out. With the cradle gone, it wasn't clear who we were, or how to retain a cohesive identity. The humans, for all their goodwill, couldn't help us in this regard. Nikonis leaned forward. Now, you see why it's important to protect these secrets. People like the Gojits can live in peace from their past. We've made it possible for them to walk among us without threatening stability. We saved them. What you did is wrong, Selene whispered, shooting a glance at me. You've been conducting genetic engineering on innocent species at I don't even know how large a scale. Your actions are going to kill us all between the Arxa and the humans. You haven't learned a thing here. If you publish any of this, I'll shoot it down as a wild fabrication. There's no proof. Nobody would believe you. The Harchin chuckled bitterly and pointed to her notepad. A tiny camera was taped to the top, blinking yellow. My gaze focused on the lens. A desperate plea for help, I wondered if the humans were watching this livestream now, from their shuttle. The Kolshian's eyes widened with horror, and he slapped a tentacle over his mouth. Selene cleared her throat. They don't have to believe me. You just told everyone yourself. Nikonis bared his teeth. What? Short-sighted bitch. You have no idea what you've just done. I should have you both shot. Ha. <sighs> Execute us on video. Go ahead. The truth is out there, and you can't take it back. There was a certainty in her words, and she knelt beside me, without hesitation. I let her help me stand, grateful for the support. Kindness for the Gojits might be on permanent hiatus, now that we were outed as predators. Nausea lingered around the notion of my species eating meat. It would take years to make sense of this interaction. I didn't know that Silene was right to broadcast any of this, even with the lies and manipulation we'd uncovered. Regardless, Nobody could have known the content Nicholas would divulge. It would be curious to see how the Federation citizens reacted to our interview. The humans were destined to side with the Arxer now, so what mattered was the time we had left. The Nature of Predator's 68 Memory Transcription Subject Governor Tarva of the Venlo Republic State Way Standardized Human Time October 21st 2000. It took a second to identify my surroundings as a hospital room, and another to recall how I ended up here. A human was reclining in a chair with wire-rimmed glasses over her eyes and dark curls falling over her face. That was Sarah Rosario, browsing something on her holopad. Sarah. I goggled. Her rosy lips curved up in a smile and she switched off her reading materials. The predator sprang up from her seat in a heartbeat, pressing a water glass to my lips. I didn't understand why she was here, but it was good to see a familiar face. The scientist hadn't made contact with my office since Earth's fall, 
I was worried about her. Sarah placed a hand on my shoulder. Stay down. Your body has been through quite a shock. I don't know how to say this. I watched in silence as the human bit her lip, a gesture that suggested discomfort. She removed her glasses and set them on the bedside table. The intensity of those forward-facing eyes, observing every little detail, was mesmerizing. I tried to signal with an ear flick that it was okay to be direct. That was a go-ahead, right? Well, I'm afraid your tail had to be amputated, Tarva, the scientist sighed. If it was lacerated a few inches higher, you would have spinal damage. The good news is, you can walk and return to normal activities. I lowered my eyes, taking a moment to process the news. I suspected as much, seeing the look on Noah's face. But so much of our non-verbal communication is with tail signals. It's like your fingers. I know, and we want to help. I've gotten in touch with some great people on Earth who've created prosthetics for animals. Sarah offered a comforting smile. It'll take some getting used to, but the prototype I ordered for you is cutting edge. It'll respond to your brain signals. We'd have it ready quicker, but our manufacturing is scrambled. My thoughts turned back to the maimed human attendees. It could have been much worse for me, as there had to be a vast number of casualties. My heart ached at the thought of more dead Terrans. I still couldn't understand why anyone would do such a thing. Even predators killed for a reason, knowing why this happened would offer solace. Explaining an event to my government and my citizens, which no doubt had been sensationalized by the media, would be a challenge. The Venlo populace must be freaked out. The smooth sailing months of first contact lulled us into feeling safe around humans. This would give the exterminators backing for their vehement objections to the infestation. I leaned back against the pillow. I hope I didn't say anything harsh about humans. My memory is... Uh, a bit fuzzy on the details. That's... natural. Your brain is protecting itself. She responded. You were badly injured and in shock, and what you went through would traumatize a lot of humans, too. If you're scared of me now, I'll leave. I understand the event is fresh. No, please stay. I just feel sad. I really wanted to see humanity succeed. You're my predators, my friends, my snarling guardians. What happened, Sarah? I don't understand. You know we react differently than you. You might have heard us reference our flight or fight response, as opposed to your flight alone instincts. When crowds panic for you, they're stampedes, we can have those too. But if a human group is agitated with our fight side, understanding dawned on me, and I exhaled a shuddering laugh. Sarah raised an eyebrow in a quizzical gesture. The fact that it was a predator's stampede, not any murderous undercurrent, took a weight off my shoulders. Everyone would be able to grasp how personal agency became hazy in those situations. The humans are just like us, a more aggressive version of us. Oi, of course, the Terrans felt like we did during an Ark raid. They were threatened by a genocidal enemy, one they couldn't hope to fight or dissuade. Every second on Venlo Prime, they were scared for their lives and for their entire species. Combine that with grief, and even stalwart predators would lose their refinement. The bomb's chaos made fear-driven anger spill over. It was the mere culmination of a horrendous week for humanity. If it's like a stampede, then it'll make sense to any Venlo that things got out of hand. I must issue a statement to the public and see that charges aren't pressed. We know what it's like to lose control, I reassured her. 
What? There's no excuse for violence. Sarah's lips moved in a frenzy, as though she couldn't say the words fast enough. I was helping you understand the behavior, not exonerating it. Humans are expected to control ourselves, no matter how extreme the circumstances. Many people are hurt or dead, that's never acceptable. It was awful, I do recall. Noah took a long time to stand. Wait, where is Noah? The female scientist lifted a bouquet of earth-born flowers from the table and brought them over to me. They were an intricate cone of petals bearing a rich shade of red. Unless this was a human gesture of condolences, I assumed those were left as a gift from Noah. I was still puzzled why he wasn't present, but I took the alien plants with gratitude. Noah sat by your side all night, refused to let any doctors look at him. The blast gave him a minor concussion. I had to talk some sense into him, tell him to rest up, Sarah said. I'm sure you'd want him to take care of himself. But he bought you these first, said he hoped they'd cheer you up. I flicked my ears. What about Maya? The human's thin smile fell in a heartbeat, like I'd asked her something terrible. There was the knowing glint in her eyes. It was the pitiful look of someone who couldn't bring herself to say the words. Sharing the worst news was difficult when it was bound to enact a heavy toll on another person. Tears swelled around my irises long before she found her voice. Sarah averted her eyes. The Secretary General is dead. He bled out on the operating table, too many organs ruptured. Gunshot wounds to the abdomen are nasty. I'm sorry. I pulled the blanket over my face in an attempt to smother the grief. Elias Maya had dedicated himself to virtue and the pursuit of peace to the last. Every temptation pushed him the opposite direction, but he was true to his beliefs. He steered humanity toward its best attributes. I counted on him to make hard decisions for everyone's benefit. The Secretary General was always kind to us, and bent over backward for our partnership to succeed. Kilias will be missed. He was a true leader, willing to do whatever was necessary. He dreamed big. There was so much he could have offered humanity. The Venlo doctors completed a brain scan post-mortem. At the forceful request of extermination officers, the female human continued. They wanted data to distinguish good ones from human animals. Analysis of our thoughts, weaknesses, and anatomy. Tava, I don't like the sound of that. My head poked out from the blanket. What? They're not in charge. Get General Cam over there and make sure nobody else touches him. Cam cleared them out for us soon as the UN got wind of it. Lots of people don't trust humans after, well, the bomber of the assembly released their call to arms. We don't know how to allay the general fear. We're doing everything we can to identify the culprit, but that might take time. Sarah lowered herself onto the edge of the bed, bringing her holopad into view. A human wearing a mask was recording themselves on video. Something about the way this one leaned forward with aggression screamed Predator. There were no identifying features visible, so this could be any Terran I passed. The surroundings were dark, leaving no way of discerning the location either. Even the voice was distorted by some filter, which made the words throatier than an ox's cadence. Our leaders have been putting alien interests before ours. They dragged humanity into a war we have no business being a part of, without getting the full picture. Elias Meyer's death is the first step in putting things right. He failed to defend Earth, while capitulating to the creatures who put us down. 
He, and everyone like him, are responsible for the billions dead. The Predator finished the first segment of their claim, that boastful attitude resembled happiness, while taking credit for the dead human leader. How could that seem like an achievement to anyone behind the mask? The speaker was expressionless as they continued, but the accusatory finger wag they threw in was decisive, ripe with anger. It is time we have a government that puts humanity first. We are a superior species, more than the mindless animals that populate this galaxy. It's time we claim our rightful mantle. Justice and retribution are due, not the peace groveling Meyer sought to our detriment. He was weak in the face of continual attacks. He was soft in the face of ultimatums. A senile traitor to mankind. The anonymous Terran breathed an aggravated sigh, losing steam for a moment. They collected their thoughts and refocused on the camera. Despite not being able to see the ferocious eyes, I could feel their gaze cutting through me like a blade. This predator was unstable, polluted by hatred and blame. From now on, we must make sure that any human who appeases alien interests has no safe haven. The officials must be replaced by force if necessary. We will not allow anyone to apologize for our nature anymore. Any aliens who side against us must be treated as enemies. Now is the time to take action, my fellow man. Make your voices heard and show no mercy. Death to the Federation! My eyes stretched wide after the verbose speech concluded on a morbid note. I had no idea that humans had such scorn for the Secretary General. And for the crime of wanting peace, of all things. The attack on Earth wasn't his fault. Blaming Meyer for not pulling out a miracle was preposterous. Honestly, the Predators were fortunate their planet survived at all. There was a reason Venlo wanted to gloss over the necessary intervention of the Arxer. We didn't want to associate our friends' humanity with the race of savage tormentors. I doubted many people would be open to considering that the Federation started the war, besides me. My hesitation existed because our predators had been slapped in the face time and again. I understood how Terrans might think the Akshur were the lesser evil after recent suffering skewed their view. The Greys were the ones who showed interest in diplomacy and came to Earth's rescue in their darkest hour. I couldn't fault my friends for questioning their loyalties. Still, it was jarring to hear a human murderer call for violent acts against the Federation and the UN Aid. I heaved an anxious sigh. I've never heard one of your people talk like that. Is that what, well, predator disease looks like in predators? Uh, I guess. Most humans are normal as can be. Harmless, unless harmed. Sarah scratched her scalp and hunched her shoulders with discomfort. Our outliers are more extreme because we have more of an inherent ability for violence. I apologize for the supremacist rhetoric that individual broadcasted. Not your fault. I'll happily agree that you're a superior species in many ways. But mindless animals sounds like it could come verbatim from an arxer. Oh, uh, and need to get out of here. Now. Sarah pushed me back as I swung my legs over the bedside. My brain had blotted out Maya's last request upon waking, likely because my subconscious wanted to avoid the task. The Secretary General had known his survival odds were negligible. Freeing the Venlo cattle was what he wished to be his legacy. Elias claimed that the nightmarish chief hunter aspired to end the war and sapient farming. It was quite possible the Secretary General 
was projecting his own dreams. That human wouldn't have intended for me to get hurt, of course. He had little concept of how manipulative and deceitful Aksha were. It was tough to tell where calculation ended and authenticity began. The hateful words Meyer touted as theatrics, a stunt by Isif to avoid execution, had convinced me well enough. There hadn't been a moment's hesitation when he called me lesser and an animal. Much like the human bomber, the fact that the first parallel that popped into my mind was a Terran mass murderer wasn't a good sign. Did I trust the Secretary General's judgment enough to go through with this? It wasn't like I actually heard what Isif told Maya for myself, to make my own judgment. It's down to whether I believe an obligate child eater could want peace. <sighs> Stop kidding me. Governor, you're not going anywhere. The scientist objected. You're just tiring yourself out. I flicked my ears. The Venlo cattle exchange has to go through, and Maya isn't here to finish it. This can't wait. I have no idea who your new leader is, or what they'll do. Elias begged me to speak to Isif. I respect him too much not to try. Isif? The Arxus commander in this sector? Maya shouldn't have requested that, especially with your personal history. Despite that, if an Arxer truly wanted peace, I am willing to try. It's... it's... intentions I'm concerned about. Our history with them doesn't offer any indication of empathy. But you know they've shown it to humans. Or uh, at least mimicked it. The mere thought of Isif makes me shudder and want to crawl under the bed. Damn it. I'm going, before I change my mind. I just have to release a statement to the Venlo people first, for your sake. Sarah knitted her coarse brows together and raised a finger in the Terran, unsecond gesture. She retrieved a wheelchair from the corner, moving me into it before I could protest. How weak and frail did the human think I was? I could walk on my own. Getting used to the lack of balance from my missing tail before I face-planted with Isif was important. I'm coming with you, and it's not a debate. Noah's not the only one who can disregard his welfare, she quipped. I squirmed as the chair rolled out of the room. You don't have to do that. The work you're doing with the Venlo soldiers is important. You're more important, besides. I thought you'd want someone you knew as your liaison. I'm here as the interim ambassador, and also as an old friend who owes her life to you. Isif is less likely to harm you with a human around, so I'm coming. Well, alright, if you insist. The two of us have a lot of catching up to do, Sarah. I haven't seen you since the exchange program. Huh, you were gone to Afa for over a month with Loverboy. I hate politics, anyways. Your diplomatic functions bore me to death, if I'm honest. I'll be a poor ambassador for that stuff. Likewise, doing your work, all the data and analyzing would bore me silly. But your curiosity was one of the first things that made me sense a kindred spirit in humans. I know how much research excites you. Oh. The science going on now is everything I've dreamed of. We're mapping the Venlo genome, testing fear responses, and writing essays about your sociology and ecology. Full study might take centuries, but the breakthroughs we're making are priceless. Suffice to say, I'm happy manning the projects and lecture circuits. It didn't escape my notice that Sarah avoided mentioning the Oxer as a topic of interest despite their commonalities with humans. Something told me that she was afraid of Isif too. The Grey's actions had sickened her from the start. Her unease made me feel a bit better, 
about my soul-crushing dread. What good could come of this meeting Elias wanted, beyond a bitter agreement? I wasn't sure it was possible to have a meaningful conversation with creatures that thrived on cruelty. At least sailing off into the night would reassure the Venlo. Visiting Earth would be a public display of trust in humanity, to back my issued statement. If the masses knew the reason for my voyage, it would undermine the soothing explanation about human stampedes. They would spit on Elias Meyer's corpse for broaching the topic and despise me for negotiating with vile monsters. It wasn't clear how we would disguise the methods used to save any Venlil cattle. This was going to be a precarious situation to manage from an optics perspective. The Nature of Predator's 69 Memory Transcription Subject, Governor Tarva of the Venlil Republic, Date L Standardized Human Time, October 25th. This wasn't how I imagined my first visit to Earth. Communicating with a LRD changed for when worst to Earth. Communicating with a disorganized UN via hail that went unanswered for minutes. The humans on the line were terse at first, but there was a drastic shift in tone after they realized who I was. It made me feel guilty to be landing while they were on edge and reeling from the attacks. The poor Terran governments were still trying to clean up the aftermath. It was stunning to see the sprawling oceans from above. This was not the image of a predator hellscape the Federation depicted. Pictures didn't do Earth's serenity justice. The humans were blessed with a gorgeous homeworld. Perhaps this is why they were obsessed with studying their environment and caring for animal life despite their preordained role as killers. When I asked to be pointed to Chief Hunter Isif, we were referred to a base outside New York City. Our ship was granted immediate clearance by the regional powers, and the American tribe heaped on apologies that they couldn't scramble a proper welcome. It did surprise me that the US radio operator politely said she hoped I wasn't here to stir up trouble. Our predator friends really didn't want to piss off the Arkshire. A green and brown pelted human waited outside the ship, with a contingent behind them. Governor Tarva, we're honored by your visit. Please, let us know if there's anything you need. The soldier snapped a hand to their forehead, and the others behind mirrored the cue. I didn't understand what this gesture meant but it seemed respectful. It was difficult to discern every human cue, since their body language varied so drastically from the rest of the galaxy. I wished once again that they had tails to make it easier. Sarah sensed my confusion and leaned by my ear. That's a salute. It's a military gesture of respect. They're welcoming you as one of their own. Uh, thanks. Do I do it back? I asked. The American soldier chuckled. Sure, you can if you want. I raised my paw awkwardly, pressing the pad down against my ear. The humans had a good-natured laugh at my discomfort, and the leader extended a clawless hand in greeting. Recognizing that invitation as the primary human introductory gesture, a show of non-hostility, I placed my paw in their hand. Those fingers tightened in a vice-like grip for a moment before breaking away. Chief Hunter Isif is in the mobile unit there with the excessive, um, decorative weapon displays. We're surprised and slightly concerned by your request, Governor, the spokesperson growled. That said, we're happy to acquiesce any ask by our oldest alien ally. Well, would you like an escort? I flick my ears. No, thank you. Though, perhaps you could wait outside, in case I need air help. The soldier nodded and stepped out my way. Sarah trailed behind me with delicate footsteps, 
taking a while to survey the devastation. The horror was plain on her face, as she saw the raised skyline. This place had once been a teeming mass of Terran civilization. The grand architecture and the homes of millions were obliterated in the bombing, which left the population center in disarray. I had no idea if Isif had been told to expect us, but he hadn't left any greys waiting outside. The door wasn't left ajar as an invitation either. That set me more on edge than I already was, escalating the knot of fear in my stomach. Perhaps the chief hunter wasn't at all interested in talks with a lesser species, and was lying inside in ambush. What was I thinking? My feet came to a halt by the door, standing stationary. And no, I did not want to. Sarah placed a hand on my shoulder. You don't have to do this. We can turn back. I'm sure the American military would be happy to go through the dog and pony show, even in their current state. T. The what? I... Help me walk in. You're asking me to carry you? That'll probably be a bad look. Uh... And never mind. You're right. Sucking in a gasping breath, I slammed my paw down on the door handle. The room was pitch black. Despite it being midday, the Arkshire had placed blackout curtains over every window. A single lamp was turned on in the corner, illuminating Isif's silhouette. The predator was massive, with a girth that put the weightiest humans to shame. That was due to his hardy skeleton and abdominal muscles. The rough scales were visible on his spine, since he had dropped to all fours. He, it was on the floor with a gojit child in its mouth. The beast was snacking on the poor little thing, who was wailing her head off. Whoa! Aha! She shrieked. My horror turned to confusion, as I realized Chief Hunter Isif was spinning around in circles. Upon closer inspection, the Arkshire had its... His teeth gripping the child's scruff. He hadn't even drawn blood, despite being able to taste her flesh. There were no signs of drool around his lips, or dilation in his slit pupils either. If I didn't know better, I think the prey kid was enjoying this. She was moving her arms up and down, like a bird's wings. The hunter stopped moving his paws, and set the child down on the floor. The gojit giggled, bouncing on her haunches. Again, Siffy! Faster this time! She cheered. The Arkshur issued a bone-chilling growl that set my fur on end. My name is Hinati Sifi. Sifi is harder to say than Isif. But Sifi is a better name. It's super cute. Cute? Why you leaf-licking demon? Take it back. No. I don't listen to you. You came into air. My cabin, so you will listen to me. Don't make me roar at you, Nulia. Yes, roar. Roar at that Fenlil. It'll be funny. The Arkshire whipped around, lacking peripheral vision like the humans. Isif had been distracted with Nulia, likely from resisting his urges to wolf her down. He hadn't noticed my entrance. I locked my limbs as his gaze landed on me. The last thing I wanted was to tremble and bray, but tears welled in my eyes nonetheless. Cat thing looks so hungry, like he's sizing me up. Those jerky pupil movements. How did I ever think Noah was scary? This was a mistake. Gaha. Venli Gavana? As if growled. His voice laced with surprise. Come in, please. I... 
need help with the brat. Nulia poked her claws against his fangs. See, Sifi is nice, Tolva. He looks like the bad monsters, but he rescued us. He's not gonna eat anyone. Quit sticking your grubby claws in my mouth. How would you like someone doing that to you? I don't have the snarling teeth. You do. Mozo doesn't care at all. If Marcel is happy to be poked and prodded, that's his business. It's obvious he doesn't discipline you at all. My eyes widened as I picked up on the word Marcel. Perhaps that was a common male name for humans, since the odds that the tortured predator was here were astronomical. The archer flared his nostrils and picked Nulia up by the scruff. He stalked past me, returning to a bipedal stance. A human male limped up the stairs with only stubble on his scalp. There was panic in his hazel eyes, along with a nasty pair of scars on his cheek. That was, in fact, the same wounds I'd seen on the half-dead human. His jaw dropped as he saw the Arxer toting the Gojid. The Terran lunged forward, snatching Nulia away with shaking hands. Marcel bared his teeth, eyebrows slanted down. I've been looking everywhere for you. What were you thinking, wandering into an Arxer's lodgings? You're lucky that... Ugh, I'll tell you later. Marcel! I squeaked. It's good to see you up and about. A reddish eyebrow arched in confusion. Governor Tava. I don't believe we're acquainted, so I presume... Zara nodded her agreement. We both were there when you were wheeled in. It's wonderful to see you made a full recovery. Haven't got that far yet. Still working on getting my head right, and I'm not ashamed about it. Anyways, Nulia has been naughty, and is going to be eye-grounded. Aye, take care, guys. No. Why are you so mean? Stupid morsel. The Gojid wailed. I didn't do anything. I hate you. <laughs> the red-haired human snorted, pursing his lips with displeasure. It was nice to see him in good spirits, though I wondered how he wound up as the caretaker for a Gojid. Terran predators seemed more than willing to bond with anything cute or young. I was just relieved to see Marcel's trauma hadn't turned him against aliens. Slanik must have been helpful on that front. Ah, humans are soft, aren't they? If I talked to my mother like that, she would have cracked my skull, Isif rumbled. That's sad. I turned around to face him, using all of my strength to meet his gaze. T, there's nothing powerful about hurting someone who can't fight back. I suppose, as we say, it's the weakling who seeks the slow-running prey. Tara, this war proves nothing. Where is the pride of the hunt? The entire Federation is slow running prey, far as I'm concerned. We're not prey. W, we shouldn't have to be running at all. We're people, not your F food. The Arkshire closed his maw, studying me with interest. There was a hint of surprise in the pupils, perhaps even some grudging respect. I'd never looked at a Grey's visage as anything more than a mindless predator. A smidge of thought and emotion was in there, even if it all went toward cruel intelligence. Whatever I expected from Isif, it wasn't playing with a Goji child. He has some self-control, even if it's taxed now. Sarah clasped her fingers together. Prey is demeaning. If the governor doesn't want to accept that label anymore, power to her. I know I'd like to have people stop calling me predator. I ducked my head. 
I'm working on that, but it slips out when I'm scared. Tava, you don't call me a grey. I'll drop the word, pray. Such a stupid name, Isif hissed. Your fur is grey, and they don't call you that. Fair, yes? I plopped myself on the couch. There. You are fascinating. I do see why the humans think you have potential. You reigned in your fear faster than any pa herbivore I've seen. You talk to me. Be because I want to understand. I understand what an obligate carnivore is now. I know that you can eat fruit feasts and starve. What I don't understand is why you didn't try to stop this or make it quick. The archer walked slowly, his form lumbering through the shadows. I could imagine the Federation never looked at such monstrosities as truly sapient. These weren't the social humans whose common ancestors included tree-dwelling frugivores. Isif had bony claws that could tear through skeletal muscle and yellow teeth that curved out of his jaw. He was the perfect killing machine Sarah was uninterested in sitting. She preferred to stay on her feet. The grey paused by the couch, eyeing the open spot next to me. His tail lashed the cushion and waited for a reaction. A predator I had screaming nightmares about was so close, staring me down. I could feel his rank breath on my neck. My heart pushed against my rib cage, leaving me with the urge to clutch my chest. Those flaring nostrils must be picking up my nutritious blood. If I understood how scent worked, he could taste me on the breeze. I was certain he could smell the fear chemicals coursing through my scrawny frame. My breathing was becoming erratic, despite my efforts to measure it. Isif leaned back. I am trying to make this war stop. Some idiots from your side started this all. It doesn't matter much now, they're dead. Neither of us are responsible for what our species did. You're a chief hunter. That's not a powerless grunt, Sarah interjected. I'm one person, fighting was necessary. The cost of the Federation winning the war was higher than us winning, until now. Venlil are curious, accepting predators. An anomaly. I hugged my knees to my chest. D do the Arkshur, even H have a society, to lose. What are you? The chief hunter retrieved a hollow pad from an armrest. The device had grips carved into the back, which were clearly meant to suit an oxer's claws. He pounded at a keyboard that seemed to have an alphabet of random slashes, and a low growl rumbled in his throat. The predator picked out a single image, turning it to me. The picture looked like a village of modest huts, separated from each other by sizable distances. The Yaksha might as well have installed chasms between themselves and their neighbors. There was no electricity visible inside the dwellings, since the nocturnal greys preferred darkness. I guess they'd only use power for appliances. Surprisingly, there were no carcasses hanging outside, and no blood on the overgrown grass. All roads seemed to converge on the woods, where the activity ticked up. Bulky greys were fighting in pavilions, while younger ones practiced stalking alone on wobbly pedestals. It figured that their playing was all hunting and violence. Key humans at least have the decency to mask their predation. They would never think about hunting for fun. Ah, uh, as if bared his teeth. That's our homeworld, the warm spheroid we call Riss. That means rock, loosely. Most people work on the farms, in betterment, in shipping and manufacturing, or in the military. The government assigns 
rations based on merit. Sapient rations. All you ever ate. The alternative is to starve. I do not wish to die that way. You do not know what it is to be hungry, to live with pains and cravings. I would rather starve than eat a people. That's easy to say when you're content and sated, is it not? Ask your human friends what they are like when deprived of food. They eat each other in extreme cases. My eyes shifted to Sarah, who flinched. The human scientist brought a fist to her lips, coughing awkwardly. The thought of my predator friends eating their own kind made my stomach flip. I hadn't thought they'd munch on Venlil, let alone other Terrans. Was the Aksha mistaken? Cannibalism is taboo, and very rare, she managed. People, many humans will do anything to survive. As Isif said, it's usually in extreme cases, with no other food for an extended time. T, that's appalling. That's worse than predatory. Of course it is. But Venlil steal food from each other during your famines. Eating human flesh sickens us, and that is an awful decision to make. Your body can't function without food and water. It's a biological requirement. It was still fresh in my memory how outraged Sarah was when she learned of the Venlil cattle. I recalled how widespread fury and disgust took root across Earth when they discovered our plight. Yet now, the scientist was downplaying the consumption of sapiens, her own race. Was starvation the only excuse predator races needed to cast aside their morals? Azif curled his lip. Aksha have such cases too. Also rare for us. Many people are desperate now, but it's punishable by execution. The diseases are too dangerous, so the Dominion, well, made examples. What? Diseases? I squeaked. Sarah buried her face in her hands. Prion diseases, transmitted through faulty proteins. Always lethal. Beyond the moral issues. That's a good incentive for us not to. Yes, communicable diseases that can only spread through predation? It's a wonder the omnivore humans haven't all gone vegetarian. It was tough to reconcile the disconnect between the civilized humans I knew, and the worrisome practices I continued to uncover from any that were desperate. This exchange made me feel a lot less certain on Terrans never eating Venlo a qualifier I had believed with all my heart. These two alien predators who had more in common than I'd like to admit. I knew Elias Meyer hid a lot from us under his regime, but the extent of the omissions was startling. As if tilted his head. You could help humanity now, Tarva. Unless you think they deserve to choose between eating their dead or starving to death alongside their kin. I am helping. I love them still, I said, wiping a frightful tear away. But I've given them everything I can spare, and then some. No, you have not. You know of their lab-grown meat, which the humans conveniently avoided divulging to me. That is the price catch, don't you see? Grow enough to satisfy our cattle deal because your friends can't afford to give their scraps away. Then, you can send surplus food to Earth, fill some empty bellies. You're insane. You think Venel would ever grow flesh as predator food? The backlash I would get, it's a small price to free millions of Venel, without the animal killing you pretend your paws are clean of. You're a hunting challenged species, but it's truly no different than cell cultures. Hunting challenged species was a roundabout way of calling Venlo prey. I tried to swish my tail in irritation, but the missing appendage was unresponsive. 
It was surprising the Akshar hadn't commented on the amputated stump. He didn't question why Elias Meyer wasn't present either, so I suppose he'd learned of the bombing. Isif was correct, that it was only cell cultures and lab work. But growing carcasses was a tough pill to swallow. It felt like a betrayal of everything the Federation believed in. Like we were selling ourselves out. Mixed emotions played at my human companion's face, as though she was debating whether to agree with him. Putting our industrial capacity to manufacturing dead bodies. Yikes, I thought to myself. Even the extermination officers will say it's a slippery slope to enabling wildlife murder. They might be right. Dara bit her lip. While that would be helpful, I don't want to pressure the governor. Growing predator food for you, and even for us, would sicken her. I'm sure it is not a savory thought, when she finds everything about Arxer abhorrent. But, it is never wrong to do what you must to survive. I blinked. I don't know if we can get past the stigma. Think of it this way. If you had grown meat for us from the start, how many Federation lives would not have been lost? How many years of pain would have been avoided? I ask myself those questions about the Arxera, and it helps me speak to you. My pride and my culture say I do not need your kind, but the stigma is inconsequential. It is illogical. I know it's illogical. I thought about the feral predator's words, and how my daughter could still be alive. Would I not grow flesh in a heartbeat, if it stopped the Oxer from bombing Venlil schools? I'll try to get it through. Rush it, even. I won't make any promises, but let's plan for the exchange five weeks from today. The chief hunter rose from the couch, attempting to give a polite tail swish. It came across as a rapid lash, but I recognized it as an effort to communicate in our terms. I couldn't believe how insightful that dialogue was, and how polished the grey was. Because of the humans, the Venlil took the first step to repairing the rift between predator and prey. It remained to be seen if this cattle plot the United Nations dreamt up ended in disaster. The nature of Predator's 70 memory, transcription subject, A. Captain Sovlin. Captain Sovlin, state, Iran state, U.S. Dandarist, human time. October 27, 2000 136 I believe that the Kolshin public as a whole had no idea about any of this. They were livid with their own government for keeping predator species alive. Leaders of every planet rushed to the airwaves to broadcast statements, with a few withdrawing all ties to any converted race. The Krakatla ambassador barricaded himself in his quarters, and reportedly called in airstrikes on his own holdout worlds. The avian commanders would not adhere to this order, which drove him further into a rage. After leading the raid on Earth, it was too much for them to process that they were the first sapient flesh eaters. Chief Nicanus did not resign his post, and instead, attempted to appease the angered members, the Kolshians had been the leading force among races that sought a military alliance with Earth. A new coalition was organized to threaten anyone who left the Federation, or reached out to humanity. Tens of thousands of ships were brought on preemptive standby. But the neutral factions were the interesting ones to observe. The divide became skewed in the humans' favor, as the Federation turned on each other. Of the non-converted neutrals, those with close ties to presumed omnivores were the likeliest to offer aid. The Sulian and Iktali Alliance, a government consisting of two sapient species from the same world, 
were the first to announce their support for Earth. The Iftalasi's religion based on dietary purity led to unpleasant conclusions. I hadn't come to terms with being a predator or a scavenger as Nicanus had put it. Silani worked tirelessly to spin a tale of victimhood, but I didn't feel oppressed. Perhaps the Colchians were right, that they'd turned the Gojids into something worth saving. We were a better species for not eating meat and never knowing that temptation. What? What the humans say? Is it wrong to feel that this cure was a cure? That I'm a disease? Hi, hi. Now, I was engaging in my first interaction with the Federation in days. The Mazik and Dosser ambassadors were present as Terran allied parties. The other attendees, the Harchin and Tilfish representatives, were both partial contributors to the Annihilation fleet. The meeting location was outside of Afa, on an abandoned station. It was difficult to focus on the conversation, but I was needed here to guess at humanity's desires. Kripa, the Mazik vice president, flared her trunk. We've known contaminated species like the Gojids and the Tilfish for centuries. I can't believe that they all were harboring bloodlust in secret for so long. That's solid evidence that humans might, just might, be genuine allies. I had no idea about any of this. I thought just like any of you. I'm still disgusted by predators, I mumbled in a dazed voice. Harsh and Ambassador Ryla ignored me, focusing on Silene. This has given me a new perspective on humanity. They're predators, but they're open about it, not hiding among us. We only contributed about 100 ships. The Federation brainwashed us into thinking predators needed to be destroyed. The Tillfish representative Dwarl was an insectoid being with mandibles and a black exoskeleton. The Colchians won't help us or acknowledge us now. We can't predict what they'll do to our people next, but the only species that might have helped us is set on our heels. Surrender. They might kill you, but who really cares now? I don't, I sighed. The Harchin reporter glowered at me, floored by my brusqueness. I suppose I had crossed a line with that remark. Still, my sympathy for a species that wanted to kill humanity, right up until it was their ass on the line, was dwindling. Everything felt hollow. Since the revelation, we were all a lot of hypocrites. I just wanted to hurt something, which I guessed was the buried predator talking. You're a monster, Sovlin, in so many ways. You are disgusting. Hey, the humans themselves said revenge wasn't about blind genocide. Get a grip, Silani hissed. I chewed my claws. Sorry. I just understand that the Arxer are going to kill us all, and the humans. They'd be well within their rights to tell us all to fuck off. The Harchin reporter glanced at her holopad as though she was waiting for someone. I noticed that she had been rather apprehensive around me, since Nicanus told her the truth. Writing off my temper as a poor attitude wasn't simple anymore. We had known each other for years, and now it was as if we were strangers. My ears detected a faint sound, like the patter of rain on a rooftop instead of coming from above. The light vibrations echoed through the floor. Something bipedal was attempting stealthy movement. My reptile friend showed visible relief as she picked up on it too. That suggested it wasn't Colchian soldiers here to knock us off. Two human figures clicked open the door and turned their backs to us. They must be checking that nobody had followed them. The predators were covered head to toe in full body armor, with helmets that concealed their features. I could tell from the slight limp in the male's step that it was Carlos covering the rear. 
The slender predator, likely Samantha, made a high-pitched sound. It sounded similar to a bird whistle and was followed by a hand wave. A Takan male ducked out from behind a corner, receiving the coast clear message. I was shocked at the condition he was in. There were gashes and contusions all across his silver hide. What did you do to him? Kweepa shrieked with a trunk flare. Who invited you, La? Silani raised an arm. I invited them. Carlos inhaled sharply, tightening his fingers around his gun. That's the Tuckan ambassador, jailed and mistreated by the Koshians. We broke him out while cantankerous Sovelin was snooping around. Uh, sorry. Old habit, the Mazik responded. It's good to see you. Ambassador Ryla was frozen at the sight of the predators. The humans were twice the height of an average Harchin before Gia bolts them up. She held a pen out in front of her with stiff arms, as if that would ward off gun-toting primates. To be fair, she was probably leaving the station in their custody, or in a body bag. Duel took a different approach and clicked his mandibles in a submissive note. He scuttled forward on his black, jointed legs, which connected to his rotund thorax. The tillfish shook as he threw himself at the human's feet. His antennae quivered, and his beady eyes fixed on them, waiting for a reaction. Carlos jumped backward with apparent fright, and barely kept his twitchy finger off the trigger. Samantha shook her head, muttering curses and denials. A shudder rippled down her back, while her legs seemed unsteady. The predator's response was bizarre, something I hadn't seen from them. Were they humans afraid? They'd never shown any fear of aliens, not since I'd known them. Hell, both of these soldiers had gone up against the worst the galaxy had to offer. Carlos was eager to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an Arxa, throwing himself in its face without hesitation. Samantha jumped out amidst flames to turn the tables on exterminators. What in the Protector has gotten into them? This is almost comical, that an insect species is what elicited fear from them. You will, back up. I think you're scaring them, I growled. Carlos took a shaky breath. More like freaking me the fuck out. I second that. Totally creepy, man, Samantha added. Silani, a little warning next time? Silani looked bewildered. Warning for what? The human predators watched warily as the tillfish shuffled back on his spindly legs. The Takan representative was happy to take a seat, but the Terrans were hesitant to enter. Their posture, which was fluid and graceful under normal circumstances, had gone rigid as a board. They beckoned to me in Selene, while swallowing more often than usual. The other representatives stared as the Harchin journalist and I jogged up to the predators. The UN soldiers pulled us aside, keeping their voices hushed. Their body language suggested tension, and they kept shooting glances at the tillfish. It was threat assessment. They wanted to be certain he hadn't moved. First off, great work with Nicanus, both of you. More on that later. Samantha cleared her throat. So, uh, many humans find bugs and crawly things unnerving or outright disgusting. I'm not sure I can talk to whatever that is. Seriously? You're afraid of them, not the Oxa. Don't judge me. The deadliest animal on our planet is a tiny little insect called a mosquito. Worse than all those predators you hate, the human female hissed. Carlos nodded. Also, where Sam lives, there's spiders everywhere that are fucking deadly too. We evolved to be afraid of them because they're venomous. I leaned back, in understanding. 
they're your natural predators. That... that's kinda hilarious, to be honest. See, now you know how we feel, talking to you. Oh, fuck you, Sovlin. I could sense the female's narrowed eyes beneath her suit. Give us a briefing on that, dwell, you called it. I need a moment. I tuck knowledge of the predator's weakness away. This was the first time I'd ever seen their fearful reactions, and I hoped the humans could fight the irrationality. By the protector's blessing, they hadn't even referred to the child-eating Arksha as a depersonalized it. It wasn't clear how they'd react to an enemy species that set off internal alarms. Silene piped up with a bashful expression. Dwell's species is called the Tillfish. They're one of the modified races, we think. They were the smallest contributor to the attack on Earth, with a mere hundred ships. They attacked us? So we can kill them all with a clear conscience, thank the Lord, Samantha mumbled. Carlos crossed his arms. I doubt they're all complicit. Everyone wanted to kill us because we look creepy, Sam. Let's not be like that. I'm good now, so let's talk to the giant spider ant thing before making decisions. The female predator snorted. Sure, why not? Just another Friday with the peacekeepers. See space, meet exciting new people, they said. It'll be fun, they said. Samantha shook her head and strode into the room with careful steps. She seemed to be mapping an exit route if needed. Neither human took a seat by the table. There was no doubt the assembled representatives had noticed their jumpiness. I hoped the Terrans could get it together. Perhaps it would be best to force Dwell to leave the proceedings before someone got hurt. Ilar, the Dosa diplomat, chittered from atop the table. Hailing from the most diminutive species in the galaxy, the size gap was a difficult hurdle to overcome. The Dosser hadn't believed humanity's tale about their representative's death, and broke off relations with Earth. However, after Nikonis affirmed Kolshian culpability on tape, the rodents were back at the bargaining table. Now that is adorable, Carlos decided. Look at those little ginger mouse ears. Hi. Allah shuddered at the predator's roar. Gee, no, no. Please. No, e, and no, e. You want to step outside, buddy? I asked gently. The rodents scurried away at once, and the humans slumped their shoulders. You're a lot bigger than him. Take heart, though. The Dosser are one of your original allies. The male soldier sighed. He is tiny. So much for... Excuse me. Oh, supreme predators. I beseech your mercy humbly. I apologize for my unworthy display earlier. Dwell clicked his mandibles with adoration, but had the good sense to keep his distance this time. I will see that all 1,500 of our ships are turned over to you. Anything we have have, including our territory, is yours. Please accept the Tillfish's unconditional surrender. Just let my people live. Samantha rubbed the back of her neck, a self-soothing gesture. Yes, we will pass along your surrender. Deliver your ships to the Soul System and await our decision. We are under no obligation to show you mercy, Bug. The Tillfish adopted a mournful expression, but didn't argue with the human's curt reply. If the predators were thinking straight, they'd see the pragmatism of accepting that offer. Assimilating the insectoid's ships into their decimated armada would help them get back into the war. It would also set a precedent so other enemies might surrender without a fight. 
ignore my counterpart. Humanity recognizes your surrender and will give the civilian presence full consideration. Carlos cut in. Sam, I hate what they did to us, but the Federation has these people indoctrinated. They are not all bad. Look at Silene versus her race. The reporter tilted her head. Thanks. Don't mention it. I extend the same offer to your ambassador, for your sake, Silene. Perhaps Rayla has a bit more regret now than she did on your recording. Yes, H. How terribly sad about Earth. Very sad indeed, the Harchin politician agreed. The humans tilted their head. Even without seeing their expressions, I could tell they found that response less than convincing. It was easy to visualize the sourness on Sam's face as she cracked her knuckles slowly. Regardless of their instincts toward the tillfish, Dwell's groveling surrender landed better than Rayla's lukewarm act. Yeah, Harshan Ambassador is lucky there's other species here that the humans don't want to chase off. Carlos sighed. Sanawia, humanity plans to go on the offensive before something else is done to us. Can we count on support from our friends? Kuiper flared her trunk. We'll send some of our military and organize every ally we can. The Dosa won't be useful, but you're welcome to ask. Us Mazics will lend our ships and our army to your command. And... I'm sure the Takan can clear the air with his government too. I agree. It's time to take the fight to the Federation. We are not here toys. The liberated Takan spa. <laughs> Humanity can lead us out of this darkness. They will. They must. My spines bristled at the thought of war. The Sulian and Iftalis are rapidly coordinating dozens of neutrals to loan to Earth, but the Federation is going to hit them hard soon. There's no turning back, humans. I trust you to do things the right way, even if you don't trust yourselves. The two predators shared a glance, and the assembled species scrutinized their mannerisms. I contemplated how humans were the only purpose I had left, serving my debt to their kind was all that kept a wretch like me going. This was about vindicating an innocent race. None of my personal history mattered anymore, since everything I ever believed was a lie. Samantha cleared her throat. Time to go home. Come alone, Sovlin, and Silene, if you want. There's a lot of plans to be hatched. War was a terrifying prospect, though the humans didn't share my trepidation. They were eager to have a shot at actualizing revenge. The Terran resurgence could be swift and decisive if they turned a few species scraps into a proper army. There was nobody else that could lead us into the future or influence the Arkshire at all. The fate of billions rested with the Predator's next actions 